Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to call this meeting to order. We have um, exceeded our capacity for this room, so what we're going to do, uh, I would like, we're going to move it down to our um, Citizens Hall. Hall. Ooh, boy, I had a brain <laughs> for a second. Our Citizens Hall, so we so it be ample space. So uh, I'll just ask everyone if we could just uh, go down to Citizen Hall and prepare to sit there because we have quite a few people in the hallway as well. Recess. So recess, we just, so this will take a 10 minute recess and then we'll get to the um, call for the commissioners that have a motion to go into recess. So move. Okay. 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 Good morning, everyone. Morning. Board of Commissioners, how are you doing this today? Um, do we have a motion to come out of uh, recess? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Aye. Aye. Okay, we are out of recess. Uh, again, thank you so much, um, Douglas County citizens, for being here this morning. We appreciate you engaging in county government. Before we start the meeting this morning, I would like to uh, extend a moment of silence for one of our uh, fellow commissioners that passed on yesterday, um, Mrs. Emma Darnell. Uh, she's a commissioner in Fulton County. So if we could just have a moment of silence for her. Please, thank you. Thank you. Clerk, public comment. We have public comment today? Yes. Okay, we have four individuals who signed up this morning. Um, when you come forth, please state your name and your address and your subject matter as you come forth. We ask that you, this uh, subject matter be civil as you present it to the citizens of Douglas County. And our, our first citizen that's uh, here today is Don Ray Leonard. Ms. Leonard, please come forward. and. Uh, we ask that you please abide by the three minute rule. We have, a, we have our timer set, so when you hear the buzzer, please uh, wrap up your discussion. Thank you. Good morning, John Ray Leonard, Excitement Subdivision, District 2, speaking on Fox Hall. Okay. Good morning. In the preliminary report you will be presented today, it states the project owner believes that participation by Douglas County is necessary and critical to the success of this project. Today you will hear a presentation by Economic Development about how we, the Douglas County taxpayer, can happily and willingly fund their private venture. The notion that we need it or want it could not be farther from the truth. I know of no one who is in favor of Fox Hall. The only people standing to benefit from this project is Mr. Pumphreys and Harrison Merrill with their multi-million dollar paydays when the, the day the bonds are signed. We will also hear the Fox Hall proposal by Terminus. As with the two previous studies, at a total cost of $38,000 funded by the taxpayers of this county, you will hear again why Fox Hall is a dangerous proposition. How many times do we need to do a study which has come to the same conclusion every time? The liability, the enormous risk involved, the burden to the taxpayer, and the financial danger to this county is too great. We have no way of knowing what the future brings. This four to one commission has greatly overextended themselves with all the current projects going on in the county as it is. And we can't even take care of what we have. If there is, God forbid, another natural disaster or economic downturn, the Douglas County taxpayers do not and will not want to be on the hook if and when it fails, only to watch Harrison Merrill walk off into the sunset unscathed. How about that 6,000 acre Merrill Ranch outside Phoenix? He saddled 60 banks in Georgia and other states with $100 million in bad loans that went into foreclosure, subsequently causing the largest bank failure in Georgia history. Did he ever make good on that? No, and it will be tied up in courts for years to come. We don't need that kind of business in Douglas County. This is not rocket science. Fox Hall, Fox Hall could not attract investors the first or second time around. Now they're back for a third time with their hands out. If this was such a great investment, people would be lined up for miles to get in on it. If this is such a winning proposition, Mr. Merrill, fund it yourself. 
Commissioners, if no one else will invest, neither should we. Here's your sign. Oh, and one more thing. Executives come to resorts and want to play golf. 18 holes of golf. They want to relax and do deals, not at the driving range, but on the course. Just for that reason, and that reason alone, I'd vote no. That's just plain dumb. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Leonard. Thank you so much for your presentation. We'll take this matter under advisement. Next, we have uh, Ms. Carol Newborn. Newborn, I'm sorry to hear your name. And if you could just give us your address, state your address, and your subject matter is Fox Hall as well. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Carol Newborn. I live in Cedar Creek Place in Douglasville in Arbor Station. And I am against this. I've never been before you guys, and um, I probably should have been, but I work. I'm off today, and I felt it's such a thing I needed to come here because this is such a disaster for our county. Uh, the taxpayers paying for anything for a private business, I feel, is wrong. Uh, this business has already cost us 30 years of taxes on 100 acres of pristine property we could be getting tax money for, not giving tax money. We gave that to you free. Unless you are ahead of the project, the schedule in the county needs to maybe take back our 30 year free deal. I mean, they're not ahead on anything. They're behind. Are they doing what they projected to do as far as employment figures, adding buildings, amenities, and attracting new businesses to this area? No, they're not. If not, why is the county even considering getting more involved with this private business? This might give the county a way to back out of this deal because that, that was a poor deal for the county as well. So far in 2014, the school board came in favor of this deal because they would attract smart planned growth in this area like we had never seen. Did that happen? No. What businesses have they attracted? Also, partnership with schools in the area, internships, specifically the crop industry and culinary arts. Did they do that? And how many interns do they have? I would like to know that. Did the University of Georgia ever build the research building as was proposed? Did they create a thousand and one construction jobs for our local economy? I think you all know the answers to that. Did the Weston start in 2017 as promised? No, it did not. Um, how many villas have they built of the 250 that they said they were going to build? I don't think you'll find there's even a hundred been built. Did they ever build an 18 hole golf course of any, or a golf course of any kind as projected? No, they have a three hole golf experience. I don't play golf, but that doesn't sound like a good deal to me. Did they ever get a major league soccer complex or Fortune 500 companies as they promised? The answer to that is no. It was stated by previous commission chairman that this would attract Fortune 500 businesses and lower residential taxes, and I can assure you my taxes have not been lowered at all. Uh, were any bonds issued in 2017? Uh, 2017 as an intergovernmental agreement. They were wanting that too. But here we are with their handout again. The government, uh, the groundbreaking for all of this was supposed to take place per Merrill in 2016, and we're in 2019. As stated in the Sentinel, did this happen? No. Did you break ground in the Weston as promised and the five, uh, 50,000 square foot conference center in the first quarter of 2019? Have they done that? haven't said anything. Has the sewer been expanded from Fox Hall to St. Andrews? Because it was given to them, so it's supposed to be expanded to St. Andrews. Has that been done? So as a taxpayer, why do you, and I'm talking to Mr. Merrill, why do you keep wanting money from us to fund your business while it is behind schedule? Isn't this your business? Why should the taxpayers fund your business any more than we already have? Can you wrap it up, the, the bail just right. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. Well, okay. and my thing is I'm insulted, and you should be insulted too, that they think we are stupid enough to back something that no one else in the financial community will back. They won't back them, and there's a reason they won't back them. It's because they're a poor business management, and they make poor business decisions, costing a lot of people a lot of money. Just ask the banks of Georgia that they bankrupted. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Newborn. We'll take this matter under advisement. Appreciate you coming in today. Next, we have Mr. Roy Sparks here. Mr. Roy <coughs> Sparks, if you could just give us your address and your subject matter is appraisal department and Fox Hall. That's correct. Roy Sparks, Weston, Georgia. Good morning, Commission Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. I'm here today to put the spotlight on the serious injustice that has been done to the homeowners, taxpayers, and the Board of Equalization of Douglas County. 
I am Roy Sparks and have been a resident of Douglas County since 1978. I have been a professional tax appeal representative for over 15 years serving seven counties, a general contractor for 35 years and a real estate investor for 30. I am no stranger to fair market values and cost to build. For 2018, I had 55 appeals in Douglas County, 48 of which the county appraisers used 2018 sales against. 16 of the properties had values increased after appeals were filed. This is also a problem in Douglas County. What I handed to you, the handout you should have gotten, is Board of Equalization Policies and Procedures. Number one, evidence must consist of opinion of value as of January the 1st of the tax year in question and evidence to support the opinion of value from the prior year, prior to tax assessment year. From appraisal manual handout, the County Board of Tax Assessors may not adopt local procedures that are in conflict with Georgia law or the procedures required by this manual. Two, assessment date. Code section 48-5-10 provides that each return a property owner shall be for property held and subject to taxation on January the 1st of that year. The appraisal staff shall base their decisions regarding taxability, uniform assessment, and valuation of real property on the circumstances of such property on January the 1st of that year for which assessment is being prepared. When the real property is transferred to a new owner or converted to a new use, the circumstances of such property on January the 1st shall nevertheless considered as controlling. The Douglas County Chief Appraiser is leading and instructing, leading and instructing the appraisers to use same year sales. They're pushing values to the extreme. Their properties in Douglas County 30% and higher overvalued. They are complete subdivisions 30% overvalued. Look at handout one I gave you. Their evidence at the Board of Equalization 42% of the first one 2018 sales. The number two one is 66%. The number three is 80%. This is being done and being presented at Board of Equalization hearings unbeknownst to the taxpayer or the Board of Equalization. I'm requesting that all 2018 tax appeals for 2018 sales, where 2018 sales were used by the county appraisers be overturned and all taxpayers affected be notified and hearings rescheduled. I have spoken to multiple lawyers, the Georgia Department of Audits, the Revenue Department. I am told there are no procedures or laws in effect that allow counties to use same-year sales to prove January 1st fair market value. I am requesting that the Douglas County Board of Commissioners make a request to the Georgia Department of Audits for a peer review of the Douglas County Board of Assessors and the Property Appraisal Department of Douglas County. Do I have a couple more seconds? You know, you've got, your time has expired. I was just trying to allow you to wrap up. Thank you so much, Thanks. Mr. Sparks, for taking this matter under advisement. Appreciate you coming in today. And last but not least, Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, please come forward. I, too, say good morning. Good morning. Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. I got a couple, I don't, have any, I don't have anything written down as you know, but I would like to say that uh, when y'all had this National Prayer Dairy, that had I been up there, I would have simply said, you can sweep dirt under the carpet, but not sin. It stays with you. So, with that thought in mind, <coughs> a couple weeks ago we were talking about credit cards. And I got a little upset because there's no particular procedure. Well, ironically, I thought I'd pull one on someone who already had a credit card. Uh, Mr. Greg Baker mm -hmm. didn't charge very much at all. Matter of fact, he only charged $16. But, but I, had to, I had to chuckle 
when the payment wasn't made on time and there's a $15 late charge. So you charge $16 and there's a $15 late charge on it. But the other thing is, somebody out in the audience here hollered, what is the credit? And someone out here said, 5,000. Mr. Baker's is 10,000. So he can go to Hawaii. All right, talking about Hawaii, where I'm from, today is National Prayer Week. In Hawaii, it's the most fantastic month. It's called May Day. And May Day was from way back in the pagan days, and it starts May 1st. It's the prettiest thing you ever saw. Everybody gives their girlfriends and wives lays, and it's the most economical boom when tourists come there, because they're buying lays. Now I want to get to this. A while back, y'all said that I had no business talking about stalking, of which I've been charged. Well, actually, you're wrong, because I'll tell you why. I've been charged to stay away 300 feet and stay away from her cars. Tomorrow, I would like for y'all to put a mandate on the corner. She took her decals off. So she drives around an SUV that Tom Wortham had. Decals were removed when she took the job in Hapeville, okay? Her personal car isn't her personal car. She had no personal car. Belongs to her husband. She drives a Mercedes, she drives a Nissan. I don't know what she drives. So for me to know what kind of car she drives, put a sticker back on the side. She took it off, someone took it off. I go down that road all the time, last statement. You see this here? These are the amount of times I've gone down that road by the old courthouse. 160 of information. I don't need to stalk her, but she thought it was over. I know everything. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming in today. And we'll take this matter under advisement. Um, next Board of Commissioners, we'll move to presentations. And we have our uh, ATL, uh, Atlanta presentation, ATL, by uh, Mr. Chris Tomlinson, ATL Interim Executive Director. We appreciate you being here this morning. Thank you for coming down to share and in part the latest uh, things that are going on with the ATL. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Good Again, morning. My name is Chris Tomlinson. Uh, I'm the Interim Executive Director uh, for the ATL. I also serve as the Executive Director for the State Road and Tollway Authority, as well as the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority. And today, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of this new state authority, what we've been up to, and what it could possibly mean um, uh, for Douglas County. So. <laughs> The ATL, or the Atlanta Region Transit Link Authority, uh, is a new state level. We don't change it. Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, is a new uh, state level authority uh, whose focus exclusively on transit and what it may possibly mean uh, for this region and how we can um, work with the various jurisdictions uh, that are located within the 13 county uh, jurisdiction of the ATL. You may have to say next when you, because our, we're having some te technical difficulties. Uh, so, oh, so it's changing for you? Yes. It's okay, it's changing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, the ATL has a 16-member board. Um, and I, I point that out uh, because this is the only state-level entity that I'm aware of where um, there's 15 voting members. The one non-voting member is the GDOT commissioner. And of those 16 members, uh, 10 are selected through a process of local caucuses uh, made up of state reps and state senators who get to select for uh, these uh, 10 districts. So you have 10 of the voting members that are selected through a local process and only five uh, uh, state level appointees. This is in recognition of the fact that so many of the decisions, uh, as Douglas County well knows, when it comes to transit are, are really turning on local investment. And so the board is, is comprised of an entity that is reflective of that, that so much has to come from local choice and local funding. The ATL's key activities, um, over the past year we've been in the process of just establishing this new entity and now we're embarking on our main uh, work program. And this consists, uh, everything that we're doing can fit into approximately these six buckets that you see on the screen in front of you. Regional coordination, uh, that's working with counties as well as the Atlanta Regional Commission, I'm going to touch on that. 
creation of a, a regional transit plan, as well as policies and standards that help promote and support uh, transit initiatives throughout the region. A statutory requirement to do an annual report and audit. Um, regional unified branding, and I want to hit on that one uh, because there's a lot of uh, misinformation uh, out there, uh, as well as uh, transit planning and services that, that will be available to uh, different jurisdictions. So jumping right into the regional coordination, um, the ATL has set up a, oops, and it is, it looks like there's one behind, there we go. Um, has set up uh, two groups. One is a transit executives uh, working group. And you'll notice that uh, Douglas County is, uh, uh, is listed right there. This is going to be, um, oops, sorry, it looks like the computer wants to restart. There we go. Um, this is going to be a group where any entity that has fixed route transit services, and obviously um, Douglas is getting ready to embark with this Connect uh, Douglas fixed route service, will be able to get together on a quarterly basis with the other operators in the region. Because we want to make sure that as the ATL looks at different policies and initiatives, we always keep in mind what is going to be the real world operational impact. So for communities that are making investments such as Douglas County, we want to be sure that we didn't create an entity that is uh, working on policy decisions where we didn't come back directly to those that may be impacted. And before anything is passed or put into place, those operators, uh, those that are directly impacted, are part of that decision-making process. The other group is this operators working group, which is a, a broad representation of, of the 23 county region because the things that we do can have an impact even beyond uh, the initial 13 counties. There's a lot of information in here. You guys have the presentation to hold on to because I want to be mindful of the time, but I did want to show you how some of these things interact along with the Atlanta Regional Commission, which obviously Douglas County participates in. So there um, in the middle tier, you can see that transit executives working group. And you can see how there's bi-directional arrows. So information coming from uh, the operators could flow up to the ATL board. Um, and also that board can work in conjunction with the Atlanta Regional Commission. The biggest thing, if we can improve the level of communication happening in this region, uh, one, we'll prevent making missteps, and two, we can start to think and act uh, regionally. So we think this structure um, really helps. It's also interesting to note that until now, there's never been a group that's actually gotten together uh, the key executives from those that are providing transit services on any type of regular basis. Um, and we think that is a, a, an omission that we're happy to be involved with correcting. The other thing for the ATL is we're taking a broader look to transit. We're going beyond the public agencies and looking at some of these transit services that even if they're controversial and um, uh, communities are struggling with whether they want, say, e-scooters, et cetera, we want to make sure that is all part of the conversation. What we're doing is not a substitute uh, for those decisions, that would be they safety or regulation that uh, a jurisdiction such as Douglas County would make, but it's more a, a acknowledgement of the fact that these things are here and we need to um, be talking about them, be it ride share, et cetera, so we understand the impact on the community as well as the transit services um, uh, that our communities are putting into place. We also believe that technology is going to be a critical co component of how we can interconnect uh, the services. And so we have a focus on uh, technology and technology coordination. When it comes to regional transit planning, um, we, over the past four months, we've been working with technical staff from th uh, throughout the region to put in place a regional planning process. Uh, we're getting ready to um, bring uh, that uh, framework to the ATL board uh, towards the end of May. Um, but what I want you to know is it's been a very collaborative process on how are we going to create this regional uh, transit plan. One of the things we're, we're doing, we want to work in conjunction with the jurisdictions. This is not a substitute. This is not the state trying to lead um, from the state level down. Because um, quite frankly, uh, jurisdictions have a closer pulse on the needs and desires of their citizens. Rather, we want to understand how we can be supportive 
And one of the things that we're hoping we can do is bring whatever leverage the state may have, either with a congressional delegation or just with, uh, quite frankly, the power of the governor's office to be supportive of trying to attract uh, uh, much needed federal dollars uh, to the local jurisdictions. Already, Douglas County might not need that much help, but you've already successfully um, are bringing in a, 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 a 80% of a $2 million uh, grant to launch your service. But in the future, as new opportunities come up, uh, the ATL is going to have transit planning expertise and staff that you'll be able to tap into uh, to help uh, do that work. Uh, hopefully uh, lessening uh, some of the uh, burdens or just working collaboratively uh, like with your director, Gary Watson, and with others. We'll do that by issuing letters of support. So we're not saying a yay or nay or a thumbs up or thumbs down on initiatives, um, but we're trying to find ways that we can signal to the Federal Transit Administration that yes, we're fully aware of these initiatives. This is providing a valued service and the state stands fully uh, in partnership uh, with these jurisdictions as they seek these dollars. I'm not going to go through this list. I wanted you, to, though, to see the timeline of activities that we're working on. After we put this planning process in place, uh, the first thing we're about to do is issue what we call a call for projects this summer. Uh, this is going to be an opportunity for entities to submit those lists of projects, be they now or in the future, so either they're short-term plans or long-term plans, um, that they uh, plan to seek federal funding for. We want to have all these listed in one place as a, a regional lens so that we can um, look at those, uh, understand how we can help um, prioritize those, how we can help pitch them uh, to Washington. Because quite frankly, they're not used to seeing uh, whole regions come together and say we have a comprehensive uh, plan. And this goes beyond things that are necessarily regional. Most of your service is in Douglas County, for Douglas County, with a connection to Cobb. That's fine. You're moving citizens around a key part of a growing part of the region, and we want to be supportive of, of those efforts and initiatives. Uh, annual report and audit. Everyone only hears the word audit in that, um, but there is a statutory requirement that each year by December 1st, we turn into the governor's office and the general assembly an audit of all uh, uh, transit operations occurring in the region. This is not a deep uh, financial audit. Um, the, quite honestly, the federal government requires that of any operator every three years. Think of this more as a comprehensive look at the state of transit in the region. The information that we'll be gathering, uh, we'll be gathering from all the operators in the region, and quite frankly, it lines up with information that as an operator, you're already required to pull together um, for uh, federal purposes. But you'll be able to get one look at the entire region in one place. And, uh, but this is required by uh, December 1st, so we have an RFP on the street right now uh, for a consultant to help us pull this together. And uh, we'll be uh, reaching out and working with the uh, various uh, uh, jurisdictions and operators to pull together this report for this year. Lastly, I definitely want to clarify um, and if they could get to slide 14. Slide 14, Rick, see if we can stamp. Well, while they're trying to get to that slide, um, <coughs> regional unified branding. Um, the bill requires that we look at branding. Um, and yes, that's the slide. I wanted to clear up some misconceptions. The ATL is not a substitute for MARTA. It's not a substitute for Connect Douglas. Um, what you see on the screen, and if, if you've been in Atlanta and you may have seen some of the MARTA buses, you see the ATL logo on the back quarter panel. Um, we've been going down a road of what we would call co-branding, where you can see that um, these services are part of a connected uh, network. Uh, the statute requires us to look at branding, but quite honestly, um, we're very aware of the time and effort that uh, Douglas has put into its branding, its identification of services. So we're not looking at being a substitute. What we're hoping will happen is, much like when ATM parts first came out, for those of us that are old enough to remember when those first came out, 
is part of a network uh, where hopefully if you see the ATL logo, it means you go to a centralized website and you can pull down schedule information. Um, uh, certain things that are common to the uh, network in one central location. Um, not, uh, it is not meant to be a substitute. We do have some people who are saying that maybe one day everything should be branded the ATL, but I'll be the first to tell you uh, if we were to embark on anything like that, one, it's not a funded mandate, and two, think of the confusion it would cause because these ser services and systems aren't connected. So a long way of saying don't let anyone uh, fool you or focus too much on this uh, branding because it's, it's not the uh, main focal point of the ATL. Uh, lastly, uh, the s services and offerings. I alluded to this uh, a, a while ago. Um, Douglas, again, is at the forefront. You've been talking, looking, and thinking about uh, transit. Imagine those entities who are thinking about it, and they quickly realize, wait, we don't have any transit planners on staff. We're going to um, have staffing expertise that can either be there to help uh, entities create a, a, a robust transit plan, or maybe you want to do your own. Well, you'll be able to turn to our staffing and consultants to help you, say, pull together the scope of work for an RFP, and maybe help with the RFP process. Again, trying to get that expertise that's necessary to look in these areas without um, counties or cities necessarily having to uh, increase their staffing levels or uh, consultants. So these are some of the types of services that, uh, that we'll be offering. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to, again, publicly uh, thank Douglas for the longstanding partnership you've had with the state. One with your multimodal transportation center and the express service. Uh, Douglas County has been a, a critical uh, part of that express service. And again, uh, you've been serving your citizens through your uh, uh, dollar ride service, and we stand here ready to help as you uh, launch your uh, fixed route service later uh, this year. Um, your, your staff has been doing an incredible job, and um, uh, it's just been honestly uh, a joy to work with them um, as they, they work through um, all, all of the issues that come with starting up service. I have a number of stats, but I think you're already familiar with them uh, um, in terms of uh, public transit. It hasn't been a large part here, but again, I, I commend Douglas County for looking towards the uh, future. And um, these are just statistics that we've gathered in partnership with the Atlanta Regional Commission. And I'll leave you with a summary of, of services. You can see a, a number of key dates, as well as a number of the activities I, I already mentioned. Uh, the point of this slide is, we're busy, uh, we're open for business, um, uh, we're here to uh, help as and when uh, you want us or need us uh, to partner with. So thank you for your time. I, I know it probably went a little bit long, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Thomas. And no, you didn't go long, you were brief, and then you certainly um, explained this comprehensive uh, regional plan regarding the ATL. And uh, just to just note, uh, Doug, uh, Georgia has been talking about or discussing transportation since 1958. That's 61 years ago, and it is just such a breath of fresh air to see that we are moving things along in, this, in, in, in the state of Georgia. So I appreciate you taking the time. At this time, Board of Commissioners, does anyone have a question or comment for Mr. Tomlinson? Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll, I'll be brief because I know we've got a long day today. Um, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, very quickly, and again, um, I appreciate um, uh, the efforts that you guys are bringing by way of, of, of planning, and that's key. As a matter of fact, I think I've got your 90-page strategic planning document right here that I've read, um, and it's very thorough. Um, but I want to bring up just a couple points, mm -hmm. and this is for the citizens, so some of this is backdrop. Um, as the county continues to progress, um, as, as it begins to acknowledge it has a diverse set of needs uh, within the county. As it recognizes the need to expand its mobility options, it's important that we also plan it. And one of my roles as um, chairman of transportation is look for the, the, the long term. Not today, but tomorrow, and how we sustain things. Um, as we, we, we advance our long-term capital plan, as, um, as a matter of fact, I believe on the agenda today we have where we'll be discussing um, acceptance of our grant um, from the Federal Transit Administration. My role is to think long term and says, okay, but that's a three-year program. Mm -hmm. right? I need to anticipate what that means down line. And so 
I guess my question is, will you help us in, in, in formulating and identifying funding options beyond, obviously, my general fund to help us sustain programs such as this? That's the first question. Um, the short answer is yes, and, and I'm glad some people don't realize that um, the program you're tapping into, it's for the first three years, will cover, I think, about 80% of the operational cost. But what happens then? Right. Um, both at the uh, state level, we want to uh, start working now to help identify options uh, for, uh, for counties. And two, what we want to do is make sure we highlight, uh, and that's the purpose of that annual report and audit. Because literally, we're going to point out, uh, for example, Douglas County starting service. Uh, there, this plan's in place for three years. Douglas County will be looking at the performance. Um, what resources are available um, when uh, that match changes to more like 50-50? And um, trying to help bring those issues up today so, we're, so that um, we can help you guys plan for years four forward. Great. All right, that's good. That's good enough, short answer. Second is you talked about, and I want to acknowledge, um, you mentioned um, our director of mobility, Gary Watson, and, and I'll, I've always stated this public, but I'll reemphasize, he's, he's been a great asset to the county. Um, he's really advanced us. I mean, we could not have done anything without his, his leadership and his guidance and, and, and um, steadfastness and commitment to the citizens um, and make sure their needs are met. So I'm glad that you recognize it as well as we do. So we, we appreciate um, Gary Watson. Um, but, but to your point, you made a comment about relationships. And one of the things that um, um, it, this administration has always done is be transparent about how it works and talks to our regional partners. I mean, I've got a standing relationship with my colleague in South Cobb, um, um, as it relates to um, Lisa Cupid, who's the vice chairman of Cobb County, which is where we were able to establish that relationship um, and moving over to the homes. Um, you, you have to have, everything rises and falls with relationship. You, not, you cannot progress in a vacuum. You've got to talk to people. You've got to build relationships. You cannot be afraid to expand borders. Um, likewise, um, you know, we represent the 8th District, uh, which is important um, as it relates to um, the ATL. And so that's South Cobb, South Fulton, and all of Douglas. And so likewise, I have a relationship over there with um, recognizing we lost a colleague recently, but also with the mayor of South Fulton as well, which is 100,000 strong. And I'm bringing this up because it's important for us to, for me as an elected official, to know what my pop colleagues are thinking. It's one thing for the staff to work up through the ranks, but I also need, okay, so what is y'all real leaning? And what, what is the plan, what are, you, what are y'all doing? All things west comes through Douglas. So whether it's South Fulton, with the South Cobb, it's like, okay, how do I anticipate this? So part of the planning process, and it, I'm giving that as a backdrop, Part of the planning process, and, and, and Madam Chair knows I, I offered up to, and she supported me, um, to convene our partners here in Douglasford, um, the 8th District. Uh, we met with our representative, um, um, representative's office, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Um, and with that, um, there was a, an acceptance to convene our 8th District to talk, to your point. In other words, we, well, we don't need the state to tell us when we need to talk. We need to get ahead of the curve. So we're, we're going to convene that sometime this summer. That being said, I heard you say, and this is my last comment, and I'll yield to my colleagues. You, you said something about planning. And as I look at it from a planning perspective, I heard you say there's going to be a call for projects this summer. All right? And I'm like, but wait, we haven't quite gone through our formal, um, I guess I want to say, transit planning process. It's in play. Our, our Director of Transportation, Miguel Valentin, is, is on that. Uh, will we? If, if you're calling for projects this summer, and we haven't even gone through our final cycle, our first cycle, not final, our first cycle, is there a chance for alignment? And I just want this, I know the answer, but I need to be said for the record for us. What does that mean for us um, in that are we, is our hand being dealt to us, or will we have a chance to truly formalize based on some type of plan that is already required by the state? Uh, this, this one's a short answer. Um, yes, we're putting together the initial plan this year. But the minute we do it, every plan's a snapshot, and we will have a process to allow for formal amendments, be they um, major or minor, as projects come up. The, the key for us is we want to see projects coming from project sponsors. Those are either operators or the jurisdictions themselves to add to the plan. So we will take what, uh, what people have ready and available now, 
But as you're ready to add, we will have a process where you can just uh, submit them for amendment. It'll be a rolling process. That's good enough. Thank you. Madam Chair, you go. Okay, thank you so much. <coughs> Commissioner Guider? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Tomlinson, um, I'm going to ask you some questions that some of my constituents kind of asked me, and uh, I don't really know all the answers. I have it set on some of the boards and everything. But um, <coughs> the Greta buses, the express buses, mm -hmm. uh, they were funded by ARC. Uh, and are they going to continue to be funded out here? Because we have like 11 routes, I think, that go from here to Atlanta. We've had them for years. Yes. And But the ridership has been going down. So are they going to still fund them? Um, no, great question. Uh, right now, the funding for Express uh, comes from three sources. Part of it's federal, part of it's the fares that are collected, and the other part is uh, coming from the uh, state budget, state general fund. Um, as I stand up here right now, we just finished taking another look and review of our routes. Um, we, we have no plans right now to eliminate any of the existing routes. Actually, effective this morning, there are some uh, route changes. I can't recall um, whether any of the um, West routes or the Douglas routes uh, were affected where we did some uh, scheduling changes. But it was three years ago where we had um, uh, some major changes that had some routes that were uh, removed, and we don't have any plans to remove uh, any, uh, any other routes at, at this time. So long way of saying, Yes, the routes that you have today, uh, we have every plan and intention uh, to continue them, and there's no plans, no hidden plans to reduce uh, those routes. Well, the, the routes, do they have to go inside the Atlanta area, or can they go from point A to point B in Douglas County? Um, right now, all of our service um, is... Uh, I guess uh, inter-county, they cross county lines. inter okay. Yeah. Uh, so right now we don't have any that start and end within, within the county. All right. Uh, and another question, is ATL over MARTR? Is MARTR just part under the umbrella of ATL? Uh, MARTR is part or under the, uh, the umbrella. The ATL, think of the ATL as, a, as truly as a planning entity, and your operators might be what I would call um, design builders. In other words, they have a planning role. Um, they do project management, construction, and operation. What we're trying to do is make sure that for the entire region, we have that forest view of all the operations and projects so that we can help identify gaps both in terms of service and funding. Um, so MARTA is still a separate legal entity. It doesn't change that. Nor is the ATL's role to say oh, everyone must join MARTA. You will hear us talking in the MARTA jurisdictions about um, what are they, where and when are they looking at, at expansion. But outside of those, uh, we're also looking at um, where do there need to be connections, and not just to MARTA, again, like what you did with uh, Cobb, uh, so that people can um, traverse through the region. But the, all that will always be driven by uh, the local desires and wants. That's why we want projects coming into the plan um, based on these local jurisdictions. Thank you. And for, uh, for the public, could you just give a brief description of light rail and heavy rail, the difference? Please? Sure. Um, I always like to start with the money. No one ever wants to start with the money. Uh, <laughs> heavy rail is what uh, the MARTA trains that you're, you're used to seeing are. Um, that's where you have that third electrified rail. Um, heavy rail costs today, in today's dollars about $250 million per mile to deploy. Light rail is, is anything that uses any type of what we call fixed rail system, but generally um, will have a different type of and, and more, certainly less expensive propulsion system. It could be electrified wires overhead, so streetcar is a type of light rail. It could be a, an electrified vehicle, um, much like you're seeing electric cars. Uh, so it uses rail. It may be able to even use the same uh, rail system um, as uh, heavy rail, but um, it doesn't have the heavy electrical infrastructure. But even that can cost upwards of 50, 50 million dollars um, per mile. 
There's some ways to do it a little bit cheaper. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, so that would be the two distinctions, uh, but things that look like either streetcars or trams, um, those tend to be uh, light rail. But I always like to end whenever I ask a question about rail. A lot of people who are fans of rail, they're fans of one key feature that you don't necessarily have to have rails to get, and that's what we call dedicated right away. What they like is it's not stuck in traffic with other vehicles. So as you hear the region start talking about bus rapid transit, everyone, all, most people get stuck at the word bus. <laughs> Um, but as we start talking about, does it have its own dedicated lane, either for some or, or all of it, you may be able to get some of the same benefits as rail but without that expense. And uh, one last uh, comment, because uh, I, I know time is up, but uh, has, have you all ever thought about putting the stations on the outside of the perimeter to eliminate all the cars going through the interchanges. I never have understood why it was built that way. <laughs> uh, short answer is yes. And one of the things that we did in, on the Northwest Corridor Express lanes that go up to Cobb um, is building a park and ride location as close as possible to the entrance point onto those lanes. Nobody wants their subdivision right against the highway. Um, no one wants to be right next to a sound wall. Well, actually, I do. Um, put a park and ride uh, lot there, have it well lit, put a tree line buffer between that um, park and ride and whatever um, neighborhoods or the, the rest of the amenities. And now we've made it both a distance buffer and uh, we've encouraged people to consider parking there because those vehicles will just enter without having to get into local traffic. So we're exploring uh, solutions like that around the region. And on Georgia 400, there's even, we're even looking at the possibility of what we call inline stations, where, where the median is, there might be a station for bus rapid transit. And it's a question of figuring out the connectivity overhead so people could park elsewhere and come down and have a, a service that picks up people literally on the highway and, and quickly gets right back up to highway speeds. Mm -hmm. But I would end with this. All of these are dependent on the will and the willingness of the local jurisdictions. Uh, what I really don't want anyone to think is that the uh, state is going to come in and say, this is what's right for you and you need to have it there. It, it, it won't work. Um, one, the state literally doesn't have the money <laughs> to just come in and say we have the best solution and, but we need you to pay for it. And two, this is just one of those issues that are, are near and dear to people's hearts. So um, we look forward to working with Douglas and others as you continue to look at comprehensive transportation plans, get that public input from uh, your citizens. And the, and the only thing we ask in, in, in terms of advice is do everything you can to figure out what the need is and then back into what's the technology, be it light rail or heavy rail. Figure out how many passengers you need to move, how fast and where they want to go. And then in partnership, we'd love to help come up with a menu of options to see what the citizens are interested in. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. All right, uh, any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Mitchell. <clears throat> yes, just, just a, a couple of quick questions. Yeah. What, what type of costs to Douglas County, if any, um, to be a part of the whole program? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, there's zero cost. Everything we're doing is on a voluntary basis. So yes, you're automatically in the 13 county jurisdiction. Right. The only thing that's actually imposed by law is that um, you have a say in electing a board member. Right. Which hopefully doesn't cost you anything or cost very little. Right, right. And, and, and going to the board members, for those everything west, the board members that make up today, because I know I, at one time vice chair was uh, looking at that one of those key board members, whom on the board that we can say looks towards the situation out west. So um, the way it, it worked out, which I don't think anyone anticipated, being quite honest, um, but uh, the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, mm -hmm. represents the district that contains Douglas County. Mm -hmm. um, and she literally ran for that seat 
based on her home address. So uh, she isn't like in an appointed uh, position. Mm -hmm. So um, you have the mayor uh, and her staff. I can personally tell you I've had a conversation with her as well as her transportation advisors. She's keenly aware that um, everyone's natural thought is going to be she only cares about uh, the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say there's two answers to that. One, you can call me directly. <laughs> Um, but two, um, actually, uh, she has some uh, very talented staff who um, want to make sure that she's fulfilling all of her responsibilities, be it on the ATL or, or, or elsewhere. And I, honestly, I have to be honest, they've, they've been a, a joy to work with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, but please, by all means, feel free to also call me directly. Got it, got it. A uh, couple other questions. So with the relations, with ATL, what relations would it have with Douglas Connect, Greta, and all? What's the relations there? So, um, the, with the other hats I wear, I, I'm also responsible uh, for the operations of the express service. So, we've been talking with uh, uh, Gary and the Connect Douglas folks on multiple levels mm -hmm. um, for months and really for years. Mm -hmm. um, and we've enjoyed a long relationship um, of having service from your multimodal transportation center as we've switched over Express to Breeze. So honestly, the relationship's already in place. Now we're just, uh, the agenda of things we're talking about has expanded. Got it, so, so now the agenda is inclusive of uh, Greta, yet along also Douglas Connect, even with the mere fact that we're trying to connect to Cobb and others, so it's making it regional, am I correct? Yeah, I mean okay. really, we just added the ATL's breath to the, um, uh, and Miguel Valentin and I personally go back a number of years, mm -hmm. so. Um, Pardon the pun, but Connect Douglas is actually well connected. <laughs> got it, got it. And you spoke of about performance uh, resources. Can you touch that more, much more? More specifically, yes. right? Yeah. Um, so real quick, uh, the other thing that's in the statute is every single year the ATL board gets to submit a list of projects um, to uh, the governor and the General Assembly for them to consider state funding uh, uh, capital infusion into these projects uh, that will be repaid by the state. Our first list is due in September. Mm -hmm. As we get this plan in place, what we'll be doing is looking to that plan to uh, generate uh, the projects. In this first year, um, we're, we're trying to make sure we stay within the statute but come up with ways. But long way of saying there's going to be opportunities um, for the state to provide some capital funding to help advance these projects and close some of these funding gaps. Mm -hmm. Last legislative session, there was a lot of talk about uh, coming up with additional uh, funding streams that may be able to use for operational costs. There was talk about an Uber and Lyft um, 50 cent fee being added to all trips to provide a new funding source that could be used mm -hmm. uh, towards transit. That did not pass in this session. Um, I don't want to speculate on whether they're going to bring it back up, mm -hmm. but the state is fully aware that now the state's talking about transit, but it hasn't really addressed uh, some of the local needs and desires for, local, uh, for additional funding that's available mm -hmm. at the local level. So I do see the capital piece, um, the more flexible needs on operations. We're waiting to see what the elected um, state officials do in that area. Got it. And, and you spoke about you know, we got a three-year trial and error with what we're dealing with today. Um, how does that all tie in together after that? You spoke about that for a moment. You're in the exact same place as everyone else that starts up service on that. Okay. Um, and what we're hoping to do is gather the information to show um, the economic impact mm -hmm. uh, that providing this service is doing. You know, we're, we're, we are invested in the success and hopefully people are using it so that those conversations can start now on this service, again, if successful, if it's the will of this commission, can't just go away. So what we're hoping the state will do, quite honestly, mm -hmm. is the relationship that the governor's office has with the entire congressional delegation, be it Republican or Democrat, House and Senate, to bring, um, bring up these projects and bring money into this region. I've been up to DC, I've talked to Federal Transit Administration, mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, we never see that. Um, what we see is um, almost every jurisdiction can get their local representative, because if that project's in their backyard, they said it would be very powerful if you're seeing 
other uh, congressmen and congresswomen mm -hmm. uh, providing letters of support for projects that aren't in their backyard, that doesn't get them a single vote, but is part of a regional plan. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping, uh, honestly, we can bring the, the power and weight of the governor's office to, to do that. Got it. And, and, and you're, you guys will be taking the regional approach, correct? correct? Absolutely. Correct. And, and, and last but not least, the Greta system, the, the, do you guys base your routes on ridership? Or do you base your routes on the mere fact of 18 times to Atlanta, vice versa, whatever that is? It, so, because it appears, based on my colleague, that there could be a possibility of a shift in those that ride. And I think sometimes it's based on gas, talking to Gary and others. Gas kind of dictates ridership and so on. So, how do you kind of make sure that it makes sense and, and it doesn't create a burden for the, the, the taxpayers here in Douglas County, though? Um, well, for the. The, the, the burden on the taxpayers in uh, Douglas is indirect. Right now, uh, outside of fears and the federal money we're able to That's pull correct. down, You're right. yes. it's coming from, but the general fund at the state level is absolutely coming from That's correct. Uh, tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So we're cognizant of that. We, uh, the short answer is we look at ridership. Mm -hmm. And if we have routes where the average uh, ridership falls below 10 riders, mm -hmm. um, those are ones we have to look at because uh, it might not be the best use of resources. Right. And it's why in Douglas County, and we caught a lot of heat and we heard from Douglas citizens when we uh, eliminated, this is about four years ago, our reverse commutes, uh, mm -hmm. trips from Atlanta out to Douglas in the morning. Mm -hmm. There was some key uh, there was some dedicated riders, but the average uh, ridership was, I think, around five people per trip, and we just financially couldn't sustain that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the good news is the trips that we have coming in, I mean, Douglas is a, a, a thriving part of the uh, system. And so back to your question, I don't see those routes going away at all. Got it. And last but not least, what relations, again, to Vanpool? I mean, we got the Vanpool, we got Greta, we got you know, some other things that dealing with transportation, so. Um, we want to uh, look at Vanpool. Uh, Douglas has the second largest Vanpool uh, system, I believe actually in the state, behind mm -hmm. um, the, the <laughs> one that the state is running. Um, and it's, it's a viable form that often is overlooked. 25% um, uh, of the ridership of, of Express, uh, we carry a, a quarter of, uh, same amount of equivalent passengers on Vanpool. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very hard to start, um, but we want to look at where it makes sense. That's mm -hmm. what I meant by figure out the demand and then come back to the technology solution to fit it. Got you, got you. Um, okay, good stuff. Uh, that's all I think I've got for now. And uh, Madam Chair, I'll let me make sure, yeah, I'll yield back. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Commissioner Carthen. So I won't be late with the time. My constituents <laughs> and my colleagues have asked great questions, but I'm always sensitive to the constituents' voice, Absolutely. right? Because they think that sometimes we're far removed from what they think or what they feel. So how is it that you will hear directly from uh, the people who so, will actually be using the services? So um, when it comes to, uh, we want to do two things. We, we actually want to work through all of you because uh, for most of these projects and plans like you did with Connect Douglas, you had uh, any number of public uh, uh, hearings, et cetera. Um, we would not want to come into your backyard and do something like that without doing a conjunction with you. And that's why, um, as uh, Vice Chair Robinson mentioned, working with uh, entities to do a comprehensive transit plan, which would have that uh, opportunity for public input, is really the way we, we recommend that projects are identified and come forward. Um, so we're not a substitute for that work at the local level. Um, when it comes to express that operations, whenever we make uh, like a fair change, or et cetera, we're required to, and if we weren't, but we're required to hold um, public information hearings because this is affecting people's um, uh, pockets. So we're, we're very sensitive and attuned to that. But we, our entire strategy with the ATL is um, not to impose anything that uh, any jurisdiction doesn't want and to work with the jurisdiction because they have a, a closer finger to the pulse of their, their constituents and citizens. I yield. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, um, Mr. Tomlinson, for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule to come down and share and impart 
what's going on at the, with the ATL's uh, regional uh, comprehensive approach. Thank you so much for all that you do for the state thank, of Georgia. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, next, our uh, next uh, presentation is the Community Service Board presentation. It'll be by Director of Operations for this uh, Community Service Board, Mr. Ray Lightford and Mr. Ron Wilson. Hello, how you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Um, we'd like to thank the uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners for Speak hearing us out. Speak just a little louder. Oh, you, is yes. it better? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to be able to just to express um, what is the mission for the Douglas County Community Services Board, um, what we're doing, our go ahead, but also give you a brief history of how we got where we are. So in 1993, the General Assembly uh, legislation established the creation of Community Services Board uh, with the primary goal that these Community Services Board will be the chief behavioral health entities in specific communities and they branched us away from the public health sector to have our own independent operation. Um, during this time, on around about July 1st of 1994, uh, Cobb County Community Services Board and Douglas County Community Services Board agreed upon sharing a chief executive officer to operate on the behalf of both communities. Um, during this time, uh, and over this period of time, the uh, CEO of Cobb having the operational control of both Douglas and Cobb we saw a shift of funding um, and services move from specifically Douglas County into regional contracts that were ran and operated by Cobb County. So what I gave you above is a depiction of the FY19 funding between the two CSBs to give you an understanding of kind of what that ended up looking like. So as you can see, um, the Cobb CSB FY19 budget was approximately 23 million with 323 staff and the Douglas County CSB's uh, funding was around 3 million with 42 staff. And these were two CSBs that were created at the exact same time. Um, right now, our current maximum reimbursement rate for mental health outpatient services uh, for the fiscal year was 122,000. I have two psychiatrists on staff and one nurse practitioner um, that averages out about 510,000 annually just for those three individuals. Uh, one doctor is around about 186,000 per year. Um, that history continued around about June of 2018 um, with the help and the guidance of Ron Wilson, Madam Chair, um, we were able to relocate um, our facility from Lithia Springs into the heart of Douglasville, which I'll show you later how um, that impacted our service delivery. Around about November, our Douglas County Board of Commissioners, spearheaded by Madam Chair, um, along with uh, Commissioner Robinson, uh, decided to do an investigation with David Corbin to look at our internal financial practices between the two CSBs and some of the contract restraints that we had. Um, during this time, it was found that there were some uh, disparaging uh, differences between the two contracts. Um, and then we were able to get our state representative, uh, Kim Alexander, involved, who actually went to the Department of Behavioral Health and Development Disabilities to question where the perception came from that we were a subset of COP CSB. So simultaneous to this happening, around December, um, DBHDD uh, established and recognized DCCSB as a standalone tier one provider. Um, so in this process, they identified that we had the right to operate autonomously from Cobb and establish our own practices and um, programs specific to Douglas County. Uh, one of those things that took place at that time was our board of directors. Um, Led by Vice Chair uh, Ron Wilson, established the Director of Operations position, which is me. Um, currently, I'm um, dual headed also as the outpatient director as well um, for us to go back, redesign our infrastructure, and really look at our service capabilities unique to Douglas County. Next slide. So, I wanted to tell you about mental health in Douglas County. Um, and these statistics are, are compromised. Number one uh, will come from uh, Atlanta Journal Constitution as well as the uh, National Institute of Mental Health. So what they did is they took the national arrogant and they broke it down into the population to show you what the picture of behavioral health uh, services were here in Douglas County. So the national average in any given community is about 26.6% of persons at age 18 or older will suffer from a mental disorder in any given year. So that number will be about 24,000 and some change here in Douglas County. Of that, 6%, which will be 5,440, persons over age 18 will suffer from major uh, serious and persistent mental illness such as major depression, 
bipolar disorder and or schizophrenia. So many of the services that we render are to those individuals uh, here in this community. Um, like I said, some of these uh, illnesses are uh, de depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. So our footprint. Currently, this is our footprint here in the community. Um, we have an 18,000 square foot uh, contracted mental health clinic in Douglasville, uh, right next to Georgia Highlands College. Uh, 42,000 square foot developmental disabilities day program in Lithia Springs. Um, we also have a 4,800 square foot program that we're actually building out that will be adjacent to the outpatient in Douglasville. Um, right now we're going through renovations. Um, and then we have six addictive de disease support residential townhomes that have two bedrooms apiece where we actually house uh, mothers who are recovering from addictive disease disorders and we're trying to provide treatment to them so that they can go back and reunite with their families. Um, we have three I IDD residential host homes uh, which are basically um, individuals with developmental disabilities that have aged out or their parents have deceased, deceased. And so what these ladies do is they actually bring these people into their homes and treat them as family so that they're not in a big host home or group home setting as used to be oftentimes the case. And so now we also have 88 subcontracted independent residential uh, multi-bedroom apartments that we actually house out. And I'll speak more in depth on that in about a second. Um, but the scattered placement. Um, so that actually breaks down into different apartment complexes we have in Douglasville, Lithia Springs, Villa Rica, all throughout the uh, county. And then finally, we have a 5,000 square foot uh, clubhouse for teens uh, battling addiction that we plan on converting to a future addiction recovery community facility for um, people in recovery to be able to come as a safe haven place so that they don't go back to the temptations of the community that will be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for them. So some fun stats. So what I did is I compromised or oh, put together this slide to show you um, from FY17 to now what we've done. The uh, purple bar that you're looking at right there with the 1300 uh, shows you how many services that we actually rendered um, that fiscal year of 17. The 48 represents how many children's services we gave out and then it was a total um, clientele base of 878. So in FY18 we shifted over into Douglas County so now you can see that those numbers almost doubled. So now you see we gave out um, adult services of 3,357, children's services 139, a total uh, client base of 1,502. And as of last month, these are statistics uh, for FY19, which is uh, 5,345 services uh, to adults, 251 to children, and a total uh, client base of 1,702. And this is just the outpatient mental health does not include the individuals that are in substance abuse treatment for the mental health uh, center. So our Developmental Disabilities Day program, uh, how this program works, we actually, um, with our own vehicles, we pick up these individuals every day from their homes, provide services six hours a day, and then return them at the end of the day back to their families. Um, a lot of these individuals suffer from autism, um, uh, excuse me, uh, fragile X syndrome, um, the whole gamut of intellectual development disability, cerebral palsy, um, the list goes on and on. And so what we do is we have a comprehensive staff uh, that's uh, community support workers, nurses, as well as recreational therapists um, that provide service for them. So as you see, this is a little breakdown of kind of how their day is going, how many man hours we've used to support these individuals. So when you see community integration activities, these are things that we do that we take for granted. Registering to vote for those um, that are able to do so getting identification cards, even being able to go out and meet their local grocer and so they can identify so they're a, a lost or estranged from a loved one, somebody knows who they are in the community. Um, then you have the personal care uh, tasks, tube feeding, toileting, all of these things, repositioning individuals that are in wheelchairs so they don't get pressure sores. Um, so all of these great things. And then lastly, the recreational outings. Um, we take uh, these individuals out to the Braves games. We take them to um, the parks, we, we do a gambit of different activities for them because normally throughout the work day as their, their caregivers or parents are aging, they will be less likely to be able to have these opportunities within their home setting. And so this is just what we're doing with our developmental disabilities. So host homes, so these go back and allude to these individuals I told you that bring these individuals into their homes and make them part of their family. So what you're looking at, those three host homes, these are the individuals in the years track that 
we've been able to help these families to provide care for them. So as you see, we have one individual that is 62 years of age that has been with this family for 18 years. Um, another individual that's 32 that has spent pretty much the ha half of their life with this family, um, 14 years, and then finally one that's 67 that also has spent 18 years with this family. So this is about our independent residential uh, treatment facility for our women with addictive disease. Uh, it's just a snapshot. We call it our Cooper Street project. Um, this project right now currently holds uh, 12 uh, ladies that are in recovery. Um, they get groups daily to work on life skills, uh, tasks, parenting, um, followed by they actually get their essay counseling that takes place. Um, right now we're in the process of trying to uh, find contractors to actually uh, do some renovations on the property to extend uh, our capability of holding up to 14 uh, ladies in this program. Our independent residential services consist of the 88 apartments and eight houses. These, in, these houses and apartments hold individuals with serious and persistent mental illness and their families. Right now, our occupancy is around about 146 citizens that we actually provide long-term care. This is not a transitional housing. These individuals um, receive treatment and therapies in their place of residence provided by us um, to ensure that they have uh, lower offenses or contacts with law enforcement, to make sure they're living uh, structured, um, structured and uh, productive lives. This is our intensive treatment residential uh, facility. Um, the current four individuals that are placed in this home right now are actually uh, placed by the state. These are individuals that have been, spent the majority of their life uh, being, uh, whether it be in the state facility or in prisons that will need constant supervision that will not be able to acclimate in the community without those constant supports provided. Um, another great program that we have is our HIV early intervention services. Um, and so how this program works is, is that we go out into the community, we interact with different populations, and we ask um, if they're willing to have HIV tests done. Um, based on those results of those tests, we link individuals into services, we provide education, um, and we also hold uh, community events in support of HIV and AIDS awareness. Um, so as you can see, this year we've given out 144 tests. Uh, Ten individuals were positive and were linked into follow-on services at the Ryan White Clinic um, and other services. Um, HIV education events held, we've held five. Um, and sometimes you'll see uh, we'll have our little tent placed out in front of CVS or things like that, and you'll see a couple of our guys like, hey, do you want to learn about uh, HIV and AIDS and, and some things that you can do to uh, prepare yourself or, or make sure that you don't come in contact with individuals that may um, transmit the disease to you? Um, and then finally, uh, HIV positive uh, clients that are in mental health treatment as a follow-on service. Uh, we have four active individuals in that. So some of our community connections. Um, right now you see a little snapshot of two of my case managers who we actually took and went into the jails to work with some of the ladies that are planning on being released in the next couple of months to talk about community resources, to start resume writing, to initiate uh, uh, identify those individuals who may need job development skills who've been incarcerated for long periods of time. This is just one of the ways that we're trying to influx and impact the community working along with the Sheriff's Department um, in this facet. Uh, some of the other community com connections we did, once again, uh, working with Sheriff's Pounds and his staff as far as the transition program. Um, we are now working directly with uh, Ms. Uh, Kativa Weaver and the Parental Accountability Courts as it pertains to individuals that are behind and back on their child support, doing behavioral health assessments to see is there anything that is uh, keeping these individuals from being uh, providers for their children. Um, we're working with Tim Pruitt and Judge McLean, providing medication uh, assisted treatment to their individuals that are in drug court and mental health court. Um, we're now working with Carol Chateau and we're actually hosting her steering committee meetings with the Step Up Initiative. Um, and we're, <laughs> excuse me, seems like so much. And we're also in the works with uh, Judge McLean uh, to be the behavioral health provider for a sanctuary village project, um, among some other things. Um, we're currently working with the Atlanta Workforce Development Committee to do a co-location project, so we'll be able to take some of our clients, bring them to those uh, services that they have in order to find quick employment. And then finally, for our individuals that are elderly, disabled, or uh, individuals without transportation, we're providing in-home counseling and therapy for those individuals upon request and approval. 
So now the elephant in the room, the ask. <laughs> uh, currently, the CSB is uh, requesting administrative support in the form of 450000 annually for the next five years. A lot of this is based on the relationship that we had with Cobb County CSB. And I will just give you an idea that our sister CSBs have had the opportunity over the last 25 years to establish what we have less than five years to establish, such as our uh, administrative staff, um, expansion of programs, and also expansion of infrastructure. Um, some of the things that we would like to do uh, with this program are listed below. Um, we have to purchase a new electronic health record because our contract with the Cobb CSBs ends on the 30th of June. Um, expand our case management, our intensive case management uh, programs, our, reg our residential treatment support programs, and our addiction recovery campus. And then we would also like to expand our hours of service uh, for the outpatient. We would like to be able to move into weekend services and extended afternoon services for those individuals that have alt alternate shifts of work that right now are not able to come in and get active treatment without taking off at a cost of their families. Um, so this is just um, an overview. And then lastly, we would like to integrate a fully operational telehealth system so that we can reach our individuals in schools, in jails, and in prisons up under one umbrella. Okay. That, that is it. Thank you so much, Mr. Lightford. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Lightford or comments? Sure. Vice Chairman Robinson? Sure. And, and, okay. All right. A couple of questions I have for, and I, I appreciate what, what I'm hearing. I mean, um, you know, obviously, the Community Service um, Board, um, it, it's important to Douglas County. Um, give context for the citizen, now specifically speak to District 2. Um, if you think about it, um, historically, Douglas County has spent less than 2% on all public health for the past 10 years, right? But yet we spend a lot of money to build a jail, right? There's nothing liberating about a jail. It doesn't accomplish the objective of public safety. It's after the fact. We sometimes talk about how we spend money. You know, we spend 10 million on land. And we want to know why our roles are not fixed. Well, there's a time and place where you, you know, administration shift, the priorities become anew. In other words, when you're so internally focused that you forget that you've got other citizens that are here, and they're paying taxes, they're paying sales tax, whatever they're paying their taxes, and their voices need to be advocated for, right? They can't be marginalized. They, they can't put, be put to the side. It can't be just, well, what about me, my, 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 my? It's like, well, they have a voice too. And they should be advocated for it, and their needs should be advocated for it. And, and sometimes it's, it, it, it grieves me. It's like we spend so much money on something that we don't even accomplish the objective, but yet there's a need to liberate people and make them whole, to make them healthy. And I appreciate what CSB represents. We know that health care is important both at the federal, state, and local level. I appreciate the, 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 the I appreciate the strength that came forth to sort of stand up for this, 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 this particular aspect. There needs to be balanced in the allocation of your digest, right? It, it can't be so concentrated in one thing that it's like, okay, you make yourself feel good about that one thing, but then what about the other needs? It has to be spread. And I really believe um, that citizens deserve to be made whole as well. They need to get their needs met regarding health care. Everybody doesn't have great Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, insurance like we do in this courthouse. It's top shelf. But what about the other citizens? Right? What about the, if it's a thousand of us, what about the other, what, 145,000? Right? Right? And less than that, those who really don't even have insurance, which I think this really gets to the heart of it. So this is a commitment um, that I stand behind. It's one of those where, um, on the other hand, I wanted to make sure I, I was just for full disclosure involved in making sure from afar, I'm not on the CSB board, but I am on the board of commissioners. And from a finance perspective, I want to know to make sure that we were getting our fair share out of that relationship with Cobb. That, that always grieved me, uh, which is like, okay, I, I, you know, I'm not over there, but I can see far enough like, okay, that, that the numbers are imbalanced. And so we appreciate the work that Terminus did to sort of help reconcile what the truth of the numbers were. Because it's always the, 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 the numbers don't lie. Uh, and keep that in mind. Uh, that being said, um, um, 
So to that point, I, I think this is worthy. Now, this, this come to the, to the ask. I, I get everything else. I, I, I won't belabor that. I'll leave my peers to ask questions about services and, and, and areas of focus. The specific ask, um, I want to make sure I heard. So we need 450 now. What is the fiscal year of CSB? It's the same as calendar. Talk to us. Uh, so, Vice Chair, um, the CSB's fiscal year is July 1st through June 30th okay. of each year. All right. All right, so the 450 ask is to what hold to, 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 um, to fulfill what you need through the end of the year, or does it help you beginning of your fiscal year? Just for the clarity for the record. So this initial 450 is asked for the finishing of this year. Currently, because we transitioned from Cobb, we were left without an administrative staff. We were left without um, having our own internal um, electronic health record. We're left with our, our own accounting, uh, accounting practices that we have to develop. Um, and so that's the initial um, need for that uh, 450000 Okay. All right, so 450. And so then what I'm hearing, what I heard, also heard was this is a five year. So that means that also there's an ask um, in our upcoming budget process that every year thereafter for four years or five year cycle, however you want to look at it, there's an additional 450. Is that accurate? Uh, that is correct, and and those funds um, are used to backfill gaps. Um, one prime area that we need to grow is um, placing uh, or putting in place uh, therapists and counselors within the schools. Um, another one is to strengthen the relationship with the courts and the um, jails so that we can have one unique accountability system for mental health. And I'll give you a great example. Um, currently right now, take an individual that may in any walk of life in Douglas County be with one of these different systems um, for a short period of time. So this individual is a school and they've had one school counselor that they work with and now they graduate and somehow they get in trouble with law and they're incarcerated so now they have another mental health professional that they're dealing with now and now they're released into the community and now they have another mental health uh, professional they're dealing with. What this does, it causes inconsistency of care um, and what this also does is it, it opens up the amount of people that this one individual has to continue to share their life story within all the imbalances and things that are taking place, which uh, makes that person more likely to distrust treatment and want to seek help in the future. And so what we want to do is be able to close those gaps in and be that one source, that umbrella to where we're embedding our people up under the same um, medical leadership to be able to assist in all those walks of life at, for a citizen of Douglas County. Okay. And, and, and I appreciate that. And again, I need my, just, just follow the math. So, all right, so 455 years. All right, now, and, and, and I know um, Mr. Wilson is here. Now, at some point, um, the less need, do you see this as being self-sustaining over time? And when does that break even happen? And what is your, you know, you know where I'm going with this. In other words, like, I hear the coverage is 450 for five years, but, you know, what if in year three or year four, there's not as much of a need? What is, what is the reporting? Uh, what is the commitment from the board of directors from CSP back to the board of commissioners for this that will show that it's just not a solid 450, but if, if in fact you've got some type of revenue path forward? Can you speak to that, please? Mr. Wilson. Uh, Mr. Wilson, would you like to? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, uh, <clears throat> I need you to come up to the mic. Sure, sorry. It's being come on up. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> the um, funding for the CSB is broken up into two parts. One is the uh, grants that uh, the state and the federal automatically give to us. The other is uh, transition to fee-for-service. That's the area that's going to grow. <clears throat> and uh, that's the area that will, that will help us to be uh, self-sustainable. So, uh, and that's kind of a lengthy process and we look at two or three years before that really uh, matures. So I would say, you know, we're looking at probably three years before we're on our own. And, and, and again, I, I wasn't looking for um, a specific defined answer, but um, if you've got a plan, um, and again, this is something that as a priority, this administration has deemed as being important, um, as other administrations have deemed um, their priorities. And so if, if, if healthcare is, is sort of the will and, and, and the desire, uh, it's also 
important and prudent, though, to show us how it becomes less dependent on us. I mean, there's a balancing act, right? So there's a business model that you pretty much were dependent upon, Cobb. You think you're being shortchanged your hand. I think we've reconciled that. So now we're going through this sort of pseudo split divorce um, in theory. Are we going to still be working with Cobb or are we going to be truly independent? Because I think that's important to say, well, are we funding just for ourselves or are we giving to this, this broader pool? Be clear. So, so to answer that question, and I guess I'll, I'll go backtrack a little bit uh, with the funding sources. Um, so in 2017, uh, the state of Georgia uh, converted from what was called 112th guaranteed revenues to fee-for-service funds. Um, in that, basically the services that you rendered, that's how you created your, 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 your funding. Um, so initial uh, contracts had the majority of all of those services being rendered to COP. What we've been asked to do now by the state was to go ahead and create those services now, start to push them forward, and then we would be contracted those services for reimbursement, which would answer your question to the step down um, as far as how long will we be dependent, which um, alluded to Mr. Wilson saying around three years. Um, the second part, I believe, is you asked about us working with COP. So we would still continue to work with COP because there will be certain services that they would actually have that we wouldn't have in our contract. And so we would actually use uh, work as two regional entities to provide services in the community that had those services uh, contracted by the state. So we will have some type of relationship, but they would not have any uh, jurisdiction over us or any administrative hold over us. It would be just through MOUs, uh, memorandums of understanding, how we would operate those shared um, programs. Okay. Final question, and this deals with um, broadly to the Board of Commissioners sitting here, is the source of funding that would be used to do this. Um, it's, and this is, um, I'll revert back to my comments made in our last commission meeting. Recently, the Board of Commissioners um, um, exercised um, use of a TAN um, in which they acquired $18 million. Um, out of that, $16 million will be used for the traditional use of TANs, um, cash flow, et cetera. Uh, with that, $2 million was left over for that, on which um, it was stated and, and clarified in the record that, that money could be used for our pension, Department of Transportation needs, um, technology, such as websites, as well as community service board. And I'm bringing that back forward. So from a, um, my director of finance is not here today. Uh, and so um, she's not here to speak to that, but I will cover it as the chairman of finance that um, that source of funding would come out of that, um, um, that allocation would have come from, from there. Madam Chair, yield. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Guider. Yes, sir. Um, so you're asking for the 450000 for starting July 1st from this board and not Douglas County and Cobb County. No, <laughs> yes, Commissioner. Um, well, this we're is the first I've seen this, so uh, if you can be patient with me. Oh, absolutely, Commissioner Goddard. Um, so we're asking for it prior to July 1st to close out the fiscal year that we're on, um, which ends June 30th. Um, but this is specifically for Douglas County Community Services Board autonomously. Uh, it has nothing to do or no bearing with uh, Cobb County CSB. So you won't be able to get any grants to to offset some of the, this 250000 uh, okay. Initially, no. Uh, right now, we're in contract negotiations with the state, um, the Department of Behavioral Health and Development and Disabilities, but everything that we're communicating now is for FY20. Uh, yes, and so that's where we have this gap now for the next two months of how uh, we're going to. I certainly understand the, the needs of, uh, you know, for mental health and everything, and I think, uh, there was two hundred thousand dollars in the budget for is this to come out of that too? Are we to use that too for the No, it's it my understanding this is a separate request. Okay. This is a separate request. So yes, the two hundred thousand dollars is not going to be for housing for the mental health. Isn't that what it was? Yes, that's what it was for, and that was budgeted for Judge McClain. This is it's my understanding this is an additional request. Um this is a lot of money to uh, bring to the board in the middle of the year, especially the middle of the budget year. Uh, I understand when uh, all the judges come before us and uh, even uh, some of the court officials, they come before us and they're always talking about how mental health is just bogging down the legal system. 
So I, I know there's a need. Um, I uh, don't like budgeting shifting around, especially using uh, what's been allocated to match uh, some of our um, splash uh, projects in our roads because we'd already talked about that and that's what we sold to the people. <laughs> and I don't like uh, taking funds uh, on borrowed money already to uh, do this. I, I would just like to have the opportunity to sit down and talk to Mr. Corbin and let him explain this to us. And uh, could we table this for uh, another, uh, another meeting? Um, and I'm just asking because um, of the time. No this is a lot to it's swallow. Not, it's not an agenda item yet. Okay. Is, yeah. So okay. this is this is the work session. So is it going to be on the agenda? Are we? Uh, can we ask that it be moved to another meeting? Uh, we just haven't had time to digest this. Uh, we're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. It's currently and not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. Currently, it's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda at this time, Commissioner. It, so it's not going to be on the agenda tomorrow. We, we don't have to vote on this tomorrow. We, we, no, I won't. I won't rush it, but we definitely need to move quickly for the next meeting. You know, I, next I meeting just need some more information, and it's okay. mostly about the budgeting part okay. of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it coming in the middle of the year, and we just don't pull four hundred fifty thousand dollars out of a bucket that we don't have. <laughs> we have a, a small contingency fund, but it's you know that's. We've still got another half a year to rely on that for rainy day events. So uh, I was just, I would just uh, suggest, I, I personally would like to talk to Mr. Corbin one on one and see if there could not be some better financing. Uh, so, um, but so you're not going to be. Uh, you do not have access to any grants for this year, or starting July 1. Commissioner, um, the answer is, is no. Um, I would like to add, too, is that um, the way we're currently organized, if we're not able to show the state of Georgia that our CSB can stand on, on its own, we may end up being consolidated and joining another CSB and then being pulled away from Douglas County. Mm -hmm. um, so. Just, just to know that that's what they're looking at to see if we will have the community buy-in to stand alone as our own established CSB and their, their year ends on June 30th. Um, and so I will just um, add that note. Well, I'm sure that y'all probably talked to some other commissioners up here. This is the first, you know, that I've heard about this. So that's why I'm <laughs> kind of, my eyes have kind of glassed over here. Right. But go ahead, Ryan. Uh, Commissioner. Could you come to the microphone? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sorry. Wilson, please. We, uh, w through the year, we receive grants for uh, various programs, but none of these grants pay for the entire program. Uh, DBHDD and the feds really expect community buy-in. They expect uh, support from the community. Uh, and most projects. But mental health is a problem yeah. throughout the state of Georgia, and I'm sure there's some money put aside for mental health. In fact, we just came from Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Savannah in our conference, and they talked about mental health. There was some legislation this year that was passed. <clears throat> yes, but uh, the thing of it is, is that DBHDD is looking at the entire state and their budget is limited as well. So what they typically do is uh, the, your new budget is based on past performance. So all of the metrics that they look at, that uh, the number of clients, uh, programs, cost of programs, personnel, and that they then uh, determine how much funding you're gonna get, for example, in our uh, outpatient program, uh, what's, it, what's it costing us now? So right now our current outpatient uh, program cost is excess of uh, 1.2 million. The only guaranteed funding that we have from the state of Georgia is 122, excuse me, 183,000. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference. Y'all recently severed. 
from Cobb, right? Yes, we severed, um, but we also had two separate contracts. So what happened is that Cobb, Cobb's contract, a prime example for their outpatient, was uh, roughly six million. Um, they could, they uh, considered us a subset, but didn't mandate that Cobb gave us any revenue. So as we separated, those revenues stayed inherently to Cobb without any allocation to Douglas. Even though it was Cobb Douglas. Correct. Uh, it doesn't the quite seem fair because uh, I'm sure they got some grant money that was to cover both counties. Uh, that is absolutely correct, and DBHED actually identified that, but they did not mandate that Cobb relinquish any of those funds to support uh, Douglas CSB. But when you severed, what was your uh, idea of how you were going to fund this? You had to know for sure you were going to have some funding to do this before you make the decision, you know, before you buy a car, you got to know how how you're going to pay for it. Yeah, we we anticipate that some of these contracts that were allocated to Cobb, where Douglas did the work, will be uh, rerouted back to Douglas. And that's some of the things I would like to talk to yeah. Mr. Corbin about. It's just a big chunk of money mm -hmm. just in the middle of the budget year. And I know, you know, the budget uh, probably as well as anybody up here, and I don't see where the funds are. We're, we're, we're already taking some that's been allocated to something else. So uh, that, that, that kind of scares me, that kind of mm -hmm. budgeting. So uh, I respectfully ask that we just uh, at least table this to the next meeting uh, before any decision is made. And I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner uh, Guider. I'm just not sure if, uh, uh, if Mr. David Corbin can respond to your question that you have. However, uh, so you just make it clear to you that actually CSB and Cobb, and you say severed the ties, it was identified that we were never together uh, when DBHDD came out and t to take a look. So it's very important that this uh, B, uh, CSB remain here and viable for the citizens of Douglas County because my main uh, goal is to make sure that the citizens of Douglas County, as it pertains to mental health and behavioral health and well, developmental disability, is taking yeah. our citizens are taken care of. So we've never been together. That's what I'm saying. We were surprised. So I will spend two more weeks with you, and I'll have Ray meet with you. But I'm just not sure if David Corbin, he just identified where the budget a shortfall was coming from, and it was uh, identified because of the contracts. Uh, Douglas should have been receiving more money than with what they were, but they were not simply because of the way their contracts were arranged with Cobb. But we actually were surprised to find out that we've never been a part of Cobb. We are now considering that's to be. That's the first I've heard that. Too. Well, that's. It, I was shocked too when the lawyer, when the lawyers told me the attorneys uh, shared with with the board. I'm on, I'm on that board, so I'm trying not to have too much discussion. But yes, we were. We, it was shared with us that we're no longer, we were never married. I thought we were, it was a, a joint board, but it's never been. So we, it was my first time hearing it about a week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, no, about a month ago. Okay. All right. So, uh, Vice Chairman Roberts, yes, just a point of clarity, because my others may want to weigh in. Just for the record, so this doesn't seem like it's new. Um, um, this was actually um, talked about during our budget process. It's on our tab, specifically mine, regarding this. Um, David Corbin was engaged formally by this board of commissioners to look into CSB. All right, this is not new. Uh, it has been talked about. Um, this group here came before the finance committee, which we acknowledged we saw and said we'll go forward to the full board of commissioners because this was not new. Um, if in fact one was following um, the finance committee, uh, look at the meeting agenda. It had been consistently laid there as a a reference point of the times that we talked about this. This is not new. Um, it was acknowledged again when we went for the 10 in which this Board of Commissioners voted for, um, that $18 million, $16 million was needed and used, uh, again, for our working capital, and then there was $2 million left over. Um, that was for, for things that were strategic, that, in other words, we were allowed by state law to be able to do it because we could pay it back. And just like last year, we paid back ahead of time. We borrowed a little bit more. Um, same premise. This is not something new. We discussed this, right? Now, I recognize that the state um, um, has a different cycle in which your funding is primarily done by. Um, our, our, we're fiscal, when we're calendar, you're fiscal, 
we get it. Sometimes things are not aligned. They're, they're just not neat. Um, so I acknowledge um, duly noting that your ask is based on your fiscal, I mean, your fiscal year in relation to our calendar year. So I, I, I do want to at least acknowledge that, that there is an unalignment, but, but, but you're not out of order to ask. Uh, that being said, I just for the record for my, my, my fellow peers, especially for our new commissioner who was not um, here during that period of time, uh, that this is something that is not new. Uh, we did talk about this going into the budget cycle, and it is um, relevant in my task. Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so Madam much, Chair. Vice Chairman uh, Robinson. Uh, One clarification. Okay. Commissioner Guider. If we talked about it, where's the 450000 in the budget? I yield back. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Commissioner Carthen, I believe oh. you were next, and then I'll come to you, Commissioner uh, Mitchell. Uh, Commissioner Guider. Mr. Lightford. How yes, are you? I'm good, Commissioner Carthen. Uh, thank you for enlightening me on what the CSB footprint in Douglas County actually does. Uh, I had no idea you guys had that big a footprint and you're only operating on less than what you really can operate on, correct? Uh, that is correct. 100% uh, of our fee-for-service revenue that we gain goes back into our community programs. Um, we have no reserve at this time based on the needs of the community. Um, and that's one of the things that we've um, try to balance as best as possible because the need increases. Um, I will say some of the funding that we get, uh, about 1.6 million of our funding comes directly from HUD for the housing placement. But the catch with that is that that, that funding is only allocated directly to rents and utilities. It is not to the people that, in, that deliver the services, the case managers, the individual therapists, that ensure that these individuals are not having run-ins with the law. That's directly a cost to us without reimbursement. So in other words, just tell me if I'm hearing you correctly. What you operate on only goes toward the housing. It does not go toward keeping those individuals with mental health conditions actually up on their medications, actually up on you know the services that they need in order to sustain right here in Douglas County. That, that is correct. OK. So, so your $450,000 will actually help to go towards that, to keep the positions on staff? Is that? Is that uh, yes, it'll help to uh, retain the staff that we have um, is one uh, key principle of that, and also to continue providing those services, uh, transportation, vehicles, all of these different things that we have accrued costs for uh, without any set reimbursement. Um, and those are some of the issues that we have within the contracts from the state with that offset revenue. We know FY20, FY21, that we'll get those revenues back. But right now, we're trying to not have mass layoffs or to disrupt service delivery based on what we don't have contracted to finish out FY19. That's what I needed to know. Thank you, Madam Chair. You. OK, thank you so much. Commissioner Mitchell. Yeah, just a few, because I know this is getting a little bit long, but definitely need it. Again, I didn't know, and I think probably not realizing that Cobb and Douglas were, were not, I guess we'll use the word married. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. But getting to the 450, and again, our finance directors are not here, but maybe Michelle may, could, from understanding there's about $173,000 that we actually pay toward um, the system for right now. Is that number used in addition to the 450, or that's the difference between the two, or what are we speaking in numbers-wise of the 450 that your your, your requests? Uh, this request will be in addition to okay, the you. 173. Um, mm -hmm. Currently, right now, the 173 that we are utilizing mm -hmm. is being pushed directly toward our outpatient services to retain psychiatrists. Got it. So that's in addition to when Cobb and Douglas decide that they're no longer going to play in the sandbox together and play fair, I guess it is. Were there any dollars and cents, maybe for Ron and you make an answer to this, were already in the system that we were already either receiving and or, I guess, receiving as a whole? So when they left, they took what, they took everything. Uh, the answer. Ron, could, I believe Commissioner well, Mitchell wanted you to come up. Uh, well, I mean, either one, I mean, <laughs> both. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> well, th there's a certain amount of receivables, we'll call them. Yes. But uh, they call them billings. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> so as of a certain date, we can we can quantify that. 
problem we have with that is it, it, with the insurance, private insurance, for example. Mm -hmm. What we bill and what they pay mm -hmm. are two different things. Understood. And so we have to anticipate what that difference is going to be. So although we did, in fact, have receivables that we can quantify, I couldn't guarantee you that any of them are any good. <laughs> I understand. It's just, it's the game. I, I know this is, this is becoming very interesting, you know, of we shared for years uh, a relationship, but never got uh, the marriage license. It's common law. Yes. <laughs> it's so, all, yes. Like common law marriage. <laughs> that, that, yeah, right. That, that makes me a little nervous. Because now, I, I know in all these past years, we shared in the expense. We've contributed to the whole... Um, mental health uh, makeup, and now to say we're at this point or this juncture to say, oh, we're not married, and we don't have, it, it just, it, it's a little disheartening to hear this, even though I understand the need is great, because we've actually, you know, contributed about $200,000, and somebody may quote me wrong or right on this, even toward the uh, mental health makeup, and that has nothing to do with you guys that we've actually made those kind of contributions via our budget. To find that we need this type of a makeup, it becomes very interesting. And again, I, I agree with some of my colleagues, how do we, how do we find $450,000 by June or July? Mm -hmm. Right, so that, I'm assuming that, that data is very sensitive because if not, then this will no longer be, if I'm hearing you correctly, because you can't fund it. Or we couldn't fund it, I guess. <clears throat> Am I correct? And I'm just. You are. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> probably the most important thing in terms of that budget mm -hmm. will be uh, DBHDD uh, reviews our budget every year and they review our sustainability. Right. On a regular basis, mm -hmm. not just once a year, but at this point, once a month, because they're fully aware of the position that we're in. So, um, uh, they look forward to us being uh, self-sustainable as quickly as we can, but you know, obviously we're telling them that don't expect miracles. Right. So let's hypothetically say this doesn't happen. It decides to kind of, I know there's a lot of thoughts in, in trying to do this, but let's say it doesn't happen. Where do we put our citizens, get along, our county, in what position? Go ahead. Um, so for, for starters, the one thing that we would have to look at is that the 145 individuals with serious and persistent mental illness that we support in housing mm -hmm. would be displaced. That, that's one automatic that will take place because if we don't exist as a CSB, mm -hmm. we would either have to turn that service over to another CSB or we would have to find someone else that would relieve that burden. Um, but even that, that would become an expense to us, though. The, yes. Right. And, and what would that number look like? Well, would it be anywhere close to 450? That number would, would be 1.6 million or whatever you That, that would be 1.6 million. Got it. Um, to be that number to yeah, house. The reason I want you to say that because I want this, we got to hear that. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is real. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And that 1.6 million would be only attributed to the housing and utilities and not the service treatment. Correct. Um, and then you would also have the outpatient requirement, which uh, it would be the burden to have a psychiatrist in the community. Right now, I believe that there's a total in, in Douglas County of five psychiatrists, and we house two of them. Um, and also one family nurse practitioner who has the ability to prescribe. Um, and so those positions would also leave out, and then you would probably look at around uh, estimated between direct support workers and case managers, about 40. That would also be at the burden of the uh, county to backfill. Got it. Okay. Uh, I, I, I've got several questions, but I, I don't think this, we'll, we'll be here all day just trying to get our heads wrapped around this scenario. So let's, I, I guess I'll yield back, Madam Chair. We'll, we'll have further discussion. And, then, and I'm, not that I'm glad that it's not up for a vote, but I know there's got to be a lot more discussion than just this. Thank you. I yield. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Mitchell, I do ask that uh, you, uh, Mr. Lightford, uh, and we'll get the meeting set up so you could meet directly with uh, Commissioner Guider and then also with Commissioner Mitchell so we could further to discuss uh, what we are, what you all are requesting. Um, we, this information, to make it clear to both of the commissioners who uh, want further meetings, 
Um, this came to a surprise uh, as the, at the Douglas CSB level as well when we heard that Douglas and Cobb were no, mar uh, no longer together. Uh, I call it a common law separation. Uh, simply, it was disturbing for the board, uh, the board of directors, which I sit on that board of directors to hear that. But uh, we've leaned on Cobb long enough, and we need to determine whether we want to see us be here for our patients, or should I say for our citizens with mental health and developmental disabilities, substance abuse, and behavior health issues. It's not going away. Um, in fact, uh, mental health is on the rise all over the United States, and Douglas County is not exempt. So therefore, uh, Mr. Lightford, I will set up a meeting so you can meet with Commissioner Guider and Commissioner Mitchell. This is, no, uh, this is what I call an emergency. It's a health care emergency. We've had uh, floodplain emergencies. We had flooding, uh, tor tornadoes. We have a health care emergency that I would like for you to continue discussions with these two commissioners. And if, if you need some further discussion, I would like you to meet with Commissioner Carthen as well and Vice Chairman Robinson as well. So you can just make sure that they understand exactly this presentation. And then we will, uh, I will place it on the agenda uh, two weeks from now at our next meeting, okay? All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you, Commissioners. Okay, thank you so much. We'll move on to the library update. Is, is Lindy here? Lindy Moore? Oh, there you are, Lindy. Good morning, Lindy. Thank you for having us. Good morning, or nearly afternoon. Um, I brought with me today our Assistant Regional Library Director, Jeremy Snell, and he is going to give you a brief update of the library board and, it, and how it serves Douglas County. And then I will tell you about a few of our projects. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Jones, Commissioners, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I, again, I'm Jeremy Snell. I'm the Deputy Director for the West Georgia Regional Library System, of which uh, Douglas County's three public libraries are members. Well. And, uh, yes. and I wanted to uh, speak a little bit, as Lenny said, about the role and nature of the County Library Board within the structure of the Regional Library System. I'm only going to take about five, seven minutes of your time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, Douglas County Library Board is a seven-member board uh, and an affiliate board of the West Georgia Regional Library System Board of Trustees. And the, uh, I'm going to call that the regional board moving forward. The regional board is the governing board of the five-county uh, regional library system that West Georgia Regional Library is. Uh, the, the governance uh, nature of that board is set up through the code, uh, official code of Georgia an uh, annotated. So it says that a multi-county library system uh, must be directed by a board of trustees whose members must be a, been appointed by uh, local funding agencies providing support to library services. Um, and that kind of, uh, the makeup of the board is different from system to system based on the constitution and bylaws of those particular counties and the regional library system. And in our system, it, it works out that we, the regional board is a 13 member board, and each of those 13 members are elected from county boards. In the case of Douglas County Library Board, three members are elected from the seven members to serve on regional. And so through that, uh, those three members get to do um, probably many of the things this board does for its county. We set policy. Uh, we approve budgets, provide financial oversights, hire a chief administrator, uh, in that case my boss, the uh, director of the library system, Ms. Jessica Everingham. <clears throat> so that is one of the uh, core actual functions of a county library board is electing these three people to serve on the regional board. But by no means is that everything that they do. Uh, the, uh, additionally, they have input in policy. While they don't necessarily set policy, uh, they do provide input. Um, I, staff attend the Douglas County Library Board meeting. If policy is up uh, for consideration by the regional board, we review that. Take their feedback, work it in. And of course also, given that the three members that they appoint to the regional board would have ultimately vote on this policy, they could weigh in yeah, yay or nay at the final moment in that way. Um, familiarity with the budget is another thing that we expect all of our county board members to do, and we, uh, we do that by uh, actually Ms. Moore tends to present an annual budget to them to let them know what's going on from the Board of Commissioners. And then on our side, uh, we mostly handle the materials money on behalf of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. And so we report what that money flow looks like. Um, and then also the uh, 
course, the three trustees that are on the regional board, they get even more information. In fact, Ms. Shannon Bentley, who is um, on the regional board and also one of your appointees to the Douglas County Board, you know, every other month she gets to sit with me uh, during our finance committee update and go through financial statements and budget amendments. So she gets a lot of uh, really hands-on experience. Uh, but of course, the, I think one of the primary roles of any trustee of any board is uh, advocacy. Uh, so as appointees of our funding agencies, often they have a, a very direct line to these boards, as well as uh, serving in community and civic groups and uh, keeping an eye on, you know, what do people really want and telling us those things. You know, I, I'm one, we're one person, Lindy's one person, we can't be everywhere to know everyone's needs. Um, and as a more concrete example of that advocacy, I thought I might mention uh, every year the Georgia Council of Public Libraries uh, host uh, well, we quickly call it Hot Dog Day, but uh, it's a Library Legislative Day at the Capitol um, where we get a chance, uh, what they call it Hot Dog Day, I should explain, because uh, they get Hot Varsity to come in and cater lunch for all the legislators and legislative aides. And it gets a chance for us to uh, thank them for state support for library service. And of course, uh, being the nature of politics, we're also there to ask for more. Um, this year, uh, Ms., uh, we extended the invitation to all of our trustees to come w with regional staff. And, uh, and this year, Ms. Ursula Fouch, who is a Douglas County Library appointee, or a board member, um, she was able to attend. And so she spent the day uh, handing out hot dogs and shaking hands with uh, officials and talking about all the wonderful things that Douglas County Libraries are doing. And uh, of course, asking our state officials, could you do a little bit more? Um, and also, I thought another really touching point was um, she was able to speak directly with Ms. Uh, Senator Denzella James. Um, and I could tell from their, uh, their conversation, they knew, they knew each other. And so, um, you know, Vice Chair Robinson was speaking earlier about relationships and how important those are. And I thought that was a very touching example of, you know, that is a great relationship. You know, I'm the library administrator. When I walk into a room with a politician, they often expect that I'm there to say like, hey, you know, can we get a little bit more money? <laughs> but with someone that they know, prior to, you know, stepping into the room, Definitely a, bit, a lot more depth of relationship. And that's really all my presentation is. Um, being a librarian, I did bring reading material, which I'll hand to the clerk. Uh, this is the trustee handbook, 2016 edition from Georgia Public Library Service. And inside is also my business card if you ever have questions you want to reach out directly to me about. Do you have any questions for me now? Any questions from the board or comments? Commissioner Carpet. Sorry. Thank you for that quick presentation. We appreciate it. Um, so does your board also look into where another possible library can be placed? Do you do those considerations or forecasting? So you being, uh, well, Douglas County being a member of a regional library system means we can uh, touch into a number of state services, and that includes uh, uh, facilities and construction planning. And so if you were, when that conversation begins to come up, I would be reaching out to um, uh, Mr. Nate Rawl. He is the, uh, oh, I don't remember his exact title, but head of library construction and facility development at the um, Georgia Public Library Service. And he would be probably my first contact to start that conversation. Okay. Yeah. I will be getting in contact with you regarding that. All right. For District look forward 3, to I look forward to speaking with you. I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you were. No, I'm going to get that. You can keep going. Okay. I think that I'm sure. All right. All right. Did you have something, Lindy? Say thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for having me. Appreciate what thank the board you. is doing. Board of Commissioners, I requested that the, our boards, we have all these boards, appointed boards throughout Douglas County, and, and you know, sometimes uh, we, uh, it, it, if we don't pay attention to it, uh, we can uh, work in vacuums, and I didn't want those vacuums to occur on my administration. I at least wanted an update so we'll know what happens, what's happening on the boards, what progress we're making, and I think it's key that we continue to have these updates. And thank you so much, Clerk, for working with me to get all these board members in here to chat with us because we appoint these boards. We have not a clue of what's going on, but we do now. So thank you. And, we, we, and I believe you're my third board update this year, so thank you. Lindy? And I will address, we do have a list of proposed library sites um, that was created in 2006. Okay. So it is will need to be updated. Um, we do have several proposed um, locations throughout the county. Um, I believe Chapel Hill was our next priority, um, as well as Boundary Waters and a replacement for the library here on Selman Drive. Um, 
in saying that, we do have a renovation project that is on the table right now. We are waiting for it to be um, to go through the Finance Oversight Committee. It is a renovation of the restroom facilities at the Selman Drive Library. As many of you may have noticed, um, it is in desperate need of renovation. Um, it is original to the building, 1985. Um, it is not handicapped accessible. It is. It's not the best restroom in the world. So we are, we're hoping that this um, will continue. We are working with the state legislator and getting matching funds to replace and renovate that restroom. We're hoping that that project will begin um, July, August area um, to begin with that. Um, one reason we would like for that project to wait until mid to late summer is we have our summer reading program. We just want to do a plug for that really quick. Our summer reading program 2019, our theme is a universe of stories. It is a space theme this year. Uh, we'll have programs for birth through adult at all three of our library locations. Um, our registration will begin May 28th. It begins online and our programs will run June 3rd through July 12th. And that is all I have for this time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I'm yeah, just, just as a, a point of, of continuity, I, I do want to acknowledge that um, um, the previous Commission Mulcair of the di 3rd District did advocate for Chapel Hill um, as being a priority. I, I don't disagree with that. And you mentioned boundary waters. So I would say right now I'm focused on a current vertical. Any new construction, uh, Madam Chair, I would respectfully yield to Madam McCarthy or whomever you appoint to oversee that. But Let's just pause on that for right now because that falls in district two. And that's all I want to stay on that. I'm trying to yield respectfully. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Wendy West, and thank you. All right, our board of commissioners, we're gonna press through and yep. I'm gonna see what we can do to hit the 1230 mark. Approval of the minutes tomorrow, please. Uh, well, take a look at the minutes tomorrow and be prepared to respond accordingly. And you can look at those minutes tonight. Proclamations, we have three tomorrow. We have proclaiming the month of May 2019 as Older Americans Month in Douglas County. That'll be rendered by Liz Fincher. Uh, tab number four, proclaiming May 20th through 24th, 2019 week in Douglas County. That'll be rendered by uh, Deputy Chief uh, Fire uh, Chief uh, Zach Meyer tomorrow, Zach Meyer tomorrow. So, and also tab number five, proclaiming May 22nd, 2018 as EMS for Children's Day in Douglas County. And that also, this uh, proclamation will be rendered by uh, Deputy Chief Zach Meyer. We have one public hearing tomorrow, which is public hearing four and approval of the Connect Douglas Americans and Disability Paratransit Plan as a component of the fixed route bus service. And I believe we have Director Watson here. You just want to give us a snippet of what, what you have coming forth for Samara. Did you need something, it's Vice okay. Chairman? Go ahead. I'll wait till you get through this. No okay. Problem. Stay. Hey, everybody. Hello. <clears throat> the, uh, the public hearing that we have tomorrow does center around the paratransit service that we will have for individuals with disabilities. This is a Federal Transit Administration requirement for our fixed route bus service. Uh, tomorrow at the public hearing, our transit services coordinator, Jamal Shepard, will give you an overview of the paratransit service, how it works, what the eligibility requirements are. He'll answer any questions that you as a board have or uh, questions that the, the public has. He'll also have copies of the actual plan available for the public. Um, and also, I'd like to to say that in addition to the public hearing that we're having tomorrow, we're also having a series of, of community meetings where we go out and, and talk to individual groups about the, the paratransit plan, uh, how it might uh, apply to them if they're eligible, and how it could service them. Uh, we've already had three of those meetings and we're planning some more and we'll continue to have those right up to get ready to start the service. Thank you so much, uh, Director Watson. Any comment from the Board of Commissioners regarding this paratransit service uh, before I move forward? We'll wait tomorrow. Okay, we'll wait till tomorrow. Thank you, and I believe you had something, Vice Chairman. Right? Do you have anything? Just previous question, Madam Chair. Thank you. It was more about, we were talking about mental health earlier, and, and just for the record, um, usually we do a proclamation that May is Mental Illness or Mental Health Month, but if our agenda is already full, I, 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 no problem. I just wanted to acknowledge that this is Mental Health Month uh, awareness. So. We definitely want to acknowledge that, uh, and, and since we have the entire month, I will ask Lisa if she would place it on our forthcoming meeting, our next meeting that's coming for, for Mental Health Month. We definitely want to recognize it's a very important topic 
not only in Douglas County, but the uh, United States at large. Okay, I'm going to move to the business items. We have authorization to combine two part-time magistrate deputy clerk positions to, to one full-time magistrate deputy clerk position. Susan Connor, how are you doing today, Ms. Connors? Yeah. I mean, the magistrate court is requesting that we um, we have two recently vacated part-time positions that we would love to turn into one full-time position. Um, this would save the county approximately three thousand six hundred dollars a year. Okay. Pretty self-explanatory. Board of commissioners, any comments? Or okay. Thank you so much. And it sounds like it's more than budget. But yes. Budget neutral. It's a savings also. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, tab number eight, authorization to approve a contract with National Science Plaza Incorporation for a signed plaza program and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Manager Ron Roberts, how are you? Good afternoon. Right. How are y'all doing today? Doing great. Well, I hope this thing in front of y'all is a win-win-win. certainly seems like it to me. So by updating the, uh, the, uh, the agreement that we have with National Science Plaza, what we want to do is open it up to uh, not just for residential directional, you know, homes in the 400s. This opens it up so that we can actually use uh, businesses can can advertise on there, mm -hmm. and it does uh, one. It would increase our revenue that we get from National Sign Plaza because we currently get 10 percent of those fees, um, and it also allows for us to uh, maybe use that messaging, live outside the lines. Currently, on top of the. The signs is, is this, if you've seen the directional signs that are through the county. So if we, we the new logo live outside the lines, Douglas County, we could do that as well. Um, and probably the most important uh, component is it helps to abate the placement of illegal signage and will help to uh, assist with Madam Chair's beautification goals for the county. Um, so that's really what's in the contract. We're updating it to allow that. and. Um, the, the last contract was signed in 2005. Uh, we've looked through uh, the agreements. Uh, this is uh, perfectly, uh, it's, a, it, it's a very good contract in, 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 in the sense that the county doesn't really have to do anything. We just get a check for these services. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Comments? Uh, um, Commissioner Guider. So yes, Ron. Uh, I've seen these in yes, the city. Yes, they're, uh, they're, but they're, I haven't seen them outside the city. There are some through the county. We got about forty that are kind of throughout spread. the county. Throughout the county. Okay. And I apologize. Uh, there was a, a program director that actually works the program. Had he had we had drawn up some of these uh, renditions to show y'all, but I don't know what happened to him today. I can't seem to find him. Um, but yes, so these are very. They're, they're throughout Cobb County. This is what Cobb County does. This is what this, the, the cities have done. Um, and like I said previously, uh, they were directional signs for residential to, to, to uh, point people to residential developments uh, and let them know the home prices. Also in the agreement, it allows for if the county would wanted to do this, we could actually use 10% of these signs for directional devices, like to municipal things or whatever as well. That's in the agreement. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. You yield back. Okay. Commissioner Mr. Roberts. Yes, ma'am. So far, what has the county, if any, um, funds have been allocated to this? Like, have we had any cost? No, ma'am. For this? None whatsoever? None. Okay. Have we done an RFP or RFQ for this? That's a good question, uh, Commissioner. I, I don't know. Uh, the, the original agreement that I have in my files goes back to 2005. And I, I don't know if, if this was, uh, if this was, if, national, if that was a competitive bid or, or not, um, I, I definitely can check into that. Okay. Um, I asked just because directional signage is, is a big business. It's a nice business. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that we want to make sure that our county um, directional signs are of all uniform uniformity. Is that is that what this is for? Um, yes, ma'am. It'd be well. We have that opportunity to make them make them uniform. Right now, this is what they look like. Yeah. And they, in the agreement, they, uh, the contract allows that it cannot exceed 12 feet high, and I think they're about uh, four, uh, four and a half feet wide. Um, and uh, so we also staff we can as staff we can dictate how many signs, where we put the signs, and everything. Okay, so we do have some 
oh, yeah. relationship. Complete and control over where they go and, and, and everything. Okay. That's what I wanted to ask. Was there a plan to make sure there's uniformity? Do we have say-so in it? Because part of the contract under the method of performing services, mm -hmm. um, Article 3, it says consultants shall determine the method, details, and means of performing the above described services. Counties shall have no right to and shall not control the manner or determine the method of accomplishing the consultant services. So that just kind of leaves me at a pause if mm -hmm. we didn't have any say-so over how those look or, um, or if they fit uniformity. Especially no. if we want to, you know, adhere to the branding of live outside the lines of Douglas County. Yes, Commissioner. Well, they, they really want to work with us. Mm -hmm. um, John Ash is the individual I've been working with. I meet him about every bi bi monthly. He brings a check by. But I just thought if we we're going to be updating this contract, let's go ahead and expand it so that we can get these businesses, so we can help out with the signage. It seemed like a win 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 for everybody. So that's kind of where we wanted to go with it. Um, do you know if he subcontracts any of the work out? Does he subcontract? Mm -hmm. I do not know. Okay. These are some of the questions I need you to ask him for me. And okay. And if you can report back to me, that would be wonderful. Okay. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, I yield, Madam you. Chair. Okay. okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Yeah, no, okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Oh, oh okay. Yep. I thought Kelly had jumped in. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, so let's, for clarity, Ron, for clarity, so, we dictate how many of the signs that that falls underneath our logo sign, correct? Y yes, sir. Okay. So, like I said, the signs cannot exceed 12 feet, um, and there's 10 panels on each sign. Okay. So there's a total of 10. That we'll, yes, sir. There's, okay, there's 10, it. and they can be they can either be one direction, and they can be on, printed on both sides. Right. Um, and uh, the uh, and, and like right now, uh, the only thing they're being used for is to highlight where residences are being developed. That's really the only reason. The only so are, are those signs where the residents are located, or let's say the subdivisions are located, are That's we paying right. for those as a county? Or are the, the subdivisions HOA or developer? Developers. Pay? Okay, developer paying for those, okay. Because it made me think that since we're just trying to say, hey, the subdivision is over here, uh, that mm -hmm. it might be us. If no, not, no, sir. No, it's, it's the developers. So these are directionals that that uh, developers will be paying to alert those who are looking for this type of housing, this type of uh, area, whatever, go in that direction of some sort. That's that's correct. Got uh, it. That's what they're being used for now. Now we want to, if if the, well, the agreement the way it's written, we can expand those that right. role and have the. Uh, Do we approve any and all signs that go up? for those developers and or whomever decide to advertise before they are placed up or these guys? Staff hasn't traditionally been involved in, in improving those. So it's, just, it's, kind of, it's totally managed by the project coordinator for National Sign Plaza. So we're taking on the risks of in the event that someone decides to put some unique language of any sort. <laughs> I didn't see anything in there that dealt with language. I felt like that was a question that would come up, but I don't think that there, the, 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 there, and that's kind of why I wanted John to be here, because I don't know what he has historically dealt with in the past as, like, uh, as it relates to what someone would put on there. Correct. Like, if we open it up, is it going to be, do we want to allow them to advertise for vape stores? Do we want them to allow it Correct. To, to whatever? But I think that... My understanding is we don't, we wouldn't want that. So, I mean, we're, I'm talking about like. So like how do we control it if, if these guys are the ones who actually decide uh, what that is, what the, what they no, say? But it, the, the way it's written, it's like we, we can have a say in what they put up. Okay. So make sure I'm understanding. So we don't screen or look at or review before posting. But we control what they put up because I think the sign guys this would just say the sign guys would just say, "Hey, it's a sign. It's your sign. You want a vapor, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Slap it on there. Give me two dollars and fifty cents. I don't know the numbers. Yeah. Give me two dollars and fifty cents. Slap it on directional. Go over here and grab that. Yeah. So, or do we want to control that to make sure that nothing? That's my. That's what I would would say. I mean, we haven't traditionally done it because it's only been residences. Since 2005, mm -hmm. since, since this agreement's been in place, it's only been res pointing people to residences where homes are available in that price range. Now, we wanna, I'm trying to open it up where we can get some additional revenue mm -hmm. in 
And, and I so, appreciate that. So what I would do would be work with with the project coordinator at National Science Plaza to, to see who is actually. Right, and the reason I'm asking you that part of it is, do we now in this contract, this new contract that you're proposing, that we put that type of language there that before anything is posted, before, and, and I don't know the exact legal term that, you either. know, yeah, that they can probably tell us what to be there. Sure. So what I don't want to see is something that we would not want, but you never viewed. Right, I understand. If that's, if that's, I definitely can go back to them and see what they want to do. It's already been through legal, but uh, we can definitely go back in and beef up that language if that's a, a, a real concern. I just honestly thought that we would be something I could handle. Be like, okay, well, we don't want this or we don't want that, but no, we need to have it in the contract, so I'll go back and we'll send it back through and, and, and add that language addition. Ken, can you look at that and, and, and verify? Sure. You know, Essentially, what I think I've heard is that you want WCAN to have uh, the right to approve whatever is going up or not. And I don't want to create any freedom of speech. Right. But I want to make sure that Cons consistency. Yes. Right. That that first of all it's legal. Second of all that it, it doesn't go against what this board you know. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. that I sure. just, But I, I want somebody to see it first. I don't want to just go say it's up there and we go like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and we ride by and go like, hey, well I thought that was okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, do we know what that is of what is okay and what's not okay? Well, let, let me give you, okay. let me give you, for instance, a, a, just a little bit about, I guess, legal's concern would be the following. Uh, let's say that you have a no tobacco ordinance that is applicable to ballparks and they're putting signs in ballparks. You wouldn't want a tobacco vendor to be able to advertise Correct. there. So we need to go back, uh, staff needs to go back and check what ordinances are in play that can be interpreted uh, is a violation or something that we need to be concerned about just across the board. Mm -hmm. the, the second problem is, assuming there is no uh, content regulation, it's more style, I guess. We need to be careful when you, when you create a limited public forum, you're sort of stuck with that forum. You can't regulate it on content based on the First right. Amendment, except with very limited, compelling public interest reasons for doing it. Uh, and while it's been 30 years ago, believe it or not, my thesis in law school was on the First Amendment, so I can get with them. But I think we need to figure out what kind of vetting we really are talking about. Correct. Because once you create this public forum, you're going to have a hard time. Let's say there's some businesses that can get a license in this town or community that you don't like. You're not going to be able to stop them from getting on this board with their name and their stuff correct because under first amendment they would be protected as an extreme and example and they should be right yeah and they should be and i'm not i'm not trying to deny those right but i just want to make sure that we mm -hmm. you know know what that is that we're not only legally but can do but what this board represents and we don't infringe on anybody's right. first amendment make sense am i it does yeah i understand where you're coming I, from. i think what i'm concerned about a little bit is uh, how staff is going to interact with National Pine, uh, Na National Sign Plaza, this company, mm -hmm. as far as reviewing what it is they're going to put right. up and when they're going to put it up, or are they just going to go put it up and it's after fact and whether you have the staff that will be in the process. So how do, I, we, how do we make sure that the staff signs off on whatever that is? And now if they sign off on it, then that's a whole different story. I think but, we probably need to have a sit down with them before we bless us in its entirety. And I apologize. I, I honestly thought uh, the, the project manager was going to be here today. I knew this would be an issue that would come up, and I felt like they've been in business since 1997 and have these all over the country. I am mm -hmm. certainly they have, they have yeah. they've run into that issue before, and I just think that's probably what we need to do. I'll just go back and see what we can do to address it. Okay, okay, because I, I just, I, I don't want the what if or oops, my bad. <laughs> That's what I don't want to see us end right. up doing. So. Sure. Uh, outside of that, I, I, I agree with, with those. My colleagues have spoken, so I won't rehash what they've already spoken about. So okay. that's, that's my only concern with this year, though. So, and I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. And uh, Clerk, uh, if you could, we'll defer this for tomorrow, this business item, and you will have the gentleman here sure. at our next meeting, the last meeting in May, so he could uh, give uh, further information, provide further information to this board. Uh, Vice Chairman Robson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to that point, <clears throat> I, I don't really think we're ready for this one. Right. And, and, and it's, it's, we're just not. 
um, this, this is a broader issue, and there also was another underlying issue about somebody's had a contract since 2005. Um, it's like, what now? Um, I'd like for us to revisit that as well. Um, if we're going to renew this person's contract, and we're going to expand the scope of services, and we've got an overlaying ordinance that we're about to revisit, I, I just think we need to pause overall. Um, and, and I'm not certain who takes the lead or procurement, but this one right here is sort of, that, that's cash cow. And I know about signs, um, mm -hmm. like anything else, it like, yeah, that, that begins to print. Um, and, and relatively speaking, but still it's important. So if there's somebody, I don't know a national sign company, if they're local or how it works, but surely there's people here probably that would love an opportunity to sort of bid on that, um, that can handle our little 199 square mile footprint, right? That, that this would be a great opportunity. So I'd like for some consideration to be done to that, but I'm sure I have no in, um, say about who, who, who advocates for this. I yield, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Point of, point of order, Madam Chair. Chair. So, okay, Commissioner Mitchell. Uh, just one last closing. So with that being said, though, do we take this item, give you some time, and give us some time to remove it from the uh, consent agenda so we can have a discussion of some sort, and that way we won't end up you know, having to vote for this or reject or, 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 or deny or whatever we end up doing with this. So if uh, I'll just ask that we pull that one to give all of us a little bit more time to give legal some more time to kind of review it. Uh, and then decide on which direction we go. The, because we're at a work session, uh, right. with, uh, and it's not a voting meeting, the yes. chair can remove it yeah. exactly. and just put it on another. She has well, yeah, authority. That's, that's okay. Yeah. That. I, I just want to make that recommendation that we that we do that, Madam Chair. So that's on you, though. It's your I, call. I did. I, I said it a few minutes ago. I said defer, but oh, move it. Okay. I, I, I should have said take it off. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we are just. Um, Mr. Roberts, yes. we, you know, we're going to remove this. It won't be on the consent agenda tomorrow, but okay. the, your goal is to have the gentleman here next at our next meeting so he can elaborate on some of those specific questions that the Board of Commissioners had. So hopefully he could be here, okay? And then also just to pick, uh, pivot on Commissioner uh, Robinson and Vice Chairman Robinson, we just want to make sure this is bidded out. It's been there a long time, 2005 is long. So that's something that uh, Commissioner Carthen will work with uh, our um, Director Bill Peacock on to just kind of look at how long it's been sitting there. Okay? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Well, you have tab number nine, authorization to approve the preliminary plat for villages at Brookmont Mont, Pod F2 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Can you tell us what this is? Yes, ma'am. This is the second phase of the townhome lots at the villages at Brookmont, um, which are all de designated as F pods. Okay. Uh, all lots are on sewer. Um, total acreage is approximately five acres, and there are 27 houses on this plat. The minimum size is 1,600 square feet, but I believe the, they're landing in the 1840 to 1860 square foot range. The first plat for Pod F Unit 1 was originally recorded in 2007, and only a few townhomes were built. The remainder were replatted in July of 2016 to make some minor adjustments for the boundary lines. And Unit 1 is a total of 3.5 acres and contains 39 lots. To date, 39 homes have been built in that first unit, and this is an additional 27 for that. Okay. Any questions from the board? Yes. Madam Chair? Vice Chairman? Yeah, just, just acknowledgement that um, um, seeing residential growth come back, seeing that we have alternative options um, uh, for housing. Everybody doesn't want three-acre minimums, you know. Um, I won't go on and on about that, but there, there are other housing options that the public desires here, and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that town haunt option being built here. Um, obviously, I'm biased in District 2, and so I appreciate um, just the fact that that, you know, it's one of those things when I talked about when I came to office about the recession, it was sort of the broken promise. Brookmont, like Tributary, like Anawake, all of these were broken promises. In other words, those, these are still incomplete communities. Right, that people moved in and they're looking for their equity, their values to go up. As much as we talk about taxes going down, everybody wants their, their, their values to go up. Um, you know, obviously it's self-serving on depends on which you're trying to sell or you're trying to pay taxes. That being said, um, this is something that, um, get, um, will you be able to provide information um, on the number of uh, starts that have happened this year so far um, and unincorporated as well as incorporated? Can you provide that information for us? Just to clarify, so you're, you're asking for the number of, of houses that we've started in, in, yes. in the county? Sure, we can find that. We'll get okay. that together for you. And, and county administrator, I think development, sir, you guys provide a report um, often, maybe quarterly, but I'm mm -hmm. looking for something specifically regarding this, so maybe by commission district, because I think sometimes we, we get sort of this 
uh, broad countywide, which I think is important, but at the same point, um, you, you like to know the activity within your, 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 your area um, so that you can speak to the need and what you can advocate for. So, Madam Chair, I'll request that offline. I yield. Okay, thank you so much. Commissioner Guider. Yes, uh, Ron, uh, where is this? Um, I know it's in District 1 and 5, so that's the city somewhere, right? Uh, or in no, District 1? It's, um, uh, well, it's the Brookmont subdivision just past, like if you, when you're going past Gold Gems on the left right there at uh, Fowler Park. Go back oh. in there. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's the pods that are in the back furthest, almost to Pope so, Road. Uh, and I'm not th all that familiar about pod F2 or whatever. Um, the 1,800 square foot home is does not require is not qu required here. It. We have a minimum of 1,800 square foot for homes. We do. So, does do these don't fall under the in, well, home? I mean, I, my understanding <laughs> in talking with and I think Howard's here. He could speak probably to this too. But I think that when I, my staff talked to him, they were landing in. 1840 to 1860 square foot so they were a while ago you said 16. well that's what in the original that's what in the original conditions of the master plan was that was it would be a minimum size of 1600 square feet there's a there's a there's a there's a long list of conditions that was approved originally for brookmont and includes but they they didn't build it out and now that they're coming back before us to approve this does the 1,800 square foot per home requirement apply? It applies here, but I mean, in, in the original master plan, they have, a con they have a condition that they can build a minimum of 1,600 square feet. If they wanted to build these townhomes 1,600 square foot, they could. And that, that's, part of the, uh, that's part of the conditions of zoning, too. So, that, so there's an ordinance for the zoning mm -hmm. for this that was approved. Um, so this was so approved be before changed. we went to the 1,800 square foot house. This is a town. I I, I'm just confused dates. why it's 1,600 rather than 1,800. Yep, I would have to check the dates, but it is zoned with these specific conditions, which overrides the 1,800 square feet. But when was it zoned that way? This was originally in 2006. So it was before the fall. Uh, the recession. Yes, ma'am. It was before the recession. So they didn't build out. They they no, did not finish building out. I'm just curious. Why is it not 1,800 square foot requirement minimum? It's, be well, it's because it was part of the. These conditions were part of the zoning. Part of the zoning, and also, I mean, when you come in with a master plan and development like that, you can you can have certain flexibility with house size and and things of that nature. I mean. You, you can work on amenities, you can, you can add retail component, you can add all kinds of different things. I mean, a master plan community is what is it you want to do? And I think that's kind of what happened here. This, 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 this Brookmont was, was originally zoned that had a commercial component, mm -hmm. it had, um, which is right there off of... Uh, Chapel Hill Road. Right, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. I know where it is when you said the soccer field. I, right, I right, could relate field. to it, yeah. And if you recall, we had a rezoning that came through a couple months back. Uh, to do townhomes right where they were going to originally do commercial. Well, I guess I was under the thinking that it, if it was zoned way back when, mm -hmm. but it did not pan out within a given time, then everything you had to start from scratch because we had something that ha happened on a subdivision in my district. But um, no, a, if legal is saying it's okay to build a 1,600 square foot house rather than a 18, then so be it. Was, yes, ma'am. It's part of the original zoning let me, condition. Let me speak for myself, if you don't mind. Just be <laughs> careful here. It, and, and I don't know the history, but assuming the history was at a zoning meeting, this plat was previously approved and had as a condition in the plat the square footage or whatever was being proposed at this time. I think, and I'll stand corrected by staff, but I think they have two years to vest that zoning condition. Mm -hmm. But if they, if if it doesn't, to unvest it, the Board of Commissioners would have had to take action to vote to unvest it after that two year period of time under UDC, if I remember right. And Ron, somebody in your staff here can verify that because I don't ever remember unvesting anybody, but no, it's, it's, it's a, a two year, it's a two year period in which to exercise mm -hmm. the zoning, 
It doesn't just go away on its own, though, unless the board does something. And to my knowledge, the board hadn't done anything on this particular piece. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um, well, you have something, Commissioner Mitchell? Yeah, I, I do. I'm just so so. Help me to understand. So so, where <laughs> where are we then? We at 18 or we at 16? <laughs> if we if it never changed or it came prior to and it was after the two-year mark and I don't know how I probably could answer this when it all came about the yeah. whole you know so help me out I'm just maybe I'm well a listen if you unless you unless you did you know the way I believe the code and I'm doing this total from him James get up here and jump in for a please quickly yes. before I drown myself sorry about this but, but as I understand the code and I'm doing this mm -hmm. like in the back of my head James they have two years to best after a zoning that's correct. If so, they, go ahead. Look, take it from there. <laughs> little background. So okay. um, I don't know the exact dates, but they had a master plan. Uh, I believe this was a PUD from the early 2000s. Okay. They have a whole list of um, conditions that go along with it. Those conditions ride along with it, as you're saying, after they're vested. The two-year vest mark is typically either permitting some kind of construction. Uh, there's some other legalities that go into that. but. So are you vested even if you laid out, and I apologize for jumping in, vested even laying down the infrastructure or any? Well, so okay. yes, but in this case, the master plan covered the whole subdivision. So I got you. Uh, I don't know the percentage, but the majority of the subdivision is complete. Okay. It has been complete. Okay. This is just one kind of outline phase. Okay. So they did, they completed A, B, C, D, um, some of E. So, so essentially, okay. they vested the zoning vested. condition in the mm -hmm. PUD back then. Right. So it is vested, and you so can't take it from them. These conditions will ride with it. Okay. Gotcha. And that's all I want to hear. Okay. I'm, I'm, just for clarity, because I, I think my commissioner uh, uh, guy was basically going there to try to figure out what, how, how do we get from 16 to 18. To make it so muddy. To clear it up, 1600 okay. or 1800, yes. <laughs> it's either, it's 1800 if you just come in. Now, with it, a new no conditions it's, that's just the flat line rule okay. now we're not doing PPs you've answered anymore, my question but, uh, okay yeah. i was but, just but, curious why yeah and i think we we, we kind of got an answer from the mere fact of what is, where they are with this whole situation that it was vetted and we at the 16 mark not at the 18 because they decided to kind of complete the other <clears throat> hypothetically two projects or something or two, five other projects that's within there but i know howard he could probably go in there and, and fix it all up and make it and right. And they've got square footage just <laughs> ranging from I don't, no, 16 no. may be the lowest up to like 5,000 square feet. And, and, and so. that was going to be my next question though, Ryan. Is it 16 is the lowest that mm -hmm. they can kind of deal with? That was the, on the, that was the minimum size in the, on the original okay. conditions for Brook Mark. Got it. <laughs> so, so they are, they can go at no lower than 16. And you're not going anywhere. They're like, the, come on up, Tyler. Come, come on, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Ray, okay. 6554 East Church Street. Um, just to be clear, I want to make sure everybody understands, these are townhomes. Oh. They're attached, okay? Yes. So it's not single family. Okay. Got it. So in the townhome okay. pod, they can actually build 10% of the total units down to 1,400. Got okay, it. per the zoning stipulations. Okay. 1,600 is minimum, 10% of total number, which I don't know what that is, okay. is 14. My developer, who is local, lives here in Douglasville, <laughs> is going to his his smallest plan he's given me is 1840. oh so hopefully that makes it see, cleaner for that. everybody uh, today okay I, I, see, <laughs> see, I, I knew that that's why i want you to come up and share that with us so everybody can can understand it and not be fearful of what it might be under 16. Yeah. but thank you howard i appreciate it yeah. I, I yield back madam chair okay thank you so much my bad all right no problem okay yes. well board of commissioners we definitely have a, a robust schedule today and what i'm going to do is i'm going to call for a recess and when I call for that recess and that motion, I'm going to call also for an executive session as well, and that'll be 30 minutes. It's a quarter to one, and uh, we need to report back at, down here at least 1.15, so that'll give you an opportunity. We are going back uh, to the Board of Commissioners Conference Room for our executive session, so at this time, I have two things to call. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Uh, Attorney Bernard, I need him to tell me. Attorney yeah. Bernard, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, ma Madam Chair, I think that the, I think uh, the executive session is a continuation before the recess. But if you're planning on coming back after a certain time, 
that's fine. Uh, we do have a legal matter, to t two litigation matters to deal with. So if you want to take a motion to go into executive session uh, to, uh, for le two legal matters and then recess until a time certain, that would be an appropriate motion. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go in, into uh, executive session also with the time constraint of returning back as a recess within a recess period of 115? Do we have a motion? Returning back at 115. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand by indicating. Okay, we have a unanimous vote. We'll see you all back down here at 115, Board of Commissioners. All right, Board of Commissioners, welcome back. And uh, at this time, do we have a motion to come out of recess? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. Thank you. Board of Commissioners, we, as I mentioned before we um, went into executive session, we have a really robust um, schedule today. So if we could, on our comments, just limit those to a minute so we can just keep moving forward. It's been a long day today for you all, and I appreciate uh, all the participation and all the great things that we're learning that's happening here in Douglas County about the things that are happening here. Next, we are on tab number 10. So I'm starting back with the new biz with the business items. So if you uh, re just refer to tab number 10, authorization to approve a claim for a property tax credit as recommended by the Board of Assessors. Uh, Benny Waldrop, how are you doing? D Director Waldrop, come on up. Parcel 707-18221, Tuscany Hotel. At the first of the year, we had a system as being 100% complete. They didn't get their certificate of occupancy till right at the end of the month. So they were right around 99% complete. And by the way the law was set up, if it's less than 100%, they also got an economic factor of 0.75. Mm -hmm. So an absorption uh, amount. <laughs> And therefore, that's why I'm requesting a credit for $33,752.63. The Board of Assessors approved, the tax commissioner approved, and we come before you and ask for you to approve it. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Director Waldrop. Board of Commissioners, any questions regarding this uh, credit? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to tab number 11, authorization to accept the ACCG Group Health Benefits Program Health Promotion Grant in the amount of $3,000 and ask uh, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Director Perry. Yes, Madam Chair, Board of Commissioners, this is just the second uh, piece of a uh, grant that was granted to the board, uh, to Douglas County from ACCG in regards to our Health Promotion and Wellbeing Grant. Um, and uh, we just want to receive those funds so we can continue to move forward with the uh, health and wellness initiatives we have planned. Okay, thank you so much, Board of Commissioners. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Pretty self explanatory. Thank you. Tab number 12, 12 authorization to approve a car allowance agreement for Rachel Ackley, Assistant District Attorney, and authorize the chairman to sign all related to. Um, documents legal department madam chair and board members this is just simply a replacement uh, one uh, uh, car allowance is leaving the DA's office and this one's coming in as I understand it from Mark okay board of commissioners any questions all right we'll move on to the next item which is tab number 13 authorization to approve the annual agreement for tourism product development between Douglas County Georgia and the Tourism and History Commission and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Our legal counsel. Madam Chair, uh, the county administrator is going to handle this item in the next two. Okay. So, Madam Chair, items 13, 14, and 15 mm -hmm. are uh, contracts for uh, history and tourism, the Chamber, Douglas County Chamber of Commerce, and the Cultural Arts Council. Um, these three contracts are paid out of uh, hotel motel tax with uh, some documentation that was sent to us from DCA early in the year we realized that our existing contracts needed to be revised um, slightly to make sure we're in compliance with DCA rules as far as hotel motel tax mm -hmm. um, so we have revised all three of these contracts um, to conform with DCA uh, rules and regulations 
and then the amounts are exactly the same as um, what was budgeted, what, what was last year. So for history and tourism, it's uh, 130,000 uh, up to, well, whatever the hotel motel tax comes in, they get like 57.5% up to 130,000. Uh, number 14, which is the Chamber of Commerce, it's 130,000 too also. Um, and then the Cultural, Cultural Arts Council is $57,240. What is the Cultural Arts Council again? $57,240. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? All right, well, we'll move on. Thank you so much. We covered three tabs, 13, 14, and 15. We'll move to tab number 16, authorization to execute a new contract with Ichi or Uchi, uh, formerly Tidbit, due to the organization's name change and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Debbie McDonald, is Ms. McDonald here? There she is. Could you just share with the Board of Commissioners? Yes, ma'am. Why the name change? Mm -hmm. um, it's just the company we've had um, a contract with as of January the 2nd. They're just changing their name, so we're just doing a change name document. Okay. Any questions from the board? Madam Chair, if I can just point out one thing. Uh, there, there's a confidentiality provision in this agreement. Legal has passed on it saying it's okay because the subject matter of the content that uh, these folks retrieve for, or it's juvenile, for juvenile programs and juvenile related. So. Uh, we believe the confidentiality is appropriate as required by law. So I just wanted to point that out, which is different from your normal contracts. Okay. Any questions from the board? Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. All right, tab number 17, authorization to approve a transit services contract with Transitions Commute Solutions, LLC, in the amount of $2 million annually and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Director Watson. Madam Chair, after months of negotiation, discussion, back and forth, give and take, we finally have a contract to recommend to the Board of Commissioners that Transition Commute Solutions be the third party operator of our fixed route bus service and paratransit service. Uh, getting to this point with this contract has been a true collaborative effort. Uh, we've had the counties outside uh, legal, uh, Freeman, Mathis, and Gary in, involved, uh, the county's in-house legal department, uh, Mr. Bernard and, and Jennifer Moore have been very helpful with this. The Connect Douglas staff is, has been helpful with it. Uh, Justin Rising and his staff from Transitions Commute Solutions. And also I want to be a, give a big shout out to Matt Laverne, uh, our Office of Risk and Safety Director, who has sort of taken the lead on getting this contract approved and ironing out all the details in it. Uh, let me give you just a few of the highlights of the contract. If the contract is approved tomorrow, it will run from May 7, 2019 through May 6, 2020. The budget for the contract is not to exceed $2 million annually. Uh, this $2 million includes all payments that will be made to the contractor, plus items that will be paid directly by Douglas County, such as fuel for the vehicles and maintenance of the vehicles. This is a reimbursement contract. Each month um, we will give the uh, contractor a check for allowable expenses he presents to us. Uh, we'll also be giving him a check uh, each month for $18,750. This represents their management fee. The contract is performance-based. Uh, there are performance standards in the contract and penalties if those performance standards aren't met. And um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the Office in Risk and Safety and Legal has thoroughly vetted the insurance aspects of this contract to make sure that the, uh, the county is, is, is covered. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Madam Chair, can I just add a couple of things? Mm -hmm. just, uh, these are yes, uh, just please. highlights. And Wayne, I think it goes without saying Wayne's work real hard. He's credited to everybody else, but he's been involved in this uh, for a great deal as well. 
essentially what you're creating in here is you're creating a, a contract with an independent contractor and you're running it as a joint venture for, for primary purposes where there's cost insurance, cost identification, et cetera. It is subject to budget caps each year. Uh, there's a budget approval process. I think the cap on the first year is $2 million. You're paying a $225,000 fee for an administrative fee plus the budget amount on budget expenses. But this is something I think y'all would want to know. If you, if you ever have a lack of funding, you, cut, you can terminate this contract with 30 days notice. If you uh, want to terminate it just generally for whatever the reason, you have to give 180 days notice. And if you want to, if, uh, if there's a cessation of business or whatnot, it can be terminated for cause. And I think that provision, I want to say, is 90 days. So I wanted to make sure y'all aware it's an annual it's an annual contract subject to two roll two rollovers. Uh, there's three different kinds of termination provisions in it. There's insurance provisions in it that's been well vetted by Matt and the Office of Risk and Safety. You're the, when the bus goes out. If something happens to the bus, you're responsible for the bus. If something happens that involves somebody, you're responsible for the bus unless there's something that's solely on, on the part of the contractor. But simple negligence would fall under our insurance probably, I'm telling you all ahead of time. Essentially, you're getting an independent entity as an independent contractor to run your bus service for you. And there's some cross uh, financing in that, uh, when I say cross financing, some of it's not purely in the form of cash, some of it is in the form of gas and repairs and whatnot. Did I summarize that all right, Wayne? Absolutely. Yes, sir. All right. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners or comments? I'm sorry. I keep calling you Wayne. I don't know why I got Wayne Watson in my head. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Gary. If y'all wonder who Wayne is, right? this is Wayne. His name's Gary. <laughs> I've been called I apologize. I've been called worse, so that's okay. That's what you said, Wayne. <laughs> Okay. Anybody, who would we start with? Wayne, I wrote it down. Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you had a comment. And then a, no. You don't. Commissioner Gotti, you have. Just uh, something on what Kenny said. Now, Kenny, you said something about uh, uh, negligence could fall back on the county. Uh, ne negligence of their employees could fall back on us? Well, there's cross identification, but I can tell you if something happens on the bus, they're going to sue us and the, and the operator will be in the case regardless. Our insurance will be in play. Their insurance will be in play. I think the separation lines mostly, and I don't, Matt's probably not, I don't know if Matt's still here. The separation lines mostly are the employees of the operator belong to the operator. They're responsible for their own work-related injuries. They're not under our benefits plan. They're not under our health insurance plan. They don't get paid by the county. The operator has to deal with the employees. So the separation on liability probably is at that point on workers' comp related injuries. As to the operation of the bus, essentially you're getting an operator to operate your bus system. And so there's some duality there and there's some agency principles that apply. And we, it, we should not tell y'all y'all won't be held accountable if somebody gets hurt by a bus because that would not be true but we don't hire and fire them we don't know their background and everything so well, the, it seems like our contract would cover that well i'm, I'm going to tell you this contract does they, they've got to meet certain spe specifications on the hiring process qualifications for but uh, gary help me if i'm wrong because wayne's left the building but if i remember one of the schedules in here also talks about how they hire how they screen uh, or alcohol and drug tests, if I remember. Am I so far? Have I got it all? Yes, sir. That's that's correct. And Justin Risen is here with transitions. If if you would like to hear. Yeah, we would like to hear from him, Mr. Risen. Please come forth. Thank you. I saw you earlier, but I didn't know if you had. Well, I think. What what directly would you like to answer? Well, I, I was just concerned about our liability when we have a contract with you and it, the you, the employees that's going to be driving the bus are your employees, not ours. Yes, ma'am. And I I didn't understand the liability on our part. Right. So right off the bat, um, as there are employees, uh, we'll take care of the workers' compensation, general liability, unemployment. So anything that occurs on that vehicle, any injury at all that comes to our driver, uh, will be under our insurance policy. Now I'm talking about to a. Uh, passenger uh, no, because passenger of negligence the, on the part of the right the way, the way that the uh, contract is written if it is negligence uh, on the part of uh, our company not putting the right person in there which 
isn't, isn't going to happen, but in that case, under the contract terms, we would actually step in and release Douglas from that concern because it would fall under our commercial policies and our insurance policies. So if it was determined that it was negligence, and negligence meaning that we didn't train or hire them correctly or didn't follow the policies within the, the terms of the contract. Um, so there are times where a, a driver might not follow a, a certain procedure or they could be speeding um, and there's an accident. That's not necessarily negligence on our part if we've trained them how to follow the rules and they've gone through all the necessary requirements. As he was saying, we have multiple layers of training both uh, from our company as well as some additional training uh, in the contract from, from Douglas as well. Uh, so those are different pieces that are in there. I know there's always that human error though because I drove a school bus one time <laughs> and you never know what someone's going to do when they go out in front of you as you're taking off. Uh, you had to be very careful. Things like that. But uh, is there going to be a clause in the contract to say that you would, any negligence on the part of your employee would be your responsibility in total? There is not anything in the contract that relates to, to that language because, again, it depends on what the negligence is. If it's related to us not training somebody or not properly going through any of the, the hiring practices in the contract, that negligence does fall on us. If the driver is doing something, say, speeding and causes the accident, and we've trained them how to drive correctly, that would go back to the, the auto policy um, for, from that point of view. Because okay. there's, there's, there's just certain things, from, and this is kind of where this contract has gone through, is that there are just certain risks that you can do as best you can in a contract from a point of view to make sure that you have separation uh, from, from point to point. Uh, and those are one of those pieces that no matter who's hiring the individual, uh, at the end of the day, people are going to operate uh, to a certain level. And we, tr and we do our best to, to mitigate accidents and control those things and to keep, frankly, the, the insurances out of your hands from the county. Yeah, well, I served on the safety board for many, many years, and, and we had to review every accident that involved a county vehicle, and so it's just human error especially in backing and things like that. But uh, when, and that's only with, most of the time, they only had one passenger. Maybe they had up to 10 if they were a van pool or something like that. But when you have several um, people on the bus and then you have someone that's handicapped also, uh, that, that's my concern. From, so, from the private point of view, I'll say this, that um, it does a very good job of making sure there is ownership on our company and what we do. Uh, and, and obviously there is some ownership because you own the vehicles that fall back on the county. Uh, but I think it, 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 we are protected uh, to the point that we can be, you are protected to the point that you can be, and, and in between there are just some places where those accidents are in, it's, it's with on certain And policies. does your company operate other bus services here in Georgia? Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you name a couple? We, we are the contract stakeholder for uh, Three Rivers Regional Commission. So oh, okay. that, that is new. Do you do the Carroll County one then? Yes, ma'am. We started that program for them. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, I yield back. And let, me, let me just add one point, if I can. Uh, and I think the, the, the point was well heated. You, you, the county still has sovereign immunity except to the extent of its insurance limits, which Matt will make sure we have appropriate insurance limits. So that wouldn't stop a defense. Uh, for sovereign, uh, sovereign immunity, except to the extent that you have insurance coverage. Further, if there is an issue of far, as far as contribution or identification, our insurance carrier, if it pays out, will go against them anyway. They'll take our position and they'll go against the, uh, potentially go against the operator for reimbursement. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to get reimbursed, but there's a process outside the settlement process or resolution process or judgment process why our carrier will be able to take a look at whether or not it's appropriate to try to get a reim reimbursement. But I, I think I think it, it sort of is what it is. I don't know that we can tighten it down any more mm -hmm. unless we shift the burden completely to them or shift it completely to us. It's sort of, uh, Gary, I guess you were involved in the negotiation. I think this is the negotiating point. We feel comfortable. It's reasonable. Matt Laverne is speedily going to the podium. Matt, you gonna say something? Uh, I was just coming down here to assist if there were any questions. <laughs> Direct questions regarding the agreement. I did work with legal on it. I think I think we're good. I think I think we're all good. We're good. Yeah. We're good. I yield back. Good. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Any other questions from the board? All right. Thank you. Did you have one, Vice Chairman? Okay. I'm just. 
I have to, my eyes, my peripheral vision is not the best. I'm trying to turn my head both ways. All right. Tab number 18, I believe. Yeah, tab number 18, authorization to accept the award for the Federal Transit Administration Grant GA 2019-005-00 in the amount of $2 million with the local match of $400,000 for the first year operations of Connect Douglas fixed route bus service and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Watson. Yes, ma'am. This, mm -hmm. this is the CMEC grant that we've talked about for months. So it has finally been uh, awarded by the Federal Transit Administration. It's uh, for $1.6 million per year, which, which requires a $400,000 local match. This will be used to operate uh, the bus service. This grant is renewable for an additional two years. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I, I knew this was coming, so I, I figured I would two for one. Uh, again, it, we're moving forward. Um, um, I mean, the timing of e Executive Director Tomlinson this morning talking about the broader ATL, uh, where Douglas County fits in a broader scheme of, 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 of mobility. Um, again, Director Watson, we do appreciate your effort. Um, all of this was because of your, again, your leadership regarding this. This wasn't easy to your point, um, you, but you stayed fast for the needs of the people. Um, this contribution by the Board of Commissioners as it relates to the match is key. The federal grant uh, was important. I know there was some commentary, what's taking them so long to deliver, you know, nine buses or 13 buses. Well, part of it is you're tied to federal funding. And obviously we know we had um, the federal shutdown there that delayed some things and stuff, but it wasn't the lack of um, you being on top of things and you moving the process forward. So I, I don't want that to be falling on deaf ears to think that um, anything at the local level was a delay in this. It just took what it took. It took an awful lot of planning to bring on a new service such as this. I mean, yes, we have experience. We have four other offerings within our mobility, but this was one that just, it took what it took to get it to where it is. And so I'm anticipating um, when this will be launched. Um, so here's my question. What communication has been done to advise the public now that we're sort of on a pending moment? Is anything going on to the public beyond our, um, uh, inclusive of our efforts with our, our partner? Well, we've done a lot to, to let the public know about the uh, upcoming bus service. We recently uh, issued a direct mail piece that went out to about 53,000 businesses and residents in Douglas County. And we know that the folks got them because our phones at the Transportation Center have been ringing off the hook since that uh, piece went out. People are wanting to know about the bus service. When is, when is it going to start? How, how can they ride? Um, uh, we have a sky banner at our place mall that looks really good. Is in a great location near the, the food court. Uh, we've had two lunch and learn sessions where we've invited uh, human services uh, agencies uh, to the meetings to, where we can tell them about not only the bus service but the other uh, mobility services uh, that we have. Um, we've had some sessions where we've gone out and talked to individuals about how to use a paratransit service, and we've got s some additional meetings planned and, and some other exciting things planned as we move up toward launch. Okay. And, I, and I'll close with this. If you think about it, again, um, you know, mobility is it's really not about popularity. Um, you know, providing options to citizens is just that, it's choice. And you pick and choose the utility that will move you along, just like me. It's choice. I can do it this way, I can do it that way, depends on what I'm going to do. But I appreciate our approach to it, in other words, we provide options to the citizens and they get to self-select. They're not told what they can ride, when they can ride, they're beginning options. They're using their tax dollars and they're coming back to them in a way that they feel empowered, that there's dignity there. Um, there's some very unique needs of our citizens that are not marginalized into one flavor fits all. And I appreciate you advocating, because people just don't understand, you're already providing four services, this will be the fifth, um, not you know, inclusive of the, uh, the para and everything else is coming down the pipe. So again, for the citizens to hear this, and I'm sure I appreciate your fourth wife, so to put a demand on staff to provide that countywide communication, because I think that's key. What we learned last time, and Director Watson, you, you brought it up, is that for the four services we currently offered, a lot of people didn't even know we offered them. 
So again, one more time, there was an unmet needs here in the county or services were there for them and they didn't even know. They were detached from their government. Well, whose fault is that? It's the government's. So I appreciate what you've done with this and taking us to a whole other level. And so with that, Madam Chair, I'm good. I yield back. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, I'll move on. Okay. Thank you thank so you. much, Director Watson. So, thank you. Tab number 19, authorization to allow the Tourism Department to file to incorporate a non-profit uh, 501c6 organization as Douglas County Travel and Tourism as the official destination marketing, marketing organization, DMO, for the purpose of receiving hotel motel tax revenues in compliance uh, with the Department of Community Affairs. Director Cash, Colin Cash, could you come forward? Please. Um, Madam Chair, while Colin's on her way up, Colin can answer any questions, but essentially this, this item is also required. It goes along with 13, 14, and 15 um, for us to be in compliance with uh, DCA regulations. Hotel to motel tax monies have to be funneled through a 501c6. So we're asking the authorization to um, incorporate a nonprofit 501c6 for Douglas County in the name of Douglas County Travel and Tourism. Okay. you have any comments for us? Um, I do not, unless any of you have questions, okay. I'll be happy to address any other questions. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner uh, uh, Mitchell. What is a 501c6? It's a nonprofit organization that's different from a 501c3 is, um, you know, well, you know what Churches a 501c3 is. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. A 501c6 is a, a business association similar to a chamber of commerce. Okay. Um, it's not your typical 501c3 that are your, uh, where you donate the yeah, Cancer yeah. Society and right, right. You know, those kind of things. Okay. Okay. I, I yield back. I'm just curious. Okay. Right. There's like 501c Many, members, members. members. Infinity. Got it. Okay. okay. And I just want to say hi. Hi. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Director Cash. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to tab number 20. Authorization to accept a check from Je Jeff Hobson and Associates Auction Company in the amount of $24,817.50. Uh, for proceeds from the auction of an abandoned property place and then have this money placed into the general fund. Major Holmes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Good afternoon. Um, this is our most recent auction that we did on abandoned property that we're just asking you all to accept this check and put it in the general fund. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Guider. Yes. Uh, Bobby, uh, abandoned property or confiscated? This is abandoned property. This is uh, anything that we uh, obtain through law enforcement action that's not seized through the courts, um, uh, where we would people leave stuff out, or we pick stuff up through the course of our jobs um, in investigations and things like that. When cases are over with with the courts, if we have some property of some folks that we try to give it back to them, and they don't want it back or they don't contact us to get it back. The process that we do is once we get enough items together to do an auction, it runs in the Sentinel for four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then within 10 days of that fourth week, it's auctioned off at a place that we've been using for several years now, Jeff Dobson and Associates, to do all the auctions for us. And everything that's coming from abandoned property goes in the general fund. If it's something that sees through forfeiture, right. yeah. it's different. It may go into the drug fund or something like that. But this is just nothing but uh, general fund. And it's just miscellaneous items. Could it be uh, like guns, cars? Yes, whatever. it can be firearms. <laughs> uh, it's not cars. Cars are done differently. Yeah. But it could be it could be some firearms. It could be um, just personal Equipment. property, things like that. Yeah. Equipment, things like that. Computers. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I yield back. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Guider. Any other comment before I move forward? We'll move on to tab number. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. I'm smiling at you. Tab number tw uh, 21, authorization to reject any and all bids submitted for the metal building at the Douglas County Fire Department Training Complex and refine the scope of work and rebid the project as re recommended by the Fire and EMS Committee. Uh, Deputy Chief Zach Meyer. Madam Chair, Commissioners, this is a building that we were going to, uh, we are going to construct for storage for our fire trucks and some of the EMA stuff. But we put the 
the bid out through purchasing and all of the bids came back um, more than we want to spend. So we are redoing our scope of work to try to bring down the price and then rebid it again. Okay. Any questions from the board? Comments? Okay. Well, we'll move on to tab number 22, authorization to purchase the furnishing for station three, Bill Arp, uh, Splost renovation project in the amount of $15,000 to be funded by the 2016 Splost funds as recommended by the Fire and EMS Committee. Deputy Chief <coughs> Zach Meyer again. Yes, ma'am. This is our, our Bill Arp station number three that we've remodeled with uh, Splost funds. And it's just some tidying up some uh, interior stuff, some furniture. Um, we did some more work on the cabinets, some extra lighting in the bathrooms, um, that kind of stuff. In the, uh, we, have, we now have a training room in that station that we didn't have before, before we remodeled, so we've got to get some furniture and some uh, uh, stuff for that room. Okay. Any questions from the board? Um, Deputy Chief, do we have a ribbon cutting ceremony planned for this? We, we do, and that's, we're planning, we're try, looking now at uh, June 8th. June 8th. It's a Saturday about 2 o'clock. Um, we're working on that now. Okay. All right. Well, great job. Yes, it looks really good. Oh, thank you. All right, we don't have any questions from the board, so thank you. Thank you so much, Chief, Deputy Chief. All right, last but not least is tab number 12. No, we'll just say this is for just the business items. Tab number 23, authorization to approve a supplemental agreement number one in the amount of $8,200 with the Southeastern Engineering Incorporation in connection with engineering services for sidewalks near Lithia Springs Elementary, Chestnut Log Middle School, and New Manchester High School project for additional analysis and design for the pedestrian crossing signal to be funded by the 2016 uh, SPLOS funds and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. County Administrator Martil. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Ballantin is on vacation, um, but essentially that's what this is. This is a uh, change order um, to add the pedestrian crossing signal um, design at a cost of uh, $8,200. Okay. Any questions from the board? And it is 2016 SPLOS funds. Okay. I believe that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, self also, uh, recess, the next uh, portion of our agenda, the recess, we've already had our recess, so that's occurred. And next, uh, we will go into our presentations. Uh, uh, we have a continuation of presentations, and uh, the first presentation is the Fox Hall presentation by Development Authority, Chris Pumphrey. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's the first time I've had the opportunity to say good afternoon for you all. <laughs> um, give me one second. So uh, thank you uh, for, for having us uh, here uh, this afternoon uh, before you all. Uh, and I uh, understand you've, you've all had a very packed agenda for today. <laughs> And so we're going to go through some information that you all have, have been briefed upon, um, and we'll just talk through where we are, why we're here, uh, and, and then be able to answer uh, any questions uh, from you all. So um, a little bit of, uh, I guess, some background. If we'll, can I control this from here? Yes. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So um, as you all know, um, we've uh, been working uh, for a number of years uh, on, on, work, on developing the Weston Hotel and Conference Center uh, down off of Caps Ferry Road. And um, over the last, back in 2016, we approved the intergovernmental agreement. And then since then, the intent there was to be able to go forth uh, and develop the Hotel and Conference Center, attract new investment into the area, and have a wonderful gym here in our community. So we also came before you last year, um, you know, about this time or a little bit before that, uh, I guess prior to Commissioner Carthen, you know, being on board. Um, and we talked and we kind of reintroduced and introduced the, the new team uh, here for the project. Um, and so since then, what we have been working towards is really, you know, the why of why the things were approved a couple years ago. And one of the things that we really wanted to hone in on was the impact that this project would have on the area. 
And so we're, when we talk about infrastructure, we look at this from a regional infrastructure standpoint. And so that's the title of the presentation, Regional Infrastructure and Conference Center Bonds. So when we talk about regional infrastructure, we're talking about the infrastructure that supports not just this project and how this project has an impact and how this project has an impact on the region. And we looked, we, we looked at a number of development opportunities in the area, some being directly across the street, some being north of the property, uh, some being up near Highway 5 and 166. And so those are the things that we actually presented back in 2016 when we talked about retail opportunities, office development, and what have you to, to come as a result of this project. And, and so the project now, what it is, is a 255-room Westin Hotel, um, a 50,000 square foot conference center, 200 rooms in the villas and cottages, this project itself generating roughly 260 jobs at an average salary of 35,000. Going back in time a little bit, um, back in 2012, we discussed you know, a 350 room Westin Hotel, a 75,000 square foot conference center. We started in, in discussions with the Board of Commissioners. And one of the things that we were looking at was the guaranteeing of all the bonds. And it was very much you know, a, a point of this is not something that's going to work for our community. And so we really started kind of looking at it and figuring out where, where do we need to go, how do we need to make changes. And so we, we made some changes and it impacted you know, the, the number of rooms and the size and what have you. And so we came back um, in 2014 and we had a 200 room Weston, 50,000 square foot conference center. We were looking at non-guaranteed bonds uh, for the conference center and infrastructure. We actually adopted a resolution from the Board of Commissioners basically saying we support the project and really saying you know, we're, this would be kind of our opportunity to go out and say to the marketplace, we're interested. We're not committed, but we're interested. Um, and so we adopted that resolution. Uh, the development authority, what we did is we hired a firm called PKF, um, which is one of the major hospitality feasibility firms. Um, the Foxhall team um, hired HVS, which is another one of the major hospitality feasibility firms. And we really wanted an expert on our side to be able to say, hey, do these numbers that are being presented to us make sense? Um, we're not, none of us are hotel experts, and so we're not, we're not claiming that we are. So we hired someone to kind of speak on our behalf to really take a look at the project. So we, we worked through that. We hired PKF and Urbanus. Urbanus was a firm that really could understand public-private partnerships and the things that you can do within those scopes. And so we worked very closely with them. And this kind of led us to, we, we also went into a town hall that we hosted down at Fox Hall. We invited the public out and, and were able to talk about the project. Um, and then the Board of Commissioners hired a financial advisor at that time as well. So all these things kind of happened kind of starting in 2014, but probably was 2014, 2015 kind of time frame. We ultimately came to an intergovernmental agreement, um, and that's where we were also introduced to EB-5 financing as a means of financing the project back in 2015, 2016 time frame. So that led us to what the current what the current agreement is today. It's an intergovernmental agreement between the Douglas County Board of Commissioners and the Douglas County Development Authority. And in that agreement, the Board of Commissioners, the Board of Commissioners have uh, agreed that the pilot payments and hotel motel taxes generated on a 100 acre parcel within the 1100 acres of what we call the Fox Hall Resort. Within that 100 acres, all the pilot payments and hotel motel taxes generated there would go to fund the debt service, and that's non-guaranteed debt service. Um, and that was uh, uh, an amount of $40 million that would be split between the conference center um, and the infrastructure. Also with that, we were looking at the private sector funding coming from the form of EB-5 financing. And it would kind of take care of all of the private debt um, and equity piece to then get the hotel and everything built. One of the things that we also talked about there, and, and I, I apologize, um, the printout that I handed you is not what I'm giving you right now. Um, so it's, uh, I thought we, we had them on your machines, we don't. So this is the presentation that's gonna happen right after me. That's the printout that's in front of you. But one of the things that we talked about with this project as I outlined, there was you know, the pilot payments and hotel motel tax was gonna fund it. And the thing was is that there's no basically benefit from the project. And this is one of the things that we wanted to point out. 
that if all things remained the same, nothing, was, nothing changed, assuming no appreciation and valuations, that over a 30-year period, the property would generate $3.4 million in property taxes over 30 years. We also assumed that if we did nothing um, and you didn't have a SPLOST, the project would generate $460,000 over a 30-year period. We also then said if you did have a SPLOST, um, it would generate $1.1 million in sales taxes over a 30-year period. This is if, not, if all things remain the same, no project was approved, these, this would be the benefit to Douglas County as the property stood at this point in time. So then we said, with this current plan, with us taking the, the 100 acres, you know, and taking that off the digest in per se, was that it would generate over 30 years, $3.1 million. That's over 30 years if you do the project just looking at property taxes from, uh, from, from the 1,100 from the, from the 1, acre piece, $3.1 million. So a difference, of, let's say $300,000 without doing the project and then with doing the project. By doing the project and excluding um, a SPLOST, it would generate $21.4 million to Douglas County and that's in sales taxes. So that's by doing the project with projected sales taxes from the development, it would generate 21.4 million over a 30 year period. Then, this, assuming if we've, thankfully we have, we're successful in, in SPLOS um, over the years, it would generate 52.6 million <coughs> per se of sales taxes uh, over the 30 year period if doing the project based on the projections laid out in the study. So re recall, we hired a firm to analyze the study, um, and the, the study basically uh, would generate, uh, said it would generate these types of revenues. I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, we'll come back to that in the second part. But when we look at what we do, and why we do what we do, everything that we do in the community is looking at economic sustainability. We're looking at generating revenue, obviously, for the local governments, being able to invest in quality of life, and that quality of life attracts an educated and skilled workforce, which attracts new job opportunities, which you know increases home values and distribution, increasing household income, increasing economic vitality, which then spurs revenue in, into the local governments. And that, that's in essence why we do economic development. And we look for those opportunities of how do we inject you know, these opportunities where we can to continue this cycle going so that it is sustainable in our community. And thus, that goes back to why we talked about why we were so high on this project at the beginning, because we knew that it would be a generator. It would generate and help funnel this, this cycle of sustainability in our community. A little bit of history. So back in the mid-80s, um, this may be post the creation of the Water and Sewer Authority, there was an investment of roughly $25 million into sewer infrastructure. And this sewer infrastructure went along the south, the southern part of the county along the Chattahoochee River, and you have the creation of the, Gil correct me, but it's the Sweetwater Sewer Plant, I probably got it wrong, but it's the plant right there along the river near Sweetwater Creek State Park. And that sewer infrastructure basically laid the foundation and the, the future economic vitality for that whole Thornton Road Riverside Parkway corridor. From that investment, if we just take that area south of I-20 and pretty much the area that benefits from the, the, the sewer, um, you've got a fair market value of $554 million of property in that area that wouldn't exist without that sewer infrastructure. There's roughly 92 companies in that area representing 3,000 jobs in that area, 1,000 homes in that area. And over the last five years, we've been able to um, announce of over $4 billion of capital investment in that area. So you think about what the investment in infrastructure does for a community. It's that investment that spurs that cycle of economic sustainability in the area. And at one point, um, you know, we had over 25% of the region's industrial development happened in this area of Douglas County, the entire metro Atlanta region. 25% of its industrial development happened in that area. And that's thanks to the, the investment in infrastructure, you know, over three decades ago. 
So as we look at what the impact of this project has meant to the community, meant to that area, once this intergovernmental agreement was approved, it allowed us to go out and talk to the state project managers, to talk to site selection consultants and say, here's what's happening in this area. We are the tail end of the Georgia Aerotropolis corridor, but really we're the, we are the, the forefathers of the Georgia Aerotropolis corridor. We really started this whole thing, looking at how we can benefit from the asset that there is in the world's busiest airport. And by being able to just tell that vision and say that we're gonna have a Weston Hotel and Conference Center come, and it's gonna bring the infrastructure to support these different uh, pieces of property for your area, for your, for your company, we, we really became uh, a shining star in the region. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history this, that sometimes you know, we can talk about the things that we do in economic development and sometimes we can't. So these are some of the things we can talk about because they've been kind of made public. We were the finalist site for Georgia for Project 4. And Project 4 was a project that we worked on shortly after the approval of the Intergovernmental Agreement. And Project 4 was the training center for KPMG. And KPMG is a, a global um, consulting and financial consulting firm. They were going to locate their, train, their corporate training facility um, on a new site. We were the finalist site for Georgia. So out of all the, the properties that they went through, they narrowed down to us. But we lost that project to Orlando, to an area just outside of the Orlando International Airport. Project Croissant. Um, I can't say we were the finalists in Georgia, but we were one of two on that one. And we lost that one to the Dallas area. We can't say the name for that one because it might come back around in another form sometime soon. Project Verde, the finalist site for Georgia for that project. It has been put on hold, another corporate training center. Um, project Condor. This one I can say because it's located and announced. We were the finalist site for the PGA North American headquarters. They looked at, our, at, at this location and we're gonna locate their headquarters here and we lost that because we didn't have the hotel and conference center ready to go. Um, Project Evergreen, another one. It hasn't announced yet so we can't say who it is. Project Modus, another project. You see there 700 jobs, $100 million capital expenditure, $131,000 average salary a project that is there but on hold at this point in time. And then we have two more projects that are active today that we hope does not add to our list of lost projects, that we hope becomes opportunities that we can locate here in the community. But we can only locate those, those things here if we're able to come with the development of the hotel conference center and infrastructure. You think about impact that those projects might have had uh, on our community. The average salary over all industries in Douglas County is $38,000. The average salary of, the, of those projects that I just mentioned is $75,000. So almost double the average salary in our community. And when you start doing those things, those go back to that cycle that I mentioned, increased home values, household income, driving in more revenue into the community. And those are the reasons we do what we do. But as I mentioned, we lost all those because we weren't, we weren't able to deliver on the hotel and conference center. So what's changed um, over the last year? We, as I mentioned, we came before you and, and introduced you to the team, and they put in a lot of work. And they're going to talk about that work in, in a few minutes. Um, but some of the things that have changed, um, the, the cost of the conference center has been reduced. Um, the, the size of the Westin has been increased um, since 2016. The number of rooms in the villas has decreased. Um, the infrastructure bonds, we're looking at 13.8, now are 15. Um, total bond amount you know, has decreased, but you know, if, if things could work out, we'd love to be able to leverage the full amount of the 40 million. But one of the key components to this as well is before we, we had the WSA as kind of supporting the project and laying out their, their support from a standpoint of upsizing, but now the WSA has taken more of a, a more active role uh, in the project. And so um, paying for the upsizing, which was already kind of there before, of roughly $500,000, but also investing an additional million dollars into the project as well to get the full, the full extent of the sewer that's necessary to support this project and the backbone for the region. The WSA is also contributing an additional $1 million to the project. So they would take the 2.7 million that comes from the infrastructure bond and then add a million to it and a, actually a million and a half to that total number for sewer infrastructure. 
So what's being asked now is that there, in order to sell the infrastructure bonds, that there is a, uh, that an obligation of the county to fund any shortfalls um, as a res uh, for the infrastructure bonds. There's no request for any uh, backing of the conference center bonds, and then also um, asking for the IGA to be amended to reflect a 99-year lease for the conference center. And so that's kind of an overview of, of where we are. I'm going to turn it over to the owners of the project and allow them uh, to then kind of tell you more about them, tell you about their why and their how, um, and then we'll be here to answer any questions. Does that sound good? Yes, sounds great. Thank you so much, um, Director, Executive Director Pumphrey. So you have someone here to come speak. Yes, okay. so I'm going to bring Mr. Harrison Merrill up and Mr. Nathan Hedges yep. and oh. Mr. Jim Stormont. Okay. And I think they're going to get the slides up. All right. Hello, Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Harrison, for being here, and you, Mr. Stormont. And who else is that we have a few more? We have Nathan Hedges. Yeah, Nathan. And I'll Hedges. introduce Nathan. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the opportunity for the Weston team to present to you today. Chris covered most of the things, and I just want to add that in 2016, when you approved the Intergovernmental Agreement, we started immediately looking for a partner who could build the Weston and it had a lot of experience in vertical building. In 2017, we selected Alan Mars Company and you'll hear more about them in just a moment. And we're very proud that they took over as managing general partner for the Weston and that they are taking it forward and we're a participant with them. And with that, I'm going to introduce Nathan Hedges who is the president of the Georgia Division of Alan Mars Company, and he'll give you some background on the Alan Mars Company. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, my name is Nathan Hedges. I represent the Alan Mars Company. I want to thank the council, the commission, for taking the time to listen to us today. Uh, as Harrison alluded, he, he approached us in 2017, uh, shortly after y'all had approved the inter intergovernmental agreement, uh, to partner with him to become the managing member of the partnership for the Weston Fox Hall Hotel Conference Center and Spa. Um, the Alan Moore's company, very briefly, is a 60-year-old company. Uh, we are based in Coral Gables, Florida. Um, however, we have strong ties to Georgia. Uh, we've developed uh, 83 projects in our 60-year history of varying degrees and sizes. Um, the 20 of those were developed right here in Atlanta and Georgia. Um, when we develop projects, we really are looking for opportunities where um, all of the stakeholders have an opportunity to win. And we saw that opportunity uh, as, as Harrison presented it to us in the Weston Fox Hall Conference Center Hotel and Spa. And, um, but we also realized that to execute a project like that, you have to assemble the very best team. Uh, and that's what we have been able to do successfully in 60 years, never having been late on a debt service payment on any projects, nor ever having turned a single project ever back to the bank through any of the many crises that you can think of over 60 years. So we brought in Starmont Hospitality Group, who we had a relationship with and whose expertise in this area is unquestioned. Uh, Jim Stormont and his partners have been developing hotels for 35 years. Uh, they are without question the largest and most successful developer of uh, publicly, privately funded hotel conference centers in the Southeast. Um, Jim Stormont is the head of them and I would really like to give Jim the opportunity to talk to you about exactly what we're doing here because he's the expert. Thank you so much, Thank Nathan you. and Harrison, and Madam Chair and Commissioners. And uh, I've enjoyed having some uh, productive meetings with all of you in the recent weeks. And we're here today to sort of talk through the project formally and publicly and show you what's going on and, and where we are. And I want to take this opportunity. I know you've had a long day already, but I don't want to skimp on the opportunity to, to flush this out because 
We're talking about $170 million being invested in Douglas County, and we have a huge team with us here today to support if we have Q&A or whatever else. But uh, I want to, so I want to go through all of that. But first I want to say, you know, in 1993, I stood on some hay bales, and we broke the ground in Towns County, Georgia, for what is now Brass Tom Valley Resort. And our ex-governor, Zell Miller, was there that day, and he spoke. And he, I loved what he said, and it applies here, because he said, you know, to have a successful project, you need a great piece of geography. And he says, you have a, we have a great piece of geography here. And I thought that was the funniest way to phrase it, but what we have right here is a great piece of geography along the Chattahoochee River in this serene, beautiful equestrian center. Harrison Merrill had this vision. And he's now teamed up with, with the Moore, Alan Moore's company about a, the vision. And it is a large vision. And this conference center is a critical component to it. And, you know, I, I, can, I can't guarantee the ultimate success of the project or what's going to happen 10 years, 20 years down the road from now. But I can guarantee a couple things. And I, I'm personally, I guarantee a couple things. First one I can guarantee is journey of 1,000 miles starts with a single step. And if we don't get this project going, you will have 0.0% chance of, a, of obtaining all those economic benefits that Chris Pumphrey and HVS has talked about, and PKF and Horwath Hospitality and HEI Hotels. All of those goodies that come will not happen. And there's been discussion, and I was here earlier when there was public vote, public discussion, and you know some people may be misinformed on some facts, but uh, without this public-private par partnership, this project will not happen. So this isn't like, it's going to happen and oh, maybe we should contribute to it. it. It's not going to happen. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been here for the last 15 months since they brought me on board. But a year ago when we were here, I made a presentation about our company and Alan Morris was here and made a presentation about the Alan Morris company and we kicked off this new phase of, of efforts. And uh, <clears throat> what we've accomplished in the last year is really, uh, is really phenomenal. And I want to go through that with you. So first, what we're going to talk about today is that we've got the right team to execute. We have the positive economic impact for Douglas County. We're going to give you an overview of the proposed project with the conference center, the Western, and the infrastructure and the villas. We're going to talk about how we've been able to structure this to mitigate risks to the county. And uh, the, we will refresh again your memory on the IGA changes that, that uh, Chris discussed. And then we want to just talk about how this fits in with maybe some regional other public support for hotels and conference centers regionally in the state of Georgia and throughout the country. So this page, uh, just summarize again the Alan Morris Company, the Merrill Tr Trust Group. Since they mentioned it directly, I don't have to speak to that. But this page is important. We, uh, we've been retained as the development manager. And the second thing I'm going to guarantee you today, a personal guarantee from James M. Stormont, Jr., you cannot get a better team to execute this project than we've got right here. This is, this is f state first class in every way, shape, and form. And I'm just talk briefly about each one of them. Cooper Carey and Bob Neal was here until just recently. He had to leave. I think he left. But uh, he, uh, I've been working with Bob Neal since 1989. And they've, developed, they've designed probably 75% of all the hotels I've been involved in. And it's, uh, architects not just about drawing a pretty picture. It's about planning and floor plans and profitability and infrastructure. You know, how does the facility come together? We have a saying that profitability is designed in to a hotel. If you don't design it right up front, you're not going to be pr profitable in the long run, and that is a critical component. Gensler, top, one of the largest uh, architecture and design firms in the world, they their interior design group, you'll see some of their work here is just producing some beautiful renderings and beautiful interior finishes. And again, it's not a decorator. This is designing spaces and volumes and finishes and, and textures and, <clears throat> and uh, long-term specifications that hold up over long-term in the hotel business. HRC has been, they probably know this site better than anyone in this entire room. They, uh, Howard and, and his team 
have been on site and working with the county and working with the uh, Harrison Merrill and the civil and the landscape and the engineering and understanding what it's all about. In Choate Construction, we have Britain with us here today, a company that was founded over 30 years ago in Georgia, in Atlanta. I see Miller Choate at Rotary most Mondays, where I would be just coming back from right now if I wasn't here. But uh, we meet on Mondays, and I see Millard, and we've talked about how they've turned their company into an employee-owned company. So Britain and all the executives, they own, it's an employee-owned firm that runs over a billion dollars a year in construction. They know what they're doing. They've developed first-class luxury and high-end hotels that have uh, gained phenomenal reputation in the southeast. The brand, we have Eric Fry with us here today from Marriott International. I have uh, more, uh, I'd say 90% of my projects have had some affiliation with Marriott. And it's because my uncle was started with Marriott in 1962 when there were three Marriott's in the world versus about 10,000 hotels of Marriott in the world now. And he started our company and I joined him 32 years ago. We've developed, I, I can call up Bill Marriott, Arnie Sorensen, Dave Grissom, Dave Marriott, you name it, we know the players at Marriott. And uh, we know what they're looking for, we know what they like, we know what they don't like. It's not always easy, but we, uh, we have a strong working relationship with them. And the Weston brand is part of Marriott International. That's one of the 35 brands. Weston is known for strong corporate and meeting planner recognition. If you talk to meeting planners throughout the state of Georgia and say, what does Weston mean to you? It has an excellent reputation for you know, properly designed and function spaces and and being excellent places for getting work done. So whether it's a business conference, an association meeting, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, you name it, uh, Weston is a, is a great, strong brand. And the operator we've selected is HEI Hotels and Resorts. They are the operator that all of you, I'm sorry, Commissioner Mitchell, you weren't able to join us, but we, the rest of you saw the, ho the Alpharetta Conference Center and the hotel at Avalon. Uh, and, and you heard from the ex-mayor of Alpharetta. The, uh, that property is operated by HEI Hotels and Resorts. Shaw is here with us today, if we have any questions from HEI, but Shaw is the general manager of the Whitley Hotel that used to be the Ritz-Carlton in Buckhead, if you know that hotel. Uh, but they, do, they operate more Western hotels than any other company in the country. And they operate about 75 total hotels, but full service conference centers and upper upscale properties is their, uh, I'm a golfer, so I get to say it, they're middle of the fairway. You know, there's other operators that operate courtyards and Hampton Inns and Motel 6, you name it. But when it comes to upper upscale properties, that what we're talking about here, uh, there's, HEI is one of the very top firms in the country, and uh, they do an excellent job. And then, uh, so that's, you know, how are we going to get a build? What's the brand? What's the operator? And then we brought on uh, Piper Jaffrey and UBS. Not one, but two outstanding investment bankers because what Chris described, that we bifurcated the bonds from infrastructure to the conference center for a number of reasons we can discuss. But UBS is uh, one of the largest municipal underwriters in the country. They are going to be run, uh, doing the uh, infrastructure bonds. And Piper Jaffrey uh, is here, Brad Langner's here, and, and they have uh, without a doubt, issued more public bond financing for hotels and conference centers, specifically conference centers and public investments in hotels throughout the country by a long shot. So they have experience, whereas I can talk about my experience with 12 public-private partnerships directly involved putting the deals together. They have, I should have written down the number, but uh, probably three or four times that amount that they've done in public financing. So this team is here. I want you to take the time to ask questions. If you have any, I'll try and answer. But if not, if somebody here doesn't know the answer, there isn't one. So, um, <laughs> so again, just to talk about the benefits to Douglas County, uh, this we, we believe, and every time I've, I said 12 projects, but and I'll talk about some of them here in Georgia, but we use the term a rising tide because it truly generates the a rising tide for the economy and and we see it through sales taxes property taxes economic development office development warehouse jobs and frankly just visibility in the market you know we're going to be spending millions of dollars marketing this and bringing people to the community so there's 
to, uh, large amounts of public benefits and revenues during construction. That's all the contractors. I, like I mentioned, and we can show you here momentarily, but truly between the villas, the hotel, the conference center, the spa, and the infrastructure, we're talking about $170 million of, of development, of which uh, a number of it's already been spent uh, by the Merrills. Then, of course, once you open, you have the ongoing public benefits and the revenues, which include, uh, yes, we're talking about diverting some of the property taxes and occupancy taxes for the first 30 years towards paying for the facility. But in addition to that, there's retail sales, there's the 2% the two SPLOST and local option sales tax that comes directly to Douglas County, which will probably be in the neighborhood, I just looked at year three, uh, probably $600,000 a year to Douglas County just on those two SPLOST numbers, because we're look, talking about $30 million in, in hotel and conference center revenues. So, uh, and then of course there's the, the jobs and the salaries and you pay the, you know, the restaurant manager who goes out and buys gasoline and goes to dinner and pays for the, you know, whatever. It, it, there's the economic multiplier where the dollars uh, funnel through the economy. So typically, and as you've seen on some of these reports that you got a bleakly advisor report and other reports over the years that show how that economic development happens. But uh, there's a multiple on the direct expenditures and the direct wages that then flow through the economy. Then uh, increased visitation to Douglas County is, uh, there's clearly nothing like this in Douglas County, so that I think is a given economic multiplier effect. And then I did want to mention this, and I guess I, I just did, but these these revenues that we're talking about for taxes and occupancy taxes are incremental to what exists right now. So there's no scenario where those are going to come if this project doesn't move forward. It's not like they're going to happen. I, I can just tell you I've been in this for 32 years. No one's going to build this resort if it ain't for the, this $40 million of support. <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to say another thing. Some of the public commentary, uh, and I've heard this time and time again, and it makes me smile, but people say, well, if it's so good, why didn't private enterprise just do it? Well, it, it, it's because you have to look. I go back to 1991. We opened the 404-room Norfolk Waterside Marriott, and we, Bill Marriott referred it to us personally. He says, I can't figure out this, this is an old Navy town with, with hookers and drugs and I don't want to do a hotel there. And he said, do you guys want to look at it? My, this is my uncle, I was the CFO at the time. So we said, we looked at the numbers and the dollar amount available for return to investors was just not sufficient to pay for all the costs. And so we said, you know, if you look at this project and all these taxes that are going to spin off and the jobs and the retail and everything else, and if we can find a way to encapsulate all those benefits and have the beneficiaries help pay for the costs from those benefits, it can work for everyone. And we rolled up our sleeves and we sat down with the economic development group and we found a way to, uh, and that ended up there, the city paid for the conference center and the parking garage and we leased it for 99 years. And that started my history of <laughs> these 12 public-private partnerships. And almost every community that I've worked in, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's the but for kind of scenario. This, this will not happen but for the, us all getting together and cooperating and find a way. How do you pay for the dollars? Because investors, they're looking for one dollar. They don't care about Douglas County. They don't care about jobs. They don't care about retail sales. They care about what's the return on investment. <laughs> And we have to find a way to give them a return on investment. And the only way to do that is to use all these taxes that are spinning off of this kind of project. I've heard that conference centers are the purest form of economic development because there's no drain on schools and there's, no, there's not crime. There's not, it, it's an, it, it brings in good stuff without bringing in bad stuff, typically. So uh, in any case, the progress to date, just to touch on it, we talked about the <coughs> 255 from West End in the Conference Center, over 14 million to date on the 74 villas that are open and operating these beautiful villas and swimming pool. If you go out there and you like to go fishing or, or uh, shooting sporting clays at the Beretta World Class facility, it's it's a, it's an ex excellent experience. And the Merrills have spent over 58 million dollars today. That's in place, and it's set up for the future. 
We've now, since I've been involved, I can tell you because the funding, we're handling the, the funding and the financing, but it's been over three and a half million dollars of cash. This isn't like pretend money or, oh, I'm contributing my time or my land. I mean, they have spent three and a half million dollars of cash investment for this team. That's what, that's what money is on these projects. You're paying people to do stuff. And that's why it creates all these jobs and the, and the economic impact. So the next steps is that this, we are now to a point, we've completed design, construction drawings, we've gotten back and forth the Choate Construction Company to get the dollars cost where we need it. It's again, just as an education, this isn't like you design a bridge and go out and get bids and say, what does it cost? This is an iterative project process to, to make sure that you're having the most impactful quality and facilities within the budget given. So we now are there, we're ready to break ground. And what does it take to break ground? Money, it always does. So, uh, you know, we have, yes, the Morrises, yes, the Merrills are very wealthy organizations. They have money, but no one builds this. They're not gonna come up with $170 million of their own money. That, that's not how these work. They, they're a sponsor. They put in a lot of money, but then they raise capital and we go out to SunTrust or Wells Fargo or whatever banker might be coming up with private capital. To raise those monies, no one will, and Commissioner, you're a former banker. You, you, know, you know, no one's gonna give us a commitment on capital with, until they know what the deal is. So we're trying to pin down the, the details of this intergovernmental agreement which will then drive the uh, master development agreement between the Merrills and Morris's and the development authority. And that then drives the ability to close on the private capital. And so everything would close at one time. The bonds, the <coughs> private debt, all the land transactions and the contributions into the, into the uh, development authority. So we think, uh, we've estimated, because I don't want to, we're not trying to fool anyone, we, we think it's probably 120 days. Once we have a new, a deal signed, ready to go, and our investors bank, investment bankers say yes, we've got our broker dealers all around the country, we know what the interest rate markets are, we know what's sellable, we think this works, let's go. It'll probably be roughly 120 days to get close. So I want you to look at some of this as well. You saw the Alpharetta Conference Center, and I would argue, and my partner John's more on the design side of things than I am, and Leslie, who was here earlier, but this is a beautiful building. It's gonna be a nice facility, the nicest thing in the region. We will have the best meeting space, we'll have a spa. As you come into the facility, as you're looking photo left, that's the spa, photo right is the conference center. Here again, you can see on the photo left here is the conference center main ballroom area spilling out to a beautiful lawn where we have a lot of indoor outdoor capabilities as you probably know, weddings and corporate meetings. I mean, people love to be outside and over that setting, looking down over the Chattahoochee River uh, is spectacular. You know, the first time I'm sort of a high energy kind of guy. I drove out there, we drove out, uh, not I-20, what's the boulevard down the South Fulton, South Fulton Parkway. I'm telling you, 25 minutes, and I got there and I went, <sighs> man, felt so good. It's a beautiful spot. And so anyhow, the center here is the manor house. On the far right of the photo is, uh, is the pool, and uh, we have two pools, a beautiful resort pool. This isn't a little cheesy hotel pool. This is a upscale multi-million dollar pool facility which will create a lot of uh, excitement and energy and staycations and local visitation in addition to groups. Behind that manor house, you can't see in this photo rendering, is the spa. And behind that main conference center is all the rest of the conference facilities uh, there with the low, smaller meeting rooms and the breakout rooms and the, and the kitchens and the storage. Here is the uh, uh, rendering of the ballroom. And again, if you're a uh, meeting planner and you see this and the beautiful rendering, uh, the, the, the chandeliers and the millwork, and uh, you know, this is not a, I don't wanna use the word cheesy, but I guess I already used it once, I might as well use it again. This is, this is a beautiful, well-designed, high-quality ballroom. And uh, the meeting planners will, will love it. 
the bar in the main lobby, again, very handsome, very uh, Weston theme, Weston infused. Uh, I will say there's still uh, some comments we have from Marion International. They, they are very precise about what they want a Weston land to be. And so we come up with all the creativity and, and then we go back and forth with Marriott to make sure we are meeting their expectations because they have worldwide marketing and sales organizations and what was it, 500 salespeople in the southeast or something? Corporate sales, just in just for corporate meeting sales, 500 professionals, selling groups, selling, selling, selling. They know what the customers want, so we're getting their feedback to make sure we're delivering what the customers want. And then, of course, the Weston, the bedroom. You know, if you've not slept on a Weston heavenly bed, you really ought to do so. <laughs> they are very comfortable beds. There's the Weston. Weston has a number of branded wellness-related themes like the Weston Heavenly Bath, the Weston Spa, the Weston Bed. You know, we pick and choose components to bring all of that into play at Fox Hall, but uh, we have a beautiful uh, setup uh, of some kings and some double kings that can uh, uh, cater to whatever groups or families or meeting planners need. The, this, the Fox Hall Villas, uh, just as a, to re-summarize this, this overview, this is in place right now, 74 villas. These are photographs, these are not renderings. And uh, again, you ought to go kick the tires and see what's out there, the swimming pool. They're breaking ground now on an additional 12 rooms and, and, a, and the clubhouse, which will be there by the pool facility. And all of this really creates an, a, a full service resort, which has not just the Westin, but you've got the Stables building, which is a great venue, and you've got the, uh, the Lookout building, and you've got the Clubhouse building, and you've got the restaurant, you've got the Westin uh, restaurant and bar. So it really kicks off the entire uh, future of the 1,100 acres. Here again is the uh, Fox Hall Villas overlooking that, the lake, which I understand. I talked to some random person, Harrison, and, and he was t I was mentioned Fox Hall, and he said, oh my God, I took my son there last year, and they were throwing, they were catching fish out of that lake. He changed his life. He, he was raving about it. Um, so the infrastructure, I, I, I won't spend too much time on this because Chris already talked about it, but I will say this, in my 32 years from Norfolk that I talked about all the way to the current, and uh, I have never, <coughs> seen the private enterprise pay for this kind of infrastructure. This is, we always put in our contracts that the electrical, water, sewer, roads have to be to five feet from our property line. And you know, we don't, we, it's hard enough to come up with the money to pay for the hotel, let alone the infrastructure to make the hotel a reality. So the infrastructure here is anticipated through these separate $15 million bond issuance, and UBS can talk further about that <clears throat> and how it works. but. The, the guarantee, well, I'll talk about the, the, the changes here in a moment. Here they are. So what is really being changed? There's, I, I, you know, there's lots of little red lines. This is a proposed red line agreement. We, our consultants took the intergovernmental agreement and said, how do we need this to change to get this acceptable to the lending community and the bond holders, the bond buyers? These are, you, you know, Somebody's coming up with this dollar. It's not you and it's not us. It's bond buyers that are coming up to say, we're going to buy these bonds because we like the interest rate and the risk profile. So the primary changes are as follows. That we've asked the county, we need a credit enhancement on the $15 million bonds. The, without the credit enhancement, the team does not believe they can sell those bonds. And, and, and even if they, you know, with the interest rate, limitations uh, without a guarantee on, uh, on infrastructure makes it not viable. We, you go to bondholders and say, we're going to pay for infrastructure for public assets, and the, the first thing they're going to say, what? The, that doesn't make sense. No one wants to pay for publicly owned infrastructure. So uh, that's why those bonds are being bifurcated from the total. The conference center that this is would be subject to a 99-year lease. This is different than the 2016 IGA. I, I, with all due respect to everyone involved in that negotiation back then, I wasn't involved. I don't see a way in the current IGA 
uh, structure with a qualified management agreement that you could finance this hotel. And what that means, what, it, that, what the IGA says right now, it says that you're going to pay for and own a conference center and you're going to, if there's losses, expenses, the roof caves in, you got to pay for that forever. You own it, you pay all the costs. We manage it for you. I don't think you want it. I don't think it works for us. And my personal opinion, I'm out of here if that doesn't change because it just, it won't get done. It's going to be a waste of everyone's time. You, the hotel owners and Marriott's sitting right over here. If he, they, Marriott would not approve a deal if we don't control the meeting space because that's what makes the Westin work. You got to have the hotel and the conference center all in one financial operation. So that's what that's all about. The, uh, we're going to modify the pilot structure on the Westin and Conference Center uh, to support the bonds so that we, what we came up with, frankly, our, our consultants came up with, I thought it was very creative. I've seen pilots in lots of different structures. From in Baltimore, we did one where we paid a $1 a year pilot payment for 25 years. That's that. And when then we used the incremental cash flow to get private debt. And I've seen a fixed schedule of pilot payments. At the, Rena at the Marriott Gateway. I've seen the, a variable schedule at the Renaissance Gateway in College Park. But what this is, is it says to the bondholders, we will pledge to pay those pilot payments to the extent they're necessary to pay debt service. If they're not necessary to pay debt service because all these other taxes are so numerous and the property is doing so well, then the, it, it, the dollars that would have gone will go to support the private debt. So this Again, this supports the public bonds and the private debt. And uh, that's, it's a great way to make it work for everyone. And one of my other comments I want to just throw in based here is if it doesn't work for the private capital and the county and the bondholders and Marriott and HEI and the invest the sponsors, it has to work for everyone or it's not going to work. I mean, it's got to be good for you. No one's trying to say, hey, it's good for the Merrills and it's bad for you. It, it has to be good for the county. It has to be good for the bondholders. And we're, that's what we've spent so much time trying to figure out how to make it work for everyone. So we think we have that uh, figured out, the uh, Rubik's Cube. So we've, we've, uh, we don't know how to sell the bonds and raise $40 million without these changes. That's the bottom line. I think. The, the IGA is already in place, the $40 million is committed, but if you can't get the project going, it, it doesn't do any good. We can't get all those good things to happen without a few tweaks to the agreement. And uh, the, the final bullet point on this page is to, to, to recognize that, again, we've made a proposal to the county. We, we think it makes sense. Your, your consultants and your attorneys and financial advisors, let's sit down and hear their comments and how to get this tweaked to make it work for everyone. Yet, I understand there may be a vote in two weeks, and that gives us two weeks to hear from everyone and say, well, hold it, we didn't know, this doesn't make sense, why, and let's, let's figure it out. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way, and I tr truly believe that. I've been, in every project, you know, you're, you're juggling constraints, legal constraints, political constraints, financial constraints. You, you gotta, you gotta overcome all these constraints, but if you put, roll up your sleeves and sit down and figure it out, we'll get it done. Uh, I want to leave with a few comments here before we do Q&A about just a few other things that I've been involved in. Uh, you've heard some of these, but the Alpharetta Development Authority, uh, in Alpharetta, for the Alpharetta Conference Center, they invested 24.9 million in that facility that you saw, with, and it was guaranteed by the city. We didn't sell the bonds, get involved in the bonds. They agreed to put up cash, 24.9 million, and they sold the bonds with their AAA credit guarantee. So that's different, but I just wanted to point it out. The, in College Park, the, uh, the Marriott in College Park uh, issued bonds it was a little different structure, but they issued bonds and gave us $28,350,000 towards the Marriott and another three and a quarter million for the Spring Hill Suites. And it was done through a slightly different structure, design development and occupancy agreement, but uh, it, it, it worked. And we paid for the rest of the, the Marriott hotel facilities and they paid for the, that $28 million three. And then at the Renaissance, it's also in College Park, they did not put up any cash up front, 
but they made a pilot agreement that had extremely low pilot payments, another kind of conditional thing that said, well, if it goes well, we'll pay more pilot, and that would go to the, to the city to, to pay them back. Uh, Gwinnett County, I can tell you, because I've met with them a number of times over the last 10 years, they're desperate to get a hotel because they build a convention center without a hotel. It, it doesn't do you any good to build one without the other. Cobb County is also looking at a, a new hotel at the Cobb Galleria. You, you've probably seen the Renaissance Waverly, which is a great hotel, but it's busy in its own regard, and the, the gallery wants a hotel to support the conference center. So the point being, uh, on all of those, the, the counties and the cities are putting dollars in to, for the economic development impact. In addition to the ones that are listed here uh, on that page, oh, I guess I missed one, the Georgia World Congress Center. You may have read they approved $400 million of state geo bonds backed to the Georgia World Congress Center Authority down there to buy Mercedes-Benz Stadium to do a big old thousand-room Hilton Hotel. And uh, that's another example of, of the state recognizing the benefits to having more hotels uh, in the economy. And then uh, Brasstown Valley Resort is not on here, but that one we opened in the spring of, 2000, of 1995, and that was also state uh, GO. So it wasn't a county or a city, but it was state money going in to make that happen. So uh, here's the number I was looking for before, but Piper Jaffrey's arranged financing for over 25,000 hotel rooms. So they, they have an expertise and a niche in, in understanding the bondholders' needs and, and what rates are out there in the market and what risk profiles the, the investors would accept. And they're, they're, the projects they've worked on, they show had anywhere from 25 to 50% of the total project costs had public investment in one form or another. I would say the ones I've worked on uh, have anywhere from zero to 67%. The zero, is, but we also got a pilot agreement, so the zero was, was a little different, but 67% in Portsmouth, Virginia, and in Suffolk, Virginia, both. The, we'd done the Norfolk Marriott, the economic development director retired and went over to, to Portsmouth, Virginia, and took on the job as city manager. He called us up and said, please come to Portsmouth and do this again. We need a great hotel. We'll put public-private. We worked with them for a couple of years. They, and I'm not suggesting you do this, but I'm just telling you because it still shocks me, they mortgaged, they put a mortgage on City Hall to come up with the dollars to, they wanted this conference center. So they paid for the conference center and the parking deck. We paid for the hotel, and they, their total of the, portion of the total was about 67%. So, it, you know, again, where there's a will, there's a way. So in conclusion, um, you know, we, we, we need an amended IGA to make this uh, get to the next step so we can sell the bonds and get this thing closed. The, uh, we've, we've found a structure we think mitigates the risk to the county as much as possible. Yes, there's a contingent credit enhancement, you know, guarantee on 15 million, but the dollars are already coming in for part of that debt service. That's the occupancy taxes and the pilot payment taxes from the villas that already exist. And as the facility grows, you've got uh, all the coverage is projected to be there, plus the Merrills are, are guaranteeing $350,000 a year if there's any shortfalls, plus this wasn't even in the official thing, but I'll just say like those, you got 600,000 a year coming from those loss taxes uh, just out of nowhere. No one's even paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. And after all that, if it's short, the, the county could be called upon for shortfalls in the interim period. But um, so we, we've, uh, the economic impacts of the county are substantial. Everyone has looked at it. I mean, they are dramatic. This isn't just like, oh, we're going to get a couple jobs. We're talking about hundreds of jobs, thousands of jobs with a multiplier, millions of dollars of, of economic impact. And every other community that I've worked in that, where these have succeeded, the, the powers that be recognize the value of economic development and how it can drive growth. And, 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 and the whole market rises with a sort of a rising tides lifts all boats. And uh, we've, we've, we've seen that happen, not just most of them, every single time. I can't say, you could go to any one of the communities I've worked in and they will, they will swear by the fact that the, the benefits that brought to their community. So the time is right. 
uh, to get this thing moving. And the team is in place here. We, we've taken up a lot of people's time to come. Even if we don't have questions, I wanted you to see the folks from all these firms that are here working on this project over the last year and a half to, to make it ready to get to where we are today. So uh, thanks to the Merrills and the Morrises for, for being our, our lead, lead uh, dogs in this thing. We're all working hard to, to support them any way we can, and we're here to answer questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Stormont. Um, Board of Commissioners, do we have any questions? Vice Chairman Robinson, I know you had a comment. Yeah, I've got a comment, then I've got a, a few questions, and I'm going to yield to my colleagues who I'm sure are going to weigh in. Uh, that being said, just, just, this is just for the record. Um, the Finance Committee was approached by the Development Authority um, that there was some interest, and this is all in full disclosure, an interest to come back around what I want to call Plan C. Um, and um, they have a right to, like any citizen can come back. Um, anybody who wants to do business in Douglas County, they have a right to. There were some questions about why we're considering this, uh, because we should um, um, give um, consideration to anybody who believes they can help add value to our, our community. Um, so I want to make that statement. With that was a presentation formally, it was decided in um, Finance Committee to let them come forward to the full Board of Commissioners. But in that meeting, it was asked, well, what type of time frame are you looking for? They said, well, we want, we want to present on May 6th and have a decision on May 7th. I'm like, you must be out your mind. I mean, it would just, y'all know me. It's like, there's no way we can make that decision. Now, I'm, I'm saying that for the record, but it's important that 40% of this board is brand new. There's no way they could have made this decision in one day. There's no way. Right, so in, in within the structure of the Finance Committee, uh, it, we were prudent to go ahead and engage our, our municipal advisor, give him a standalone contract to take a look at this from risk. Now, I'm paralleling this. We delayed the legal because first things first, always follow the math. Does the money, does the math work? Start there. Everything else bends out of that. So it was important that we did this as I tell you what, you'll see us on the 6th, but uh, between now and then, you need to meet with each of the district commissioners and including the chair, which I believe um, uh, the reward side did. At the same time, we knew that our municipal advisor needed to meet with the same group of people, meaning the chair and the four district commissioners on the risk side. That was important. So it's not just a reward, it was the risk. Right? We must have a balanced decision-making process. And that was my commitment to, to, to my, my fellow peers, is that the process had to be above reproach. That's it. Everything else, they know they have to go to their corners, put their political overlay, et cetera. But the process had to be above reproach. That being said, um, we did take um, uh, a trip up to Avalon, did some benchmarking for some of those who have not already been through this process. We thought that was imprudent to find where we are. But at the same point in having this presentation on the 6th going into the 7th, we said, no, we're going to still give you two weeks for us as Board of Commissioners to process this. There's no way you could process the risk assessment that was officially delivered publicly today, this presentation today, in one day. Give yourselves two weeks to really process this. But make sure you understand what you're looking at. It's one thing to read something. It's another to comprehend. You can't play with this. This is, if you do this, you gotta be all in. There's no in between. I appreciate the sentiments that was brought out about my background as a banker, and I, I think that's important. Um, yes, I was a banker, $4 billion portfolio, strategic pricing person, as a senior VP over business banking, regional banking, treasury service, and commercial real estate for Wachovia Bank, for the merger with First Union. I know what I'm looking at. Um, I, I um, had a stint at um, Georgia State teaching decision scientists um, to sophomores. My entrepreneurship class was to juniors, critical thinking on entrepreneurship. I that came a workshop on how to pitch. My advisor said, you need to write a book on that, which I'm writing right now, like I've, I've, I've pitched. I've been on that side. Um, I've been to Washington, I've been to the Treasury Department, I've been, those are things that people really don't know. I tend to downplay it, been there before. So what I'm bringing to the Board of Commissioners right now at this moment, it's, it's the discipline of the process as Commissioner Mitchell would always say, follow the process. This is important. This is not um, a decision we can take lightly. It should be given consideration, but it, it can't, 
you can't be euphoric, it must be balanced. All right, so given that all this background, and, and, and my, my colleagues knew I was gonna, you know, obviously keep this thing clean um, as it relates to the process, let me move into now uh, Commissioner District 2. Put that hat on. All right, so and I'm gonna keep this real simple for me. Um, um, am I committed to economic development? Absolutely. Do I believe that District 2, which I represent, which is the eastern um, side, eastern wall of the county, which has 80% of the industrial base, almost 40% of the commercial base outside of the mall in District 4? Absolutely. I understand these things. I recognize that my um, being District 3 is primarily residential, recognizing District 1, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, which is primarily um, the city. District 4 has primarily, what, 40% of all land mass for our county in one commission district. No problem. A lot of woods, a lot of growth has to go out there. That's, it is what it is. So the question becomes is that at some point we're going to have to grow somewhere. We're going to have to make an investment. The question was, should we do it here? Uh, I, I, I get, I acknowledge your team. Your team is solid. Um, one of the things we teach our students is that the entrepreneurship, the entrepreneur can be odd man out, but look who they've surrounded themselves with. That's how you measure it. They hooked themselves up with just their friends and people they went to school with, who they trust, or they bring some solid people here. For that, I'm good. I'm moving on. Thank you guys for being here. I get, I know what I'm looking at as far as your resumes. But the question becomes simply, should we do this as a path forward to fulfilling the, 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 what I want to call the objective economic development? Should we? Not could we, but should we? I ask myself this simple question that says, okay, if I'm following the math, and I appreciate you saying that you can't guarantee this. I mean, I, I mean, I can't see you that far, but I hear everything. And I appreciate the comment that says, I can't guarantee this. That's important, right? That means that there's some risk with this. The other question that, that you answered that I want to just acknowledge beyond being your team, being that you can't guarantee this, is this whole notion of um, the intergovernmental agreement. And I got to come to that because this is what's important for me, just, just my vote. I put a provision in that IGA last time because when I saw, you know, plan A, there's no way I'm going to guarantee $150, $160 million in front of a SPLOS. I mean, come on. We wouldn't have a SPLOS today if we would have did that. There's no way that would have went forward. It didn't even come before us. We didn't even vote on it, right? I mean, if you guarantee 160, we would not have the SPLOS today. We'd want another 10 years without taking care of our roads and everything else. So obviously, you know, we, we, we made a good financial decision to say, don't even bring that to us. All right, second round, 40 million, eh, were we really committed to a conference center? Was that, on a prior, was that on a priority list of the prior administration? Well, I don't know. I'm not gonna advocate for that. I was in the minority position at that particular time. All right, can't take that up. But from that position, I thought what was important is that when I looked at this, I said, oh my God, and this is a for record, I said, this is rich. <laughs> oh my goodness, this? This is brilliant, but it seemed to be one-sided. And I, I, and I had to sort of weigh in and say, okay, but I, I hear what you're saying we're gonna get. I know how to discount co um, cash flows. It's like, yeah, you're telling me I'm gonna get 3.4 million over, you know, I got 40 million in, 3.4 million over 30 years back. Like, okay, I just do net, I'm, come on guys. It's like, well, I mean, I'm a certified credit analyst. And I'm sitting here like, I'm trying to tell them like, that's a little rich guys, but okay. Right, I'm keeping, I'm keeping this real tight, okay. Then I said, okay, that being said, can the school board at least get something? This was important. This was a non-negotiable condition. This is gonna bring us back to where we are right now. It's non-negotiable. I get bondholders, I get stakeholders, I get everybody. But you have to understand that this is a partnership, right? It's a partnership. And so we're also bringing to what's valuable to our owners. Right? And one of the things I put in place was that, okay, if this never came to pass, at least make sure the school board got the minimum of vacant land. That was important. Like, okay, y'all may not pull this off, but at least get a school board something. Right? That was important. I, mean, I know sometimes the commission takes on risk. We are catalysts. I get that. I don't run from being a leader from that perspective. But what was important is not to marginalize or hurt my school board. Right? You now asked us to credit and enhance this. So here's uh, Michelle, Jennifer's not here, here's my first one, right? No, school board needs to get the full amount if you're asking me to guarantee those bonds, full amount. It, 
full amount. School board. So we're going from just a vacant to no, school board should get their full amount. If you're asking me, you've asked me to upgrade my hand, and I'm like, what am I getting in exchange for this? The school board, I mean, I gave you the last IGA, we were all satisfied. That wasn't enough. You've come back, you've enhanced, you've enhanced to ask, I'm like, okay, the give has to increase as well. So school board gets the full property tax that they normally get. My, my commission from district will probably tell you what that is. Let's make sure, Jen, um, Michelle, that's my marker for, for my, my tab on this. All right, that's the first thing. This, the second thing is, and I'm going to stop with this, and it's just really what, what's in listening to the story, what was missing was the hotel. The hotel is the driver for the whole thing here. Right? The hotel was very important. In other words, without the hotel, it doesn't go. I mean, if I'm going to build the infrastructure, that sounds good. We could do that anyway, just on our own. But okay, I'll get it. You know, Gil, great idea, great negotiation, Gil. Uh, but um, we got that. But there's so much emphasis on the conference center, which doesn't make money in and of itself outside of, and we know what success that is, is had by the city of Douglasville in their current situation. So we've got our own comparable, like, ooh, do you want two things out there without a hotel? That I just didn't. Uh, it, it was important just to get the hotel. That, that was important. I just didn't hear enough of that to understand. I didn't see because you, if you understand how revenue is derived, it's what, you know, price times unit gets Heads me revenue. Beds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so that was important. And so it was such a, a pivot, you know, it was a leaning over toward this. And I'm like, but when are you going to get back over here to the main thing that drives this? I want to know how much you're going to price this as and how is how some occupancy rates going to go? So that was important, which is I need more information. I think this is an incomplete. Um, if I was grading you as an educator, this is incomplete because I don't have enough information regarding the hotel uh, to make an adequate decision. My last point, and this is just more of a record, I understand structure. But at the end of the day, it's all about structure. And this was interesting to me. But structure-wise, and, and you mentioned, I always, and you guys know I teased this, I always said, I appreciate everybody's at the table. And it, you know, I'm always looking at, but, but when I look at investors, and I'm always like, well, who, who has the balance sheet in here? I know what my credit is, right? But who's on the other side of the equation to say, well, what are they bringing to the table? Thank you, Merrills, for all that you guys are doing. But I always said, but where's Arthur in the room? That was the, sort of my, my reference point historically to Arthur Blank, right? All right, so when, when they went to you know, get the Mercedes Benz, you guys all know the story. They, it was $300 million. They could only get them $200 million. They were $100 million short. The legend goes that he had some art that he could pledge, et cetera, right? Like, how do you get these type of deals done? Because again, we recognize, now, I'm curious as to why we didn't just simply pledge as, I mean, bond, why don't you just bond the hotel motel tax as opposed to asking us to bond our credit? Well, that is part of that. that, that I'm, just, I'm making this record. Y'all don't have to respond because I'm going to give my, my peers. Okay. Michelle, that's my question, which is why didn't they go with that structure? I mean, this is okay because we don't want to take this long. Why didn't they just go with that structure? Because I'm concerned about um, my obligations uh, that I have downstream, the priorities that we have for the long-term capital plan for this administration. It's like, okay, now I'm not guaranteeing 160 million. Let's just say it's 16, which is 10%. So I'm giving up my purchasing power. But I would want to know the drag that this would have on my credit. Right, so while I'm giving, I know what I'm getting, but what else am I also losing in this? And so I'm just curious as that, but why don't you just go with the hotel motel tax as a, as a mechanism? You guys have done, those have been done all over. Now it would been a more easier one. Didn't, I mean, it's easy for me to guarantee anything because then you can sell it quickly. But I'm like, but you got to do a little bit more work for those fees that you're making on the other side for if you would have did it that way um, as a consideration. Madam Chair, I don't want to, they don't really have to respond per se, because again, just like they need to you know, reflect on what we um, uh, are saying, um, I need to reflect on what I heard as well. But I just wanted for the record, both of, uh, Madam Clerk, um, as well as Michelle um, um, Green, who's stepping in and serving as a proxy for the finance director, just to capture these points as being my concerns um, going into this. I yield the floor. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Com uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Guider, I believe you had a question? Or uh, yes, I do have um, just a little bit of clarification here, but I do believe y'all are going to use part of the hotel motel tax to pay back the, the, their, uh, what they have to finance and everything. But um, 
Chris mentioned uh, all the infrastructure and everything down in Lithia Springs and the SID district. The SID district is a community improvement district where the property owners agreed to pay back the bonds with their property tax, over and above their property tax for 20 years. That's how that was funded down in Lithia Springs. Um, also, and it amounted to two million uh, gills. I, I don't know if you were involved in it or not, but I remember the SID district because I had to handle it. <laughs> um, and something was mentioned about the public access of the in infrastructure. If, if it's my correct understanding, this sewer line comes across private property, it just crosses Caps Ferry Road, then it goes back on to private property. So to me, that's not public infrastructure. Uh, and that, that, that's my concern on uh, this because a lot of the infrastructure is on private property. That would be like somebody saying they're going to put a subdivision in and we go in there and we build all those roads and everything. Um, and, and I mentioned this the other day. We did visit uh, Avalon and uh, very beautiful, beautiful uh, conference center hotel. And, uh, but we asked at that time what was the uh, what was the rate per room and I think it was $159 and we were just shocked because I think y'all are anticipating anticipating $350 a night and to me that was just kind of a, a red flag and you can ex explain this uh, but let me go on and let me finish just my powerpoints and then I'll let you go back but uh, then, I don't understand, it said development authority agrees to a 99 year lease for the conference center. Is that, they're gonna lease it to uh, the, the resort? And the, the, because this is just for 30 years. Where did the 99 years come into play? Well, if you'd like me to answer that. The, the, uh, the, the development authority would own the legal title to For the For 30 center. years. Well, they would own it. That's the discussion. But they, the hotel needs the access to that conference space for a long period of time and indefinitely if we're going to raise the money for the, of course, all important hotel. We can't raise over $100 million for a hotel on a 30-year conference center arrangement. Well, they were, it was, the title was just going to be in the development authority's name for 30 years. Then it diverted back to um, Actually, the, the owner. I, yeah, te technically the, the development authority, by being the issuer of the bonds, unlike kind of a, a normal um, bond for title where we're just the title holder without kind of a transaction, um, we would be the owner uh, of, the, of the conference center because the bonds are issued through us. What the county's commitment is, is to forego the taxes from the project to go back in. But even still, at the end of that 30-year term of the debt, the development authority is technically the owner of the conference center. So you're saying you're going to own the conference center for 99 years? Well, in, in, and it's going to be tax exempt. If it's in your name, it's tax exempt. In the current form of the IGA, the Development Authority would, owns the conference center, and at the end of the 30 years, the, there is an option to sell it. But even in that, the IGA states that the Board of Commissioners has to weigh in on that decision of what happens at the end of it. But we, we legally do own the conference center. But the 99-year uh, lease agreement was not in the uh, IGA, I mean the Original. memorandum of understanding that we have on the table now, right? The, the 99 this years. This is new. Yeah, correct. So that was the, the, the two kind of substantial changes, you know, in the, um, in the uh, IGA are for the credit enhancement on the infrastructure and for the 99-year lease on the conference center. So those are the two major. So points. this is, this part is new, the 99-year lease, yes, because I, someone had mentioned that, and I said, I don't remember that being in the original no, plan. It's, it's not. So, um, and uh, then uh, 
you were um, Nathan. Is it Nathan? Nathan. No, no, you're not Nathan. Jim, <laughs> Jim I'm sorry. <laughs> Jim, you said something about uh, uh, a conference center and a hotel doesn't cost a whole bunch of money and everything. However, I disagree with you because we would be responsible for fire and EMS and for law enforcement. And those are high ticketed items. So I just wanted to let you know about that. But uh, when we went to Avalon the other day, like I say, it was very, very impressive, but it sits right there on Georgia 400 too. <laughs> but uh, the city said that they took uh, all of the uh, hotel motel tax from all the other hotels to pay was it 40 million uh, well 30 million of bonds okay 30 millions in bonds but they they took all the additional from five to eight percent they took that difference to pay it it didn't come out of just tax dollars because um, hotel motel tax has to be spent on specific things and tourism is one of them we can't put it in the general fund and use it okay just and that was for the public not for you because <laughs> I think you understand it but then the county I asked the mayor I said what, what did the county do and they said well they gave them a tax abatement a 10-year tax abatement that was tiered in other words like we have for all the other companies that we uh, give tax abatements to and uh, they pay like 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent for the 10 years and it goes up so there, there's money coming in uh, tax dollars coming in so the only thing that uh, uh, as far as tax dollars that we're going to receive is going to be sales tax and that would be on goods sold out there I don't know does it apply to services too yeah well sales tax applies to hotel room rental pays those sales tax but it would be you've got to estimate it six hundred thousand dollars that was uh, there's roughly 30 million of gross revenues anticipated at the hotel and conference center and one percent of that is three hundred thousand two percent is six hundred that's where I, I did that but the, the everyone who pays money at the hotel and conference center in addition to the occupancy taxes they pay sales taxes which uh, you know goes to the state and comes back to you for your local option sales tax. but um, the, the infrastructure is my main concern is that that it's on private property uh, I don't know who owns the property across the road from where the proposed hotel and uh, conference center is going to be built is it four star they yeah. used to own it I don't know if they still own it yeah, so we, we've been in talks with all the property owners um, there's main one main one yeah there, there's more than one um, and so we've been in talk with them there's not only been talks about where does like right of way acquisition as it relates to where the sewer goes but the the really the the real you know i guess meat behind it is the utilization of those other properties for economic development purposes but who owns that who owns that the main piece uh... so the largest that i would say if you're going west the largest single landowner is going to be timberland investment group which is formerly Formerly owned by Four Star is now owned by Timberland. Are they Investment the same? Um... No, different. They this Timberland Investment Trust purchased all of the uh, land holdings from Four Star. So, and that's all their land holdings. I think across the country, but or at least in the southeast. The board of directors are they the same people as Four Star was? No, ma'am. Completely. So they they purchased it from Four Star. Did they buy it to cut the timber? Because that sounds like a timber company. Um, they've got various reasons for their different holdings. They have hundreds of thousands of acres. You know, what they are very much involved and have been involved in some of the economic development projects that we mentioned um, and still are involved today. And so we work closely with them from that regard. They also have supported us on the right of way, but also are working with us on economic development opportunities. But, but the main thing that I was trying to, uh, Jim, that I was trying to point out, it's not really public infrastructure it comes across private property jumps the road and then it goes back on private property 
And so the, the people, it, the public, are, they're not going to have access to it. That tap on fees would be 20 something thousand dollars a, <laughs> a, 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 a water meter or whatever, or sewage. But um, th these are my concerns. Now, you can address it, any ones that you want to, but uh, these are my concerns. And getting back to the SID that built the infrastructure down there on, in Lithia Springs, the city accidentally um, rezoned a piece of that property and threw it out of the SID, and the county had to pay $88,000 to finish paying off those bonds out of our general fund because of annexation. And this has always been an issue because right across the river, uh, you've got some little cities and, and, and areas there that uh, if they annex into Fulton County and sit and you can, you know, the way our city uh, in Douglasville goes, it goes all the way to Lithia Springs down a pipeline. So, uh, you know, who, who knows how annexation can go and that that was a concern too but my main concern was the infrastructure is really not public infrastructure it is private infrastructure yeah i'll i'll, I'll touch on the infrastructure and then i'll let jim talk about the okay. hotel rates uh, component um so for the infrastructure um to your point yes the um, existing residents who are there on septic you know it might be cost prohibitive, you know, to tie on to that that infrastructure. It it still is a public asset from the standpoint of its infrastructure. That's um, sewer, uh, for example, is owned by the Water and Sewer Authority, so it is it is public infrastructure. But public from the standpoint of it's necessary to drive future growth. So it's not necessarily to drive and support existing facilities that are out there but it's for future growth in the area and so when we look at those things it is the timberland investment property mm -hmm. it's the thornton property it's the richards property it's the property at the intersection around um, highway 5 and 166 it's it's future development growth not necessarily supporting existing because you're right it would be fairly expensive you know as for an individual homeowner to tap on to that infrastructure, but it's like I said, it's for that future growth. And then I'll, I'll let Jim talk about the rates. Um, let me just <clears throat> address both of you. Uh, Commissioner Robinson is exactly right that the hotel is where the, the, the money is. That's mm -hmm. that's the what brings in the most money. And I apologize that we didn't, uh, I don't know, I guess we just didn't think that the, you were focused on the hotel underwriting itself, but we're happy in these next few weeks to share more of that with you so you have a better understanding for how that works. But the uh, from an average rate perspective, we, we do call it heads and beds. That's the way the hotel money industry makes money is getting people to stay in your hotel. Just to compare to Avalon, since you asked about it, we will we will run about 80% occupancy this year. year in. This hotel, Fox Hall, we're only estimating about 66% occupancy at stabilization because it's not Avalon and it's not North Fulton and it's not on Georgia 400. It's not in a business center, it's a resort destination. So people are coming in. So we don't, uh, we're not fooling ourselves thinking you're gonna get 80% occupancy because we will in the summers and on the weekends, but if it's a Sunday night in January, you know, who's, you know, the occupancy is not gonna be very high. You know, we, the hotel industry is a 365 day a year business. Every day is different and it's planned differently with groups and transient social business. So 66%. <coughs> The average rate in when it opens in 2021-22 uh, is estimated, projected to be about $250. At Avalon, this year our average rate is about $215. And when you say $159 or $300, that is called demand pricing. It's like airlines. If you go to Avalon on a Friday night, you could probably get $159. If you go on a Tuesday night, I hope to heck they're not selling it to you for less than about $299 or $349. So depending on the demand dynamics of any given night, you price it differently. Some nights at Avalon it's $400 a night and some nights it's $149. It's probably the, the base low, as low as we get. 
but uh, it's all based on the demand for that particular night, week, month, year, whatever's going on in the market. So again, the average we're projecting here, I'm just thinking out loud, you're talking about 10, a little over 10 to 15 percent higher rates than Avalon because it's a resort. So, you know, it's a spa, it's a full service destination, and, uh, and we think the rates will be slightly higher because of that. Okay. But not a lot higher. Okay. With that, I yield back. Okay. Uh, I don't believe my other two commissioners up. Commissioner Mitchell has oh, yes. some questions for you. Just, yes, I, I do have a couple of questions. Okay. And I'm not going to, I mean, I think we've been at this thing all day and it's getting late. <laughs> so let's, I'll try to be brief and to the point. I, I guess, so I would say, you were speaking of the rates. Let's kind of stay on that note, on the rates, and then I'll kind of work my way back. How do, how do you compare the rates of a hotel stay versus a resort stay? Because I think there's a whole, there's a totally different, you know. You yeah, know. I mean, I think people are going to a resort for it to be there as a destination for a few Correct. days and experience. And and as you know, I mean, you, most of the business will stay right there. We'll have <coughs> restaurant dinners and event dinners and out at the stables. And so the, you know, they want to have an experience. Usually, a resort would have, on average, a higher rate than a generic hotel. And that's why, I was, and that's why I want to kind of make sure we you know kind of elaborate on that because i know there's a there's a huge difference yeah well right. i would call it huge but there's a difference oh, there is. absolutely there's, and the amount of what you get for it is huge right difference. right and and i didn't want to kind of miss you know trying to compare an apple to an orange just as a fruit yeah but there's a difference but let me go to my my other questions though so let's let's talk about um the the, the crossing of which madam guider is actually correct in reference to the crossing and chris i don't know if you want to chime in on this as well where it will cross um, various private uh, properties. Now, I don't know, you tell me one benefit would be for, well, those that are on septic will not have to tap in. As for those who would like to tap in, then the water and sewer would benefit from that tapping fee. Am I right in that statement or? Oh, is Gil here? Oh, I, 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 I didn't see Gil. Gil. And I am not Gil, the could you come, expert, come so, forward? Uh, right. Okay. Gil is our executive yes. director of the Water and Sewer Authority. Okay, Mr. yeah. Gil, Gil, if you'll chime in on that. I didn't see you back there. I would have asked you to come up. Good Commissioner. Yes. Thank yes. you for mm -hmm. letting me come up and speak. And if, if I may just take just a couple minutes, I'd like to clarify a couple things that Please do. Um, have, have been said just so we can kind of see the, okay. the full picture as it relates to water and sewer development at um, what we're calling the southwest quadrant of mm -hmm. Douglas County, uh, Madam Guider made, made a comment about the CID in Lithia Springs, and that was a, a district that basically they chose to tax themselves additionally to um, put, put some road, water, and sewer infrastructure in. That was after we had already put in significant infrastructure, a wastewater plant, 48-inch um, trunk line down Chattahoochee River, 30-inch line. So that was kind of at the top of that area. So that was part of it. but. I would say a minor part of the development in that overall area. Um, sorry, I'm catching my breath. I got that's, that's okay. Up, that's okay. Getting Take up your time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, to the private part of the infrastructure, while it does cross Caps Ferry Road and um, mm -hmm. is on private property, that's no different than any trunk systems that we put in or a backbone system that we put in is put into enable the future development of the properties around so it enables like chris said this 3500 4000 acre future development I, you know that's mm -hmm. what that's put in for so it's public from that standpoint that eventually these properties will connect to this system that's mm -hmm. being put in and um, we're participating in it for that reason um, part of the fees that will eventually come back to the water and sewer authority are the tap on fees connection fees and so that goes to pay for the infrastructure that we put in we, we do this all the time that's part of what mm -hmm. um, part of what we do so the structure set up for our investment in the backbone infrastructure mm -hmm. and then as properties connect that pays for that mm -hmm. infrastructure that's that's put in and I think Commissioner Robinson mentioned you know mm -hmm. we've we've been involved in this deal and have a mm -hmm. have a pretty good structure set out for the sewer part mm -hmm. um, I, I will say the sewer part is um, only a portion of what you guys are talking about on infrastructure bond here. So 2.7 of the 13 or 15 million, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers. That's the sewer component. So I'm, I'm only speaking to, to the sewer mm -hmm. part of that because that's all we're, we're involved in. 
So, uh, yeah, quick, I mean, quick overview, yeah. and hopefully that answered some questions. No, no, you, clarified you, you did good. A few things. You did good, Gil. You did good. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and, and let me go on with my little questioning here. And like I said, this, this will probably get into the latter, latter part of this here, though. Who could speak to me in reference to the commitment of the Western? How, how, how committed are they? What do we have to say that they are totally in? Or, or is it that it's just a wishful thought because we, we keep coming back to this juncture? Uh, we sign. Hold on. We keep coming back to this juncture of a change, an addition to, but this one here will work with the EB-5 and so on and so forth. What I'm wanting, my concern, and I can't speak for my colleagues, is it's the change, the change to the change, and we're now saying this is the this is the one that will that will work this time. And I'm just trying to get totally convinced as to why. So my first. The first oh, like one is the, as the West. End. Yes. Yeah. How, how committed are we, or is it this your conversation to us, or is it somebody here can show me something to that effect? Let me address it like this. Okay. We signed a letter of intent with a term sheet with Marriott and we, these guys did, with Marriott International about six months ago, which is what then takes it, uh, Marriott takes it to their executive development committee to approve the deal. We, we were waiting to take it to the final approval until we had these investment banking structure lined up that we knew how this could work. Mm -hmm. Mary was concerned with all of us. How is it going to get, how are you going to come up with $109 million for the project, the primary piece? They finally, we finally got this bond figured out. And so Eric Fry is here with Mary, and he can address us if we'd like. They just approved it Friday morning, so it is f approved by the Executive Committee of Marriott International, and now we will be signing a franchise agreement. So it's fully approved. Is there anything else to say about that? It's fully approved, yeah. And so we got that in writing from you guys that this is approved, or this is just a, a, a great thought process. Or wishful thinking. Come, come up to the come, on come, come and talk to me. It's okay. Yeah. And, and let me also say, as part of their approval, I forgot to mention this. They are striking a check for two point five million dollars. So, which is a strong commitment. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, but they are making a strong commitment in cash to the deal. They're, mm -hmm. they're a brand company, and they don't usually write checks to invest, but they are. So this is Eric okay. Fry, who's the regional vice president for development in this region. So Thank you for Eric. I'll just I'll just take a, a quick quick minute. So okay. I'm Marriott Hotels. I do full service development, which is all full service brands except for a W and Addition. And I've been working with Jim, Jim on many, many projects. And Jim was correct. We <coughs> waited a while before we took this to Hotel Development Committee because we don't want to take a project to our development committee. And I won't take it to my development committee unless we believe there's a reasonable chance of financing, that we've reviewed the budget, we've reviewed the site, we've reviewed the market. So that process was brought uh, uh, last week to our Hotel Development Committee. We've received approval. Um, we would need to negotiate a franchise agreement, which would be the next step in the process, which usually takes 30, 60, 90 days, depending on the parties involved. Okay. okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, just taking a few, so you have a franchise agreement possibility of negotiating that part of, so it's contingent upon these other things to come along. Well, the, the term sheet provides all the key terms to the franchise agreement. Mm -hmm. It's signed. It's signed, and the term sheet's signed, and that's what our hotel de development committee yeah. approved, including the key money. We're not obligated fully until the actual franchise agreement is signed, which requires a certain amount of due diligence, which is look, looking at everything that's involved. But the basic terms have been approved by our hotel development committee. So maybe uh, I'll help me out with legal on this. So legal, so I won't get confused as to where, where are we committed or not committed. Are we almost there? Or we, just, you know, we, okay. we are as committed as you can possibly be prior to closing the <laughs> transaction. So when we close, which uh, what I was saying is when we sell the bonds, raise the fine capital, the finite private senior mortgage loan, there's going to be a big transaction with Chris Pumphrey and the So the selling of the bonds and all these other things are contingent upon. I, I it all happens at the same time. It's all contingent okay. on each other. Yeah. Chairman Mitchell, let me, let me, you're, you're asking about contingencies. Yes. So, so let me, let me lay out as the guarantor okay. of the private financing, the Alan Morris company who guarantees the private financing. Okay. Uh, which I think is going to be about $75 million of private financing, Brad. So we're guaranteeing a $75 million loan. Um, the, the contingencies are the execution of the IGA and the successful 
uh, marketing of the private financing. Mm -hmm. We, once the IGA amendment is executed, the only other contingency that is outstanding from the Alan Morris company's perspective is the successful marketing of the private financing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, 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 okay. Interesting. Okay, and um, I think the other portion, I think, Chris, and I don't know if this is more for whomever, you know, about the shortfalls and, and all that kind of good stuff, kind of, oh, let me back up before I get to that, though. Take me back to, you, you mentioned to me about the, the mitigation, the, the, the risks uh, for the county, and you mitigated the risks to be X earlier in your, in your presentation. Can you kind of just touch that once more so I can kind of hear what you said and, and really get some, some key notes that I missed? Yeah, I think we ought to ask Mark Price from UBS to come up That's and okay. address this particular issue. He's the underwriter for the infrastructure bonds, and he understands in details the waterfall. And I don't know if you want to go through your slide. Uh, if you guys still could pull this up again, uh, you might want to, uh, on your screens, that might be helpful. I don't know if they, is the team, oh, they said hold on. I have somebody in the background saying hold on, okay, okay. So, uh, well, well, perhaps while that's happening, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Chairwoman, uh, Commissioners, my name is Mark Price. Uh, I work for UBS in okay. their Public Finance Division. Okay. okay. Um, and we are um, we are a national firm. Uh, we are, uh, of course, a, a Swiss-owned investment bank um, parent company. But uh, I work for the Americas Division um, in Public Finance. We underwrite municipal bonds uh, across the country, um, and we have a fair amount of um, experience in doing that. Um, as uh, some of you might appreciate, I, I have certain compliance um, issues, so let me just get one of the compliance issues out of the way. I, I just need to let everybody know uh, that we are, um, we are functioning in the role as an underwriter. Um, and in that role, we mm -hmm. are not advising the county in, in any way, and the county should rely upon its advisors uh, for anything uh, that has to do with uh, the issuance of municipal bonds. So, mm -hmm. sorry for that. Uh, sorry for that little uh, compliance break there, but I have to okay. give that That's disclaimer. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> what's on the screen here in, in terms of the proposed structure mm -hmm. uh, for the infrastructure bonds? So, this bifurcated piece. Uh, 50 million uh, dollars of bonds out of the 40 million. Um, the proposed structure is uh, similar to the 2016 IGA, uh, where you would have hotel motel taxes, the four and a half percent piece of that, the tourism product um, uh, payments piece of that, plus any uh, plus any pilot payments. The pilot formula would be uh, property taxes that would otherwise be payable on the on the villas portion. So uh, the the new thing uh, that is being proposed in in the amended IGA mm -hmm. is to carve out these tax revenues from just the villas portion of the entire project. So mm -hmm. if you think of the entire project as being the conference center and hotel and the villas, the villas is a, a separate number of rooms. Um, the uh, tax revenue that would be generated from the villas portion that is what would be pledged uh, to the debt service with bonds. And you'll see that way up at top at this waterfall in terms to pay debt service on those bonds. Uh, what you'll see coming from that is any surplus. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that those amounts are in excess mm -hmm. of what the debt service is due on those bonds, that surplus would accumulate in a fund mm -hmm. um, and be available uh, to cover, be the first source to cover shortfalls in future mm -hmm. years. Okay. Um, after that, uh, uh, Fox Hall, uh, Fox Hall Hospitality, uh, an entity um, owned by the Merrills, uh, would um, have an obligation to uh, to replenish what we're calling a project stabilization support fund. Um, this is so stabilization funds mm -hmm. are uh, something that are used in financing um, uh, pretty pretty widely. Uh, the idea is if you have some sort of uncertainty in sort of a startup phase of a project, um, if you want to have a, some extra support to that project, that would be there uh, to help it along. Um, so uh, in the current iteration uh, of this, the, the thought is that this project uh, support fund would be funded um, from bond proceeds um, at closing, and then there would be an obligation by Fox Hall Hospitality to replenish that fund if tapped. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, debt service first paid by hotel motel taxes and pilots if that's insufficient any surplus that's accumulated mm -hmm. if that's insufficient you tap the project fund I mean the project stabilization mm -hmm. fund mm -hmm. the project if the project stabilization fund um, gets tapped then uh, the Fox Hall hospitality has an obligation to replenish that fund um, annually mm -hmm. up to 350,000 a year mm -hmm. if for some reason we get through all those pieces then uh, we would go to the debt service reserve fund. The debt service reserve fund would be another cash. It would be another cash funded fund mm -hmm. from bond proceeds. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be sized um, at an amount that equals a maximum annual debt service on the bonds. Um, and then that's where the county's uh, obligation would come in. This credit enhancement that we're talking about. If you get through all those things, and then you actually tap this debt service reserve fund. Um, then the county's obligation would be to replenish that debt service uh, reserve fund. So those are the several layers um, that are being structured into the transaction before uh, an obligation of the county uh, would, uh, would kick in. Mm -hmm. um, and just to get a sense of numbers here, uh, in, in terms of uh, what current markets are for $15 million for bonds that uh, have this sort of reserve fund at the end with the, with the county contractual obligation, uh, we think uh, that would be about a million dollars in debt service a year mm -hmm. uh, for a 30-year bond. Um, and so that's the, that's the total debt service, uh, annual debt service amount that we're talking about. One thing that is not reflected um, on this diagram, uh, which is uh, another structuring point that's in here, um, as with many projects in a startup phase, uh, you want to give it some time to ramp up and have, um, have the project built out, have revenues uh, start to generate and be in stabilization. Uh, we imagine there would be a capitalized interest fund, so a reserve to pay interest for the first few years of the bonds. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, uh, there are already some villas, uh, villa rooms that are in operation mm -hmm. and are throwing off revenue and therefore are throwing off some tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So what would happen during this period of this ramp up period when the capitalized interest fund is paying the interest on the bonds, mm -hmm. you have this excess from, uh, from, from the, the hotel uh, and pilot payments accumulating in surplus fund, which is yet another way to. Uh, but that excess that you're speaking of is with the villas. Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. I just want to make sure I heard. Okay. That's okay. correct. Got but, it. Uh, that, that is how that works. Uh, hopefully, I sufficient. No, 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 no. Yes. no. I, I just really want to hear it again. I mean, I've read it and, and kind of got a, a, a good idea of what that is, but going from one to the other, and I think I've shared with you guys about, you know, going from plan A, plan B, and now we had plan C or D. Now it's like it's starting to kind of put a question mark in, in my, my brain cell there. That's, that's not always good because it's, the P brain doesn't work that well. So um, <laughs> now with that, we did fully understood that um, as Vice Chairman Robinson stated that, or let me back up, the uh, school board is not assessed to this possible rebate or abatement if I'm not Help me out. Am I correct in that statement, Chris, or am I reaching to the, the original? The original, right? Yes. Yeah, that's so what, in, yeah. in the original, um, what we stated and in, in included in the IGA was that whatever was going to the schools today, at that point in time, would continue to go to the schools. Um, but the go, go ahead. No, no, no. But, I, I, you, I think you're going to go where yeah, I want to go. But, yeah, but the component, which is the what is not here today. You know, the is the 15 piece. will will be a little bit different if you're going to continue your your statement. Yeah, so it, it would still remain the same. Is that the school component does not come out, and I think that might have been an oversight in some of the red lines in the IGA. It is intended that whatever the schools are getting today, the schools will continue to get. So it is not even with your new possibility of this new structure. Correct. That's what's okay. in the in the red lines that we did that were done, you know, and presented a couple weeks ago. It was uh, it was not included, which it should have been. Mm -hmm. And so we'll make sure that that's in there. But it, it should be that whatever the schools are getting today, under this structure for the conference center for the infrastructure, mm -hmm. will still be the same. That this whatever the schools were getting today, they will continue to get. The component, however, which 
also has not changed is that the new taxes, the new taxes generated from the project will go back towards the debt service. Got you. Okay. All righty. Um, let me make sure I've got everything on my list of Q and A. Is all done. Chris, can I ask one question? That last statement you just made, yes, that means the new growth in taxes will be regurgitated to pay the debt as opposed to going to the school board. It, the yeah. same, it's the, 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 the new the growth. Same. Yeah, new growth. Just the last statement, that's what I'm focused on. Yeah, yeah that, the component was in the current IGA does not change. Right. The new but, growth correct. does not go to the school board. It goes back in the deal to help pay the deal, correct? Correct. correct. Have y'all got an agreement with school district on that? I, I don't have a formal agreement. I did sit down with the new superintendent, just like I did with the prior mm -hmm. superintendent. We met maybe two weeks ago to discuss it. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner Mitch, that's important. Point. No, I, I agree. No, I'm, no, I appreciate that. Um, okay, Chris, I, I think, and I, and I don't want to hold you guys. Like I said, it's, it's getting almost dinner time, so I'm going to I'm gonna leave it there and... <laughs> Bed time. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's getting late. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to leave it there, though. But I, I mean, I, I still think we got, you know, some some more conversations I think we'll probably have with this whole makeup, though. But outside of that, I'll, I'll yield. Thank you again, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Um, Harrison and Jim and, and Nathan, thank, thank you so much for coming in. And also, uh, Chris Pomfrey, thank you so much for coming in. And, uh, especially for myself and uh, Commissioner Carthen, who had no prior knowledge of what happened historically. So thank you for outlining all the details to allow us to wrap our minds around this comprehensive bi bifurcated uh, proposal. And that will give us some more information to chew on. So we are listening very deeply, and we will continue to just kind of mull and wrap our minds around everything that's going on. So we have look, about four years behind, Commissioner, mm -hmm. yeah. but we got to try to digest in, in just another couple of weeks. So thank you for your presentation. And thank you so much, Gil. Madam sure. Chair, point just for clarity. Yes. Mm -hmm. J just for my peers, guys, if you have some formal um, conditions or considerations, can you fund them through um, um, our finance director? She will assemble them on our behalf like we do during the budgeting process, just, just for the official record. That's all I ask. I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I agree with the commissioners. It's almost dinner time, but we've had, this is a great bonding time for us. Next, last but not least, we have a presentation coming uh, to us next, and it's our Fox Hall project proposal, and it's the risk assessment analysis. Jennifer Hallman is not here today, so I'm assuming, Michelle, you'll kick off and then um, hand it off to um, our David Corbin. And then also, uh, Vice Chairman, did you want to say something before? Yeah, j j just for the record, th this, this is not a presentation. The Board of Commissioners were presented with the final findings of what his risk assessment is. He's just here as our municipal advisor. He's not staff's advisor. He's the Board of Commissioners' advisor. So he speaks to our ear. If you have some questions, you don't necessarily have to belabor him. In this moment, you, he's available to be offline. Uh, again, he doesn't have to defend his findings. They speak for themselves, per se. But we wanted to make sure that he was available for the sake of transparency and the process. David, thank you for being here. Okay, Michelle. Yes. Madam Chair, this is uh, David Corbin with Terminus Municipal Advisors. His um, presentation, um, Lisa has a hard copy of that to hand out so you don't have to view it on your screen. Okay. Thank you. Good Michelle. afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good afternoon. Good evening. Questions. That's that's the main thing. What questions can I answer for you? I think we've uh, tried to provide you with a pretty thorough document on what are the public incentives, what's the value of the public incentives, what are the changes since the 2016 agreement was passed, or what's been proposed based on uh, what we've received, and to talk about those, uh, the impact of, of basically guaranteeing the bonds. I think our document tried to cover as much of that as, as, as we could. Uh, it's not about, our document doesn't cover, I mean, I think it's important to mention, we didn't assess the merit or the feasibility of the Fox Hall project. That's something totally different. And quite frankly, that's, you know, that's, that's in a different category. We didn't, also did not assess the merit of the impact that this project could have on the county. We had no data at all that, would provide, that was provided to us that we're, we were able to assess what that is counter to the public incentives. I mean, we've, we've gotten some kind of feedback already that, you know, the document looks like it's, you know, earmarked for, you know, in one way in terms of it's overly weighted to, to the value transfer 
from the county back to the project. And part of that is, this is part of the assignment was to identify for you, not for the project owners, not for anyone else, right. what that value transfer looked like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you Thank have you. a question yep. for me. Yeah, really just, just for the official record, um, in the last IJ, Michelle, pay attention, this is important. Um, there was important um, two things. Um, um, debt, debt reserve fund, um, I heard um, uh, the owners um, just present that the $300,000 is going to be pledged. I don't think that's enough. I just want for the record, I want a full year. If that's that million dollar bogey that I think that I wrote down, I want it to be a million. Make, make that note, please. Second thing is, and this is, uh, Mr. Corbin, I, I appreciate um, your, your commitment to us, um, which is identifying the cash flows. And so really the public, we, we just focus simply right here. I mean, we, we get economic development. We get partnership. I, I think uh, overall we want to make a, a good decision. But again, this is, uh, and, and I'm, they know I'm honest, it, this is rich. You know, this is not about cash preservation per, for the deal's sake. This is cash extraction, right, until you can account for what's on the other side to the equal sign. So this is important for the public who's not having access to this document, but we need to be transparent what we're looking at, which is, okay, if it only costs $40 million in, if I'm the bank, it's like, okay, $40 million plus some number, but they're issuing bonds. So the excess cash that comes off of this, unless it's, it, it's tied to the, the debt associated with the hotel, where's that cash going? You can't present to me on the 6th and ask me on the 7th to make a decision and you haven't given me that fundamental fact. It would be no out the gate. It would be no on behalf. You, they, they have to do better. In, in, in making this argument, please, you're asking a lot of the commissioners. I don't want to undermine or underestimate what y'all are looking at. There has to be an accounting. And so uh, to my peers, his document speaks for itself, but we don't have to negotiate against ourselves. It is not up to us to create a compelling argument within this narrative. It has to be sold. And so with that, I'm, I'm, I'm real cautious that my comment was simply, what's on the other side of that equal sign and it can't just be sort of dismiss, dismiss, oh, I didn't know. Like, come on, guys, don't do this. This is too big of a deal. And I, I would be remiss in my, my role and responsibility to say, no, guys, come on. There's a higher standard. You guys know how to pitch. You guys are big bankers. Don't, don't do Douglas kind of that way. We, we, you, we, at least there's, we, we have enough here that I know what I'm looking at. So. For that, and Dave, you don't have to respond to that. That was just, I needed to make that statement that, uh, and I don't want to belabor this. But that being said, as far as risk assessment, um, the document is well done based on the information that you had. We couldn't ask for anything better for my peers. I mean, I didn't read it until last night. Um, I just chose to do it that way to be fresh <coughs> this morning. Um, but you did your job. He did exactly what I asked him to do. He didn't lean it to the left or to the right. Um, he put it right down the middle. Uh, to give the facts uh, for you commissioners. So, you know, rest assured that you have your information that's solid based on what was given. Correct. Um, and, and that's key. I mean, he, he didn't have to manufacture data. That's like his instructions was go with what you got um, um, because they're asking us for an awful lot. And so there needed to be courtesy toward us. Um, and I want to leave it at that. And I'm sure I yield. Okay. Any other comments from the board commissioners? Commissioner Guy. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Corbin. Um, so the purpose of this is to tell us what? The assignment was to identify what the cost of those public incentives are that, are that were approved in 2016 and subsequently now proposed to be modified in a new agreement. The cost of those public incentives and also to identify what the risk was Part of that public incentive now is they want you to guarantee a portion of the bonds, the public bonds. What's the risk of you? What, what, are, the, what are the factors that go into evaluating what impact that will have on the county? Well, Those are two uh, primary points. Okay, so it was the taxpayers pay for this. So can you tell in a, uh, two sentences what this tells us? 
<laughs> it tells you what the, it, it, roughly it tells you that based on based on our current estimates, the value transfer is approximately 140 million dollars. That's one in terms of if you add up the public incentives, based on hotel motel taxes, the length of those taxes, all those changes, we believe adds up to about approximately it's about 140 million in transfer value transfer to the to the project owner. Of that total, a portion of it they're allocating to use for debt service, a portion of it's going to be allocated back to the operation of the project. The other side of it, the other part of the report is, if you guarantee bonds, I think the, the, the gentleman talked about it earlier, they, they can put in things that appear to be risk mitigating, whether it's reserve funds or whatever, effectively you're over borrowing for the, for the sake of the bondholder, not for your sake. I just want to make sure we're clear about that. Not good, not bad. Mm -hmm. You're overfunding mm -hmm. the amount that you need to borrow, not for your purposes, but for the bondholders. So from that standpoint, if you add up all those payments that are in escrow, that's about a year or two years worth of debt service. The question I have is you have to evaluate is, what about the other 20, mm -hmm. what about the other 28 years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the other 25 years? Whatever that may be. And so the document basically seeks to answer that question. And I think our, our final thought was, if you're going to co-sign for someone's debt, I need you to understand as a body that you're basically going to be responsible for it. So you're responsible. It's $15 million in principal. You're responsible for $30 million of repayment, period. I mean, we can figure out how to mitigate things. We can figure out what else to do. But I don't want to leave this podium without, you, without the understanding that that is the risk, that you will have to pay or write a check for debt service in the amount of a million dollars a year. Well, was the 99-year lease part of that transfer of, uh, of values? What I, I mean, what, what did you think about the 99-year lease of the... Well, other than, again, it, it was a change. Again, the original document called for a 30-year, 30-year, mm -hmm. uh, uh, provision now it's 99. I mean that's again, the old agreement talked about a fair market value rental of, under a quality. You know, well, the other agreement talked about a qualified management contract. Mm -hmm. All we tried to do was point out the changes. 99 years is substantially materially different than 30 years. Now they may have their own reasons for doing that or for whatever that may be. All we wanted to do was point out that that's a material change from what was passed in 2016. But there is a substantial risk for the county. Is There's a risk of, at the, at the end of the day, the risk is you have full loan revenue. Responsible for You're responsible any, for the debt. Oh, uh, if the revenues did not come in as they have projected. Correct. To, to pay for this. Correct. Okay, so we, we could, it could fall on the general fund. So your source of repayment today would be the general fund, yeah. or yeah, the general fund. It come out of your fund balance. Is there anything else you would like to say about this report? Because this is very complex. It is a very complex <laughs> subject, and it's it's a very it's a complex subject with a lot of moving parts. It's a dynamic process, and so you know, our, our, what we tried not to do, uh, Commissioner was to evaluate their transaction because it's not about, it's really not about their transaction. You know, fund the ancillary public services that are going to be required mm -hmm. in that area for, for whatever else. I, I don't think you can ignore that there's a cost there. Right. What that cost looks like, I don't know. Okay. We've tried to estimate or at least acknowledge that there's a cost to, to that process. Got you. However, we won't be getting taxes to help mitigate that cost of keeping those services. Uh, you won't be getting property taxes, property tax. and you will not be getting hotel motel taxes. Right. Okay, and so the hotel motel tax will go to service the debt. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. let me just make sure I'm clear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it gets a little complicated. In the old agreement, that would be the case. Mm -hmm. In the new agreement, with the portion of bonds that you're backing will only come from hotel motel ta taxes on the villas, and a pilot payment equivalent to 100, what normal property taxes would have been mm -hmm. on the villas. It has nothing to do with the hotel. They've <laughs> segregated out the hotel revenue. Right. All hotel portions of this project 
pilot and or hotel motel taxes away from the portion of the bonds for which you're guaranteed. Okay. I'm going to say what I want to say next. Okay. So if we're not getting the, the motel hotel tax from the hotel, we're only getting it from the villa. Correct. Then as what, proposed. As proposed. Then how is this an incentive for us? I'm sorry. How is it an incentive for us? I That's, get economic development. Yeah. I get, you know, things will come from them being here, hopefully. But how does that help us as a county? Because I don't want to raise taxes, right, to help cover what might happen. So what's the benefit? of us doing this at all? I, I think that's the question that's before y'all as a body that you're going to have to address. Gotcha. I'm not, our, our report did not try to address what that is because right. we don't know. Gotcha. Would you do this deal? <laughs> <laughs> what was, <laughs> just asking. I don't, I don't live in the county, so. <laughs> <laughs> I yield, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Any other questions before I close things down? Okay, but uh, I, first of all, I would just like to thank you so much, um, Mr. Corbin, for taking the time to uh, conduct a risk analysis. And it's, uh, I've looked at the document as well. It's very thorough. So thank you for taking the time well, to do that. You. And it allows each commissioner we have, uh, he has presented, should I say, um, Mr. Corbin has presented a nice body of work to allow us to go in and look at it, digest it, and formulate our thoughts as we go forward. Uh, I can tell you, ultimately, my, my job is to protect the citizens of Douglas County. And I'm going to make sure that I have them in my best interest. I'm going to look at this document again, and then we go from there. I believe, uh, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, you have actually petitioned for um, Mr. Harrison Merrill and his team to go back and give you some additional numbers and some homework. Yes, so if you would like to, you have another comment or anything you would like to say? I think we're good. I mean, I, again, David, thank you for, for, for doing this thank for you. us. And, and yes, if I may, you know, it's one of those where on this one, um, we can't hide behind the Mueller report or the Corbin report. Yes. We as elected officials have to stand up and make a decision. All five of us must make a decision on behalf of this one. This is one of those, this is not typically 99% of the things that we do up or down, up or down, up or down. This one is where we earn, actually earn our $2.50. And so with that being said, I just want to, you know, this is where we all have to go to our corner. This is not about partisan. This is not about gender. This is about what do you really believe and what do you value? And do you think this is in the best interest of the county? Taking everything in consideration, we have everything we need, 95% 90, of it. There's some holes that need to be filled in. But 95% of it is all right before us. There's nothing hidden. It's all right here. It's just a matter of just discerning what's before us. And, and passing that vote. So, Madam Chair, I think we're good to go. Just let the process work its way out. I yield. Okay. Thank you so much. If there's nothing else to come before this body, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>